Section one of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Chapter six. Spirit. Translator's note. In the preceding section there is analyzed the attempt on the part of individuality to operate as its own legislator and judge of laws holding for individuals. Individuality may claim the privilege of enunciating laws universal in character, but having their source and inspiration solely in the single individual. Such laws can at best only be regulative and cannot be constitutive of the substance of individuality, for the substance of individuality necessarily involves other individuals within it. In short, individuality is itself only realized as a part of a concrete whole of individuals. Its life is drawn from common life in and with others. To attempt to enunciate laws from itself as if it could create the conditions of its own inherent universality can only issue in one result. Laws are furnished without the content which gives those laws any meaning, or else the laws and the content remain from first to last external to one another but if laws are purely formal they cease to be laws that is constitutive conditions of individuality hence the attempt above described is sure to break down by its own futility what is wanted to give the laws meaning is the concrete substance of social life and when this concrete substance is provided ipso facto the attempt of individuality to create laws disappears for these laws are already found in operation in social life only such laws have reality but this involves the further step that individuality is only realized only finds its true universal content in and with the order of a society here alone is individuality what it is in truth at once a particular focus of self-consciousness and a realization of universal mind this condition where individuality is conscious of itself only in and with others and conscious of the common life as its own is the stage of spiritual existence spiritual existence and social life thus go together the following section begins the analysis of this phase of experience which extends from the simplest form of sociality the family up to the highest experience of universal mind religion the immediately succeeding section may be taken as the keystone of the whole arch of experience traversed in the phenomenology here it is pointed out that all the preceding phases of experience have not merely been preparing the way for what it is to follow but that the various aspects hitherto treated as separate moments of experience are in reality abstractions from the life of concrete spirit now to be discussed and analyzed it is noteworthy that from this point onward the argument is less negative in its result either directly or indirectly and is more systematic and constructive this is no doubt largely because hitherto individual mind as such has been under review and this is an abstraction from social mind or spiritual existence End of translator's note. Chapter 6. Spirit Reason is spirit when its certainty of being all reality has been raised to the level of truth, and reason is consciously aware of itself as its own world, and of the world as itself. The development of spirit was indicated in the immediately preceding movement of mind, where the object of consciousness, the category pure and simple, rose to be the notion of reason when reason observes this pure unity of ego and existence the unity of subjectivity and objectivity of for itselfness and in itselfness this unity is immanent has the character of implicitness or of being and consciousness of reason finds itself but the true nature of observation is rather the transcendence of this instinct of finding its object lying directly at hand and passing beyond this unconscious state of existence the directly perceived angeschaut category the thing simply found enters consciousness as the self-existence of the ego ego which now knows itself in the objective reality and knows itself there as the self but this feature of the category that is of being for itself as opposed to being immanent within itself is equally one-sided and a moment that cancels itself the category therefore gets for consciousness the character which it possesses in its universal truth it is self-contained essential reality an und für sich sein des wesen this character still abstract which constitutes the nature of absolute fact of fact itself is to begin with spiritual reality 
das geistige Wesen, and its mode of consciousness is here a formal knowledge of that reality, a knowledge which is occupied with the varied and manifold content thereof. This consciousness is still, in point of fact, a particular individual distinct from the general substance, and either prescribes arbitrary laws or pretends to possess within its own knowledge as such the laws as they absolutely are, an und für sich, and takes itself to be the power that passes judgment on them. Or again, looked at from the side of the substance, this is seen to be the self-contained and self-sufficient spiritual reality, which is not yet a consciousness of its own self the self-contained and self-sufficient reality however which is at once aware of being actual in the form of consciousness and presents itself to itself is spirit its essential spiritual being wesen has been above designated as the ethical substance spirit however is concrete ethical actuality wirklichkeit spirit is the self of the actual consciousness to which spirit stands opposed or rather which appears over against itself as an objective actual world it has lost however all sense of strangeness for the self just as the self has lost all sense of having a dependent or independent existence by itself cut off and separated from that world being substance and universal self-identical permanent essence wesen, spirit is the immovable irreducible basis and the starting point for the action of all and every one it is their purpose and their goal because the ideally implicit nature ansich, of all self-consciousnesses this substance is likewise the universal product wrought and created by the action of each and all and giving them unity and likeness and identity of meaning for it is self-existence für sich sein, the self-action qua substance spirit is unbending righteous self-sameness self-identity but qua for itself self-existent and self-determined für sich sein, its continuity is resolved into discrete elements it is the self-sacrificing soul of goodness the benevolent essential nature in which each fulfils his own special work rends the continuum of the universal substance and takes his own share of it this resolution of the essence into individual forms is just the aspect of the separate action and the separate self of all the several individuals it is the moving soul of the ethical substance the resultant universal spiritual being just because this substance is a being resolved in the self it is not a lifeless essence but actual and alive spirit is thus the self-supporting absolutely real ultimate being wesen. all the previous modes of consciousness are abstractions from it they are constituted by the fact that spirit analyzes itself distinguishes its moments and halts at each individual mode in turn the isolating of such moment presupposes spirit itself and requires spirit for its subsistence in other words this isolation of modes only exists within spirit which is existence taken in isolation they appear as if they existed as they stand but their advance and return upon their real ground and essential being show that they are merely moments or vanishing quantities and this essential being is precisely this movement and resolution of these moments here where spirit the reflection of these moments into itself has become established our reflection may briefly recall them in this connection they were consciousness self-consciousness and reason spirit is thus consciousness in general which contains sense experience perception and understanding so far as in analyzing its own self it holds fast by the moment of being a reality objective to itself and by abstraction eliminates the fact that this reality is its own self objectified its own self-existence when again it holds fast by the other abstract moment produced by analysis the fact that its object is its own self becomes objective to itself is its self-existence then it is self-consciousness but as immediate consciousness of its inherent and its explicit being of its immanent self and its objective self as the unity of consciousness and self-consciousness it is that type of consciousness which has reason it is the consciousness which as the word have indicates has the object in a shape which is implicitly and inherently rational or is categorized but in such a way that the object is not yet taken by the consciousness in question to have the value of a category spirit here is that consciousness from the immediately preceding consideration of which we have arrived at the present stage finally when this reason which spirit has is seen by spirit to be reason which actually is to be reason which is actual in spirit and is its world then the spirit has come to its truth it is spirit the essential nature of ethical life actually existent spirit so far as it is the immediate truth is the ethical life of a nation 
the individual which is a world it has to advance to the consciousness of what it is immediately it has to abandon and transcend the beautiful simplicity of ethical life and get to a knowledge of itself by passing through a series of stages and forms the distinction between these and those that have gone before consists in their being real spiritual individualities geister actualities proper and instead of being forms of consciousness they are forms of a world the living ethical world is spirit in its truth as it first comes to an abstract knowledge of its essential nature ethical life Sittlichkeit, is destroyed in the formal universality of right or legality Recht. spirit being now sundered within itself traces one of its worlds in the elements of its objectivity as in a crass solid actuality this is the realm of culture and civilization while over against this in the element of thought is traced the world of belief or faith the realm of the inner life and truth wesen both worlds however when in the grip of the notion when grasped by spirit which after this loss of self through self diremption penetrates itself are thrown into confusion and revolutionized through individual insight einsicht and the general diffusion of this attitude known as the enlightenment aufklärung and the realm which had thus been divided and expanded into the present and the remote beyond into the here and the yonder turns back into self-consciousness this self-consciousness again taking now the form of morality the inner moral life apprehends itself as the essential truth and the real essence as its actual self no longer puts its world and its ground and basis away outside itself but lets everything fade into itself and in the form of conscience gewissen is spirit sure and certain gewiss of itself the ethical world the world rent asunder into the here and the yonder and the moral point of view moralische weltanschauung are then individual forms of spirit geister whose process and whose return into the self of spirit a simple self and self-existent für sich sein, will be developed when these attain their goal and final result the actual self-consciousness of absolute spirit will make its appearance end of section one Section 2 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6a. Objective Spirit, the Ethical Order. Spirit, in its ultimate simple truth, is consciousness, and breaks asunder its moments from one another. An act divides spirit into spiritual substance on the one side, and consciousness of the substance on the other and divides the substance as well as consciousness the substance appears in the shape of a universal inner nature and purpose standing in contrast to itself qua particularized reality the middle or mediating term infinite in character is self-consciousness which being implicitly the unity of itself and that substance becomes so now explicitly für sich unites the universal inner nature and its particular realization raises the latter to the former and becomes ethical action and on the other hand brings the former down to the latter and carries out the purpose the substance presented merely in thought in this way it brings to light the unity of itself and the substance and produces this unity in the form of a work done and thus as actual concrete fact wirklichkeit when consciousness breaks up into these elements the simple substance has in part preserved the attitude of opposition to self-consciousness in part it thereby manifests in itself the very nature of consciousness which consists in distinguishing its own content within itself manifests a world articulated into separate areas the substance is thus an ethical being split up into distinct elemental forms a human and a divine law in the same way the self-consciousness appearing over against the substance assigns itself in virtue of its inner nature to one of these powers and qua involving knowledge gets broken up into ignorance of what it is doing on the one hand and knowledge of this on the other a knowledge which for that reason proves a deception it learns therefore through its own act at once the contradictory nature of those powers into which the inner substance divided itself and their mutual overthrow as well as the contradiction between its knowledge of the ethical character of its act and what is truly and essentially ethical and so find its own destruction in point of fact however the ethical substance has by this process become actual concrete self-consciousness 
in other words this particular self has become self-sufficient and self-dependent an und für sich seienden but precisely thereby the ethical order has been overthrown and destroyed end of section two recording by phone Section 3 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6a, Subsection A. The Ethical World, Law, Human and Divine, Man and Woman. Translator's Note. The first step in the analysis of spirit is to take spirit as a realized actual social order, immediately given as a historical fact, and present directly to the minds of the individuals composing it. This is social life as an established routine of human adjustments, where the natural characteristics and constitution of its moral individuals are absorbed and built into the single substance of the living social whole. It is spirit as an objectively embodied whole of essentially spiritual individuals, without any consciousness of opposition to one another or to the whole and with an absolute unbroken sense of their own security and fulfilment within the substance of social mind it is spirit at the level of naive acquiescence in the law and order of conventional life but such a self-complete type of experience has various levels of realization it cannot exist except through the union of opposing elements and the central principle of all experience self-consciousness which assumes here such a concrete form has abundant material on which to exercise its function of creating and uniting distinctions the first level is determined by the fact that the substance of social life is constituted out of the quasi-natural phenomena of human genus and species of race and nationality on the one hand and the purely natural element of specialized individual sex on the other these two aspects go together the sex relations of individuals maintain race and nationality the nation lives in and through its sexually distinct individuals the social order as an order is realized and maintained in the medium of these elements the fact that this order is an order of universal mind gives it a permanence an inviolability an absoluteness which are inseparable from it so inseparable that the order is looked on as having its roots in the absolute mind and as deriving its authority from it the social order on this aspect consists of a divinely established and divinely sanctioned regime the gods are the guardians of the city of the hearth and the home on the other hand the expression of this order varies and is enunciated from time to time in the history of a community the order in this sense is made by man the law of the social order thus becomes a human law determined by human conditions and human ends it is a round of conventions and customs these two forms of order are inseparable in the life of a community and they subsist together and side by side at this level of social consciousness they may lead to conflict in the life of the individual in the community and have to be reconciled by force or otherwise and they become associated and connected with the fundamental differences of individuality above referred to the analysis of this level of social life constituted as above furnishes the argument of the following section End of translator's note the ethical world law human and divine man and woman the simple substance of spirits being consciousness divides itself into parts in other words just as consciousness of abstract sensuous existence passes over into perception so does immediate certainty of real ethical existence and just as for sense perception bare being becomes a thing with many properties so for ethical perception a given act becomes a reality involving many ethical relations for the former again the unnecessary plurality of properties concentrates itself into the form of an essential opposition between individual and universal and still more for the latter which is consciousness purified and substantial the plurality of ethical moments is reduced to and assumes a twofold form that of a law of individuality and a law of universality each of these areas or masses of the substance remains however spirit in its entirety if in sense perception things have no other substantial reality than the two determinations of individual and universal these determinations express in the present instance merely the superficial opposition of both sides to one another individuality in the case of the subject wesen we are here considering has the significance of self-consciousness in general 
not of any particular consciousness we care to take the ethical substance is thus in this determination actual concrete substance absolute spirit realized in the plurality of distinct consciousnesses definitely existing it this spirit is the community gemeinwesen which as we entered the stage of the practical embodiment of reason in general came before us as the absolute and ultimate reality and which here comes objectively before itself in its true nature as a conscious ethical reality wesen, and as the essential reality for that mode of consciousness we are now dealing with it is spirit which is for itself since it maintains itself by being reflected in the minds of the component individuals and which is in itself or substance since it preserves them within itself qua actual substance that spirit is a nation volk qua concrete consciousness it is citizens of a nation this consciousness has its essential being in simple spirit and is certain of itself in the actual realization of the spirit in the entire nation it has its truth there directly not therefore in something unreal but in a spirit which exists and makes itself felt this spirit can be named human law because it has its being essentially in the form of self-conscious actuality in the form of universality that spirit is law known to everybody familiar and recognized and is every day present customary convention Sitte. in the form of particularity it is the concrete certainty of itself in any and every individual and the certainty of itself as a single individuality is that spirit in the form of government its true and complete nature is seen in its authoritative validity openly and unmistakably manifested an existence which takes the form of unconstrained independent objective fact and is immediately apprehended with conscious certainty in this form over against this power and publicity of the ethical secular human order there appears however another power the divine law for the ethical power of the state being the movement of self-conscious action finds its opposition in the simple immediate essential being of the moral order qua actual concrete universality it is a force exerted against the independence of the individual and qua actuality in general it finds inherent in that essential being something other than the power of the state we mentioned before that each of the opposite ways in which the ethical substance exists contains that substance in its entirety and contains all moments of its contents if then the community is that substance in the form of self-consciously realized action the other side has the form of immediate or directly existent substance the latter is thus on the one hand the inner principle the grief or universal possibility of the ethical order in general but on the other hand contains within it also the moment of self-consciousness this moment which expresses the ethical order in this element of immediacy or mere being which in other words is an immediate consciousness of self both as regards its essence and its particular thisness in an other and hence is a natural ethical community this is the family the family as the inner indwelling principle of sociality operating in an unconscious way stands opposed to its own actuality when explicitly conscious as the basis of the actuality of a nation it stands in contrast to the nation itself as the immediate ethical existence it stands over against the ethical order which shapes and preserves itself by work for universal ends the penance of the family stand in contrast to the universal spirit although the ethical existence of the family has the character of immediacy it is within itself an ethical entity but not so far as it is the natural relation of its component members or so far as their connection is one immediately holding between individual concrete beings for the ethical element is intrinsically universal and this relation established by nature is essentially just as much a spiritual fact and is only ethical by being spiritual let us see wherein its peculiar ethical character consists in the first place because the ethical element is the intrinsically universal element the ethical relation between the members of the family is not that of sentiment or the relationship of love the ethical element in this case seems bound to be placed in the relation of the individual member of the family to the entire family as the real substance so that the purpose of his action and the content of his actuality are taken from this substance are derived solely from the family life but the conscious purpose which dominates the action of this whole so far as that purpose concerns that whole is itself the individual member the procuring and maintaining of power and wealth turn in part merely on needs and wants 
and are a matter that has to do with desire in part they become in their higher aspect something which is merely of mediate significance this aspect does not fall within the family itself but concerns what is truly universal the community it acts rather in a negative way on the family and consists in setting the individual outside the family in subduing his mere natural existence and his mere particularity and so drawing him on towards virtue towards living in and for the whole the positive purpose peculiar to the family is the individual as such now in order that this relationship may be ethical neither the individual who does an act nor he to whom the act refers must show any trace of contingency such as obtains in rendering some particular help or service the contents of the ethical act must be substantial in character or must be entire and universal hence it can only stand in relation to the entire individual to the individual qua universal and this again must not be taken as if it were merely in idea that an act of service furthered his entire happiness whereas the service taken as an immediate or concrete act only does something particular in regard to him nor must we think that the service really takes him as its object and deals with him as a whole in a series of efforts as if it were a process of education and produces him as a kind of work where apart from the purpose which operates in a negative way on the family the real act has merely a limited content finally just as little should we take it that the service rendered is a help in time of need by which in truth the entire individual is saved for it is itself an entirely casual act which can as well be as not be the occasion of which is an ordinary actuality the act then which embraces the entire existence of the blood relation does not concern the citizen for he does not belong to the family nor does it deal with one who is going to be a citizen and so will cease to have the significance of a mere particular individual it has as its object and content this specific individual belonging to the family takes him as a universal being divested of his sensuous or particular reality the act no longer concerns the living but the dead one who has passed through the long sequence of his broken and diversified existence and gathered up his being into its one completed embodiment who has lifted himself out of the unrest of a life of chance and change into the peace of simple universality because it is only as citizen that he is real and substantial the individual when not a citizen and belonging to the family is merely unreal insubstantial shadow this condition of universality which the individual as such reaches is mere being death it is the immediate issue of a natural process and is not the action of a conscious mind the duty of the member of a family is on that account to attach this aspect to in order that this last phase of being also this universal being may not belong to nature alone and remain something irrational but may be something actually done and the right of consciousness be asserted in it or rather the significance of the act is that because in truth the peace and universality of a self-conscious being does not belong to nature the apparent claim which nature has made to act in this way may be given up and the truth reinstated what nature did in the individual's case concerns the aspect in which his process of becoming universal is manifested as the movement of an existent it takes effect no doubt within the ethical community and has this in view as its purpose death is the fulfilment and final task which the individual as such undertakes on its behalf but so far as he is essentially a particular individual it is an accident that his death was connected directly with his labour for the universal whole and was the outcome of his toil partly because if it was so it is the natural course of the negativity of the individual qua existent in which consciousness does not return into itself and becomes self-conscious or again because since the process of the existent consists in becoming cancelled and transcended and attaining the stage of independent self-existence death is the aspect of diremption where the self-existence which is obtained is something other than that being which entered on the process because the ethical order is spirit in its immediate truth those aspects into which its conscious life breaks up falls also into this form of immediacy and the individual's particularity passes over into this abstract negativity which being in itself without consolation or reconcilement must receive them essentially through a concrete and external act blood relationship therefore supplements the abstract natural process by adding to it the process of consciousness by interrupting the work of nature and rescuing the blood relation from destruction or better because destruction 
the passing into mere being is necessary it takes upon itself the act of destruction through this it comes about that the universal being the sphere of death is also something which has returned into itself something self-existent the powerless bare particular unity is raised to universal individuality the dead individual by his having detached and liberated his being from his action or his negative unity is an empty particular merely existing passively for some other at the mercy of every lower irrational organic agency and the chemical physical forces of abstract material elements both of which are now stronger than himself the former on account of the life which they have the latter on account of their negative nature the family keeps away from the dead this dishonouring of him by the desires of unconscious organic agencies and by abstract elements puts its own action in place of theirs and weds the relative to the bosom of the earth the elemental individuality that passes not away thereby the family makes the dead a member of a community which prevails over and holds under control the powers of the particular material elements and the lower living creatures which sought to have their way with the dead and destroy him this last duty thus accomplishes the complete divine law or constitutes the positive ethical act towards the given individual every other relation towards him which does not remain at the level of love but is ethical belongs to human law and has the negative significance of lifting the individual above the confinement within the natural community to which he belongs as a concrete individual but now though human right has for its content and power the actual ethical substance consciously aware of itself the entire nation while divine right and law derive theirs from the particular individual who is beyond the actual yet he is still not without power his power lies in the abstract pure universal the shadowy individual which seizes upon the individuality that cuts itself loose from the element and constitutes the self-conscious reality of the nation and draws it back into the pure abstraction which is the essential nature of the shadowy individual while at the same time the latter is its ultimate ground as well how this power is made explicit in the nation itself will come out more fully as we proceed now in the one law as in the other there are differences and stages for since these laws involve the element of consciousness in both cases distinction is developed within themselves and this is just what constitutes the peculiar process of their life the consideration of these differences brings out the way they operate and the kind of self-consciousness at work in both the universal essential principles wesen, of the ethical world has also their connection and transition into one another the community the higher law whose validity is open to the light of day makes its concrete activity felt in government for in government it is an individual whole government is concrete actual spirit reflected into itself the self pure and simple of the entire ethical substance this simple force allows indeed the community to unfold and expand into its component members and to give each part subsistence and self-existence of its own für sich sein spirit finds in this way its realization or its objective existence and the family is the medium in which this realization takes effect but spirit is at the same time the force of the whole combining these parts again within the unity which negates them giving them the feeling of their want of independence and keeping them aware that their life only lies in the whole the community may thus on the other hand organize itself into the systems of property and of personal independence of personal right and right in things and on the other hand articulate the various ways of working for what in the first instance are particular ends those of gain and enjoyment into their own special guilds and associations and may thus make them independent the spirit of universal assemblage and association is the single and simple principle and the negative essential factor at work in the segregation and isolation of these systems in order not to let them get rooted and settled in this isolation and thus break up the whole into fragments and let the common spirit evaporate government has from time to time to shake them to the very centre by war by this means it confounds the order that has been established and arranged and violates that right to independence while the individuals who being absorbed therein get adrift from the whole striving after inviolable self-existence and personal security are made by the task thus imposed on them by government to feel the power of their lord and master death by thus breaking up the form of fixed stability 
spirit guards the ethical order from sinking into merely natural existence preserves the self of which it is conscious and raises that self to the level of freedom and its own powers the negative essential being shows itself to be the might proper of the community and the force it has for its self-maintenance the community therefore finds the true principle and corroboration of its power in the inner nature of divine law and in the kingdom of the nether world the divine law which holds sway in the family has also on its side distinctions within itself the realizations among which make up the living process of its realization amongst the three relationships however of husband and wife parents and children brothers and sisters the relationship of husband and wife is to begin with the primary and immediate form in which one consciousness recognizes itself in another and in which each finds reciprocal recognition being natural self-knowledge knowledge of self on the basis of nature and not on that of ethical life it merely represents and typifies in a figure the life of spirit and is not spirit itself actually realized this figurative representation however gets its realization in another than it is this relationship therefore finds itself realized not in itself as such but in the child an other in whose coming into being that relationship consists and with which it passes away and this change from one generation onwards to another is permanent in and as the life of a nation the reverent devotion pietate, of husband and wife towards one another is thus mixed up with a natural relation and with feeling and their relationship is not inherently self-complete similarly too the second relationship the reverent devotion of parents and children to one another the devotion of parents towards their children is affected and disturbed just by its being consciously realized in what is external to themselves that is the children and by seeing them become something on their own account without this returning to the parents independent existence on the part of the children remains a foreign reality a reality all their own the devotion of children again towards their parents is conversely affected by their coming into being from or having their essential nature in what is external to themselves that is the parents and passes away and by their attaining independent existence and a self-consciousness of their own solely through a separation from the source whence they came a separation in which the spring gets exhausted both these relationships are constituted by and hold within the transience and the dissimilarity of the two sides which are assigned to them an unmixed intransitive form of relationship however holds between brother and sister they are the same blood which however in them has entered into a condition of stable equilibrium they therefore stand in no such natural relation as husband and wife they do not desire one another nor have they given to one another nor received from one another this independence of individual being they are free individualities with respect to each other the feminine element therefore in the form of the sister premonizes and foreshadows most completely the nature of ethical life Wesen. she does not become conscious of it and does not actualize it because the law of the family is her inherent implicit inward nature which does not lie open to the daylight of consciousness but remains inner feeling and the divine element exempt from actuality the feminine life is attached to these household divinities penance and sees in them both her universal substance and her particular individuality yet so views them that this relation of her particular being to them is at the same time not the natural one of pleasure as a daughter the woman must now see her parents pass away with natural emotion and yet with ethical resignation for it is only at the cost of this condition that she can come to that individual existence of which she is capable she thus cannot see her independent existence positively attained in her relation to her parents the relationships of mother and wife however are individualized partly in the form of something natural which brings pleasure partly in the form of something negative which finds simply its own evanescence in those relationships partly again the individualization is just on that account something contingent which can be replaced by an other particular individuality in a household of the ethical kind a woman's relationship are not based on a reference to this particular husband this particular child but to a husband to children in general not to feeling but to the universal the distinction between her ethical life while it determines her particular existence and brings a pleasure 
and that of her husband consists just in this that it has always a directly universal significance for her and is quite alien to the impulsive condition of mere particular desire on the other hand in the husband these two aspects get separated and since he possesses as a citizen the self-conscious power belonging to the universal life the life of the social whole he acquires thereby the rights of desire and keeps himself at the same time in detachment from it so far then as particularity is implicated in this relationship in the case of the wife her ethical life is not purely ethical so far however as it is ethical the particularity is a matter of indifference and the wife is without the moment of knowing herself as this particular self in and through another the brother however is in the eyes of the sister a being whose nature is unperturbed by desire and is ethically like her own her recognition in him is pure and unmixed with any sexual relation the indifference characteristic of particular existence and the ethical contingency thence arising are therefore not present in this relationship instead the moment of individual selfhood recognizing and being recognized can here assert its right because it is bound up with the balance and equilibrium resulting from their being of the same blood and from their being related in a way that involves no mutual desire the loss of a brother is thus irreparable to the sister and her duty towards him is the highest this relationship at the same time is the limit at which the circumscribed life of the family is broken up and passes beyond itself the brother is the member of the family in whom its spirit becomes individualized and enabled thereby to turn towards another sphere towards what is other than and external to itself and pass over into a consciousness of universality the brother leaves this immediate rudimentary and therefore strictly speaking negative ethical life of the family in order to acquire and produce the concrete ethical order which is conscious of itself he passes from the divine law within whose realm he lived over to the human law the sister however becomes or the wife remains director of the home and the preserver of the divine law in this way both the sexes overcome their merely natural being and become ethically significant as diverse forms dividing between them the different aspects which the ethical substance possesses both these universal factors of the ethical world have their specific individuality in naturally distinct self-consciousnesses for the reason that the spirit at work in the ethical order is the immediate unity of the substance of ethical life with self-consciousness an immediacy which thus appears as the existence of a natural difference at once as regards its aspect of reality and of difference it is that aspect which in the notion of spiritual reality came to light as original determinate nature when we were dealing with the stage of individuality which is real to itself this moment loses the indeterminateness which it still has there and the contingent diversity of constitution and capacities it is now the specific opposition of the two sexes whose natural character acquires at the same time the significance of their respective ethical determinations the distinction of the sexes and of their ethical content remains all the same within the unity of the ethical substance and its operation is just a constant process of that substance the husband is sent forth by the spirit of the family into the life of the community and finds there his self-conscious reality just as the family thereby finds in the community its universal substance and subsistence conversely the community finds in the family the formal element of its own realization and in the divine law its power and confirmation neither of the two is alone self-complete human law as a living and active principle proceeds from the divine the law holding on earth from that of the netherworld the conscious from the unconscious mediation from immediacy and returns to whence it came the power of the netherworld on the other hand finds its realization upon earth it comes through consciousness to have existence and efficacy the universal elements of the ethical life are thus the ethical substance qua universal and that substance qua particular consciousness their universal actuality is the nation and the family while they get their natural self and their operative individuality in man and woman here in this content of the ethical world we see attained those purposes which the previous insubstantial modes of conscious life set before them what reason apprehended only as an object has become self-consciousness and what self-consciousness merely contains within it is here explicit true reality what observation knew 
an object given externally and picked up and one in the constitution of which the subject knowing had no share is here a given ethical condition a custom found lying ready at hand but a reality which is at the same time the deed and the product of the subject finding it the individual who seeks the pleasure of enjoying his particular individuality finds it in the family life and the necessity in which that pleasure passes away is his own self-consciousness as a citizen of his nation or again it is knowing the law of his own heart as the law of all hearts knowing the consciousness of self to be recognized and universal ordinance of society it is virtue which enjoys the fruit of its own sacrifice which brings about what it sets out to do that is to bring the essential nature into the light of the actual present and its enjoyment lies in this universal life finally consciousness of fact as such der sache selbst gets satisfaction in the real substance which contains and maintains in positive form the abstract aspects of that empty category that substance finds a genuine content in the powers of the ethical order a content that takes the place of those insubstantial commands which the healthy human reason wanted to give and to know and in consequence thus gets a concrete inherently determinate standard for testing not the laws but what is done the whole is a stable equilibrium of all the parts and each part a spirit in its native element a spirit which does not seek its satisfaction beyond itself but has the satisfaction within itself for the reason that itself is in this balanced equipoise with the whole this condition of stable equilibrium can of course only be living by inequality arising within it and being brought back again to equipoise by righteousness and justice justice however is neither an alien principle wesen, holding somewhere remote from the present nor the realization unworthy of the name of justice of mutual malice treachery ingratitude etc which in the unintelligent way of chance and accident would fulfil the law by a kind of irrational connection without any controlling idea action by commission and omission without any consciousness of what was involved on the contrary being justice and human law it brings back to the whole to the universal life of society what has broken away separately from the harmony and equilibrium of the whole the independent classes and individuals in this way justice is the government of the nation and is its all-pervading essential life in a consciously present individual form and is the personal self-conscious will of all that justice however which restores the equilibrium the universal when getting the mastery over the particular individual is similarly the simple single spirit of the individual who has suffered wrong it is not broken up into the two elements one who has suffered wrong and a far away remote reality reason the individual himself is the power of the nether world and that reality is his fury wreaking vengeance upon him for his individuality his blood still lives in the house his substance has a lasting actuality the wrong which can be brought upon the individual in the realm of the ethical world consists merely in this that a bare something by chance happens to him the power which perpetrates on the conscious individual this wrong of making him into a mere thing is nature it is the universality not of the community but the abstract universality of mere existence and the particular individual in wiping out the wrong suffered turns not against the community for he has not suffered at its hands but against the latter as we saw those who consciously share the blood of the individual remove this wrong in such a way that what has happened becomes rather a work of their own doing and hence bare existence the last state is also to be something willed and thus an object of gratification the ethical realm remains in this way permanently a world without blot or stain a world untainted by any internal dissension so too its process is an untroubled transition from one of its powers to the other in such a way that each preserves and produces the other we see it no doubt divided into two ultimate elements and their realization but their opposition is rather the confirming and substantiation of one through the other and where they directly come in contact and affect each other as actual factors their mediating common element straightway permeates and suffuses the one with the other the one extreme universal spirit conscious of itself becomes through the individuality of man linked together with its other extreme its force and its element with unconscious spirit on the other hand divine law is individualized 
the unconscious spirit of the particular individual finds its existence in woman through the mediation of whom the spirit of the individual comes out of its unrealizedness into actuality out of the state of unknowing and unknown and rises into the conscious realm of universal spirit the union of man with woman constitutes the operative mediating agency for the whole and constitutes the element which while separated into the extremes of divine and human law is at the same time their immediate union this union again turns both the first mediate connections schlusse into one and the same synthesis and unites into one process the twofold movement in opposite directions one from reality to unreality the downward movement of human law organized into independent members to the danger and trial of death the other from unreality to reality the upward movement of the law of the netherworld to the daylight of conscious existence of these movements the former falls to man the latter to woman End of section three. Recording by phone. Section four of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six a, subsection b, ethical action, knowledge, human and divine, guilt and destiny translator's note a fundamental condition of social order is that it is maintained by action on the part of the individual members of a society action is a fundamental principle of distinction between individuals is the way they make their contribution to social life and is also the way by which the continuance of social life is ceaselessly broken and reconstituted in a comprehensive sense therefore action is the principle by which distinction and unity is carried out in social life the consideration of its significance is thus an essential problem for the analysis of social mind action must be considered at once with reference to individuality and also with reference to those conceptions of social order as containing both divine and human law in the following section this analysis is undertaken the specific historical background of hegel's thought in this section and to some extent in the preceding section is supplied by the social life of the greek city-state the greek city-state has been taken as the type so to say of spiritual existence realized as a self-complete ethical order but the social life of greece is here in large measure read and interpreted in the light of the dramatization of greek ethical conceptions by the great greek tragedians especially sophocles this accounts for the repeated reference to the purely dramatic conception of the destiny or the pathic element in the life of the individual whose spiritual existence is completely bound up with the established social order it is in greece that we find most fully realized the all-sufficiency of the state for the individual which hegel has here in view a sufficiency which was at once the strength and beauty as well as the pathos and weakness of greek social life with this and the preceding section should be read hegel's philosophy of history part two the greek world end of translator's note ethical action knowledge human and divine guilt and destiny in the form presented by the opposition of elements in the realm just dealt with self-consciousness has not yet come to its rights as a particular individuality individuality there has on one side the sense of merely universal will on the other of consanguinity of the family this particular individual has merely the significance of shadowy unreality there is as yet no performance of an act the act however is the realized self it breaks in upon the untroubled stable organization and movement of the ethical world what there appears as ordinance and harmony between both its constituent elements each of which confirms and complements the other becomes through the performing of an act a transition of opposites into one another by which each proves to be the annihilation rather than the confirmation of itself and its opposite it becomes the process of negation or destruction the eternal necessity of awful destiny which engulfs in the abyss of its bare identity divine and human law alike as well as both the self-conscious factors in which these powers subsist and to our view passes over into the absolute self-existence of mere particular self-consciousness 
the basis from which this movement proceeds and on which it takes effect is the kingdom of the ethical order but the activity at work in this process is self-consciousness being ethical consciousness it is the pure and simple direction of activity towards the essential principle of the ethical life it is duty there is no caprice and likewise no struggle no indecision in it since it has given up legislating and testing laws the essential ethical principle is for it something immediate unwavering without contradiction there is therefore neither the painful spectacle of finding itself in a collision between passion and duty nor the comic spectacle of a collision between duty and duty a collision which so far as content goes is the same as that between passion and duty for passion can also be presented as a duty because duty when consciousness withdraws into itself and leaves its immediate essential substance wesenheit comes to be the formal universal into which one content fits equally well with another as we found before the collision of duties is however comical because it brings out the contradiction inherent in the idea of an absolute standing opposed to another absolute expresses something absolute and then directly the annihilation of this so-called absolute or duty the ethical consciousness however knows not what it has to do and is decided whether it is to belong to divine or human law this directness which characterizes its decision is something immanent and inherent ansichsein, and hence has at the same time the significance of a natural condition of being as we saw nature not the accident of circumstances or choice assigns one sex to one law the other to the other law or conversely both the ethical powers themselves establish their individual existence and actualization in the two sexes thus then because on the one side the ethical order consists essentially in this immediate directness of decision and therefore only the one law is for consciousness the essential reality while on the other side the powers of the ethical order are actual in the self of conscious life in this way these forces acquire the significance of excluding one another and of being opposed to one another they are explicit in self-consciousness just as they were merely implicit in the realm of the ethical order the ethical consciousness because it is decisively on the side of one of them is essentially character there is not for it equal essentiality in both the opposition therefore appears as an unfortunate collision of duty merely with reality on which right has no hold the ethical consciousness is qua self-consciousness in this opposition and being so it at once proceeds either to subdue by force this reality opposing it to the law which it accepts or to get round this reality by craft since it sees right only on its own side and wrong on the other so of these two that which belongs to the divine law detects on the other side mere arbitrary fortuitous human violence while what appertains to human law finds in the other the obstinacy and disobedience of subjective self-sufficiency for the commands of government have a universal sense and meaning open to the light of day the will of the other law however is the inner concealed meaning of the realm of darkness unter irdisch a meaning which appears expressed as the will of a particular being and in contradicting the first is malicious offence there arises in this way a consciousness to the opposition between what is known and what is not known just as in the case of substance there was an opposition between the conscious and the unconscious and the absolute right of ethical self-consciousness comes into conflict with the divine right of the essential reality self-consciousness qua consciousness takes the objective actuality as such to have essential being looking at its substance however it is the unity of itself and this opposite and the ethical self-consciousness is consciousness of that substance the object qua opposed to self-consciousness has therefore entirely lost the characteristic of having essential being by itself just as the spheres of conscious life where the object is merely a thing are long past and gone so too are these spheres where consciousness sets up and establishes something from out itself and turns a particular moment into the essential reality wesen. against such one-sidedness actual concrete reality has a power of its own it takes the side of truth against consciousness and shows consciousness itself what the truth is the ethical consciousness however has drunk from the cup of the absolute substance forgotten all the one-sidedness of isolating self-existence all its purpose and peculiar notions 
and has therefore at the same time drowned in the stygian stream all essentiality of nature and all the independence claimed by the objective reality its absolute right therefore when it acts in accordance with ethical law is to find in this actualization nothing else than the fulfilment and performance of this law itself and that the deeds should manifest nothing but ethical action the ethical being absolute essence and absolute power at once cannot endure any perversion of its content if it were merely absolute essence without power it might undergo perversion at the hands of individuality but this latter being ethical consciousness has renounced all perverting when it gave up its one-sided subjectivity fielsichsein conversely again mere power might be perverted by the essential reality if power were still a subjectivity of that kind on account of this unity individuality is a pure form of the substance which is the content and action consists in transition from thought over into reality merely as the process of an unreal opposition whose movements have no special and particular content distinct from one another and no essential nature of their own the absolute right of ethical consciousness is therefore that the deed the mode and form of its realization should be nothing else than it knows it to be but the essential ethical reality has split asunder into two laws and consciousness taking up an undivided single attitude towards law is assigned only to one just as this simple consciousness takes its stand on the absolute right that the essential reality has appeared to it qua ethical as that reality inherently is so too this essence insists on the right belonging to its reality that is the right of having a double form this right of the essential reality does not however at the same time stand over against and oppose to self-consciousness as if it were to be found anywhere else rather it is the essential nature of self-consciousness only there has it its existence and its power and its opposition is the act of self-consciousness itself for the latter just because it is a self to itself and proceeds to act lifts itself out of the state of simple immediacy and itself sets up the division into two by the act it gives up the specific character of the ethical life that of being pure and simple certainty of immediate truth and sets up the division of itself into self as active and reality over against it and for it therefore negative by the act it thus becomes guilt for the deed is its doing and doing is its inmost nature and the guilt acquires also the meaning of crime for as simple ethical consciousness it has turned to and conformed itself to the one law but turned away from the other and thus has broken the latter by its deed guilt is not an external indifferent entity wesen, with the double meaning that the deed as actually manifested to the light of day may be an action of the guilty self or may not be so as if with the doing of it there could be connected something external and accidental that did not belong to it from which point of view therefore the action would be innocent rather the act is itself this diremption this affirming itself for itself and establishing over against this an alien external reality that such a result takes place is due to the deed itself and is the outcome of it hence innocence is an attribute merely of the want of action nicht tun, a state like the mere being of a stone and one which is not even true of a child looking at the content however the ethical act contains the element of wrongdoing because it does not cancel and transcend the natural allotment of the two laws to the two sexes but rather being an undivided attitude towards the law keeps within the sphere of natural immediacy and qua acting turns this one-sidedness into guilt by merely laying hold of one side of the essential reality and taking up a negative relation towards the other that is violating it where in the general ethical life guilt and crime deeds and actions come in will be more definitely brought out later meantime so much is at once clear that it is not this particular individual who acts and becomes guilty for he qua this particular self is merely a shadowy reality he is merely qua universal self and individuality is purely the formal aspect of doing anything at all while its content is the laws and customs which are determined for the individual the laws and customs of his class or station 
he is the substance qua genus which by its determinateness becomes no doubt a species but the specific form remains at the same time the generic universal self-consciousness within the life of a nation descends from the universal only down as far as specific particularity but not as far as the single individuality which sets up an exclusive self establishes in its action a reality negative to itself on the contrary the action of that self-consciousness rests on secure confidence in the whole into which there enters nothing alien or foreign neither fear nor hostility ethical self-consciousness now comes to find in its deed the full explicit meaning of concrete real action as much when it followed divine law as when it followed human the law manifest to it is in the essential reality bound up with its opposite the essential reality is the unity of both but the deed has merely carried out one as against the other but being bound up with this other in the inner reality the fulfilment of the one calls forth the other in the shape of something which having been violated and now become hostile demands revenge an attitude which the deed has made it take up in the case of action only one face of the decision is in general in evidence the decision however is inherently something negative which plans an other in opposition to it something foreign to the decision which is clear knowledge actual reality therefore keeps concealed within itself this other aspect alien to clear knowledge and does not show itself to consciousness as it fully and truly is an und für sich in the story of oedipus the son does not see his own father in the person of the man who has insulted him and whom he strikes to death nor his mother in the queen whom he makes his wife in this way a hidden power shunning the light of day waylays the ethical self-consciousness a power which bursts forth after the deed is done and seizes the doer in the act for the completed deed is the removal of the opposition between the knowing self and the reality over against it the ethical consciousness cannot disclaim the crime and its guilt the deed consists in setting in motion what was unmoved and in bringing out what in the first instance lay shut up as a mere possibility and thereby linking on the unconscious to the conscious the non-existent to the existent in this truth therefore the deed comes to the light it is something in which a conscious element is bound up with what is unconscious what is peculiarly one's own with what is alien and external it is an essential reality divided in sunder whose other aspect consciousness discovers and also finds to be its own aspect but as a power violated by its doing and roused to hostility against it it may well be that the right which kept itself in reserve is not in its peculiar form present to the consciousness of the doer but is merely implicit present in the subjective inward guilt of the decision and the action but the ethical consciousness is more complete its guilt purer if it knows beforehand the law and the power which it opposes if it takes them to be sheer violence and wrong to be a contingency in the ethical life and wittingly like antigone commits the crime the deed when accomplished transforms its point of view the very performance of it eo ipso expresses that what is ethical has to be actual for the realization of the purpose is the very purpose of acting acting expresses precisely the unity of reality and the substance it expresses the fact that actuality is not an accident for the essential element but that in union with that element is given to no right which is not true right on account of this actuality and on account of its deed ethical consciousness must acknowledge its opposite as its own actuality it must acknowledge its guilt because of our sufferings we acknowledge we have erred to acknowledge this is expressly to indicate that the severance between ethical purpose and actuality has been done away it means the return to the ethical frame of mind which knows that nothing counts but right thereby however the agent surrenders his character and the reality of his self and has utterly collapsed his being lies in belonging to his ethical law as his substance in acknowledging an opposite however he has ceased to find his substance in this law and instead of reality this has become an unreality a mere sentiment a frame of mind the substance no doubt appears as the pathic element in the individuality and the individuality appears as the factor which animates the substance and hence stands above it but the substance is a pathic element 
which is at the same time his character the ethical individuality is directly and inherently one with this its universal exists in it alone and is incapable of surviving the destruction which this ethical power suffers at the hand of its opposite this individuality however has all the same the certainty that that individuality whose pathic element is this opposite power the substance suffers no more harm than it has inflicted the opposition of the ethical powers to one another and the process of the individuality setting up these powers in life and action have reached their true end merely in the fact that both sides undergo the same destruction for neither of the powers has any advantage over the other that it should be a more essential moment of the substance common to both the fact of their being equally and to the same degree essential and subsisting independently beside each other means their having no separate self in the act they have a self-nature but a different self which contradicts the unity of the self and cancels their claim to independent right and thus brings about their necessary destruction character too in part looking at its pathic element the substance belongs to one alone in part when we look at the aspect of knowledge the one character like the other is divided into a conscious element and an unconscious and since each itself calls forth this opposition and the want of knowledge is by the act also its doing each falls into the guilt which consumes it the victory of one power and its character and the defeat of the other side would thus be merely the part and the incomplete work which steadily advances till the equilibrium between the two is attained it is in the equal suppression of both sides that absolute right is first accomplished and the ethical substance as the negative force devouring both sides in other words omnipotent and righteous destiny makes its appearance if both powers are taken according to their specific content and its individualization we have the scene presented of a contest between them as individuated on its formal side this is the struggle of the ethical order and of self-consciousness with unconscious nature and a contingency due to this nature the latter has a right as against the former because this is only objective spirit merely in immediate unity with its substance on the side of content the struggle is the rupture of divine and human law the youth goes forth from the unconscious life of the family and becomes the individuality of the community but that he still shares the natural life from which he has torn himself away is seen in the fact that he emerges therefrom only to find his claim affected by the contingency that there are two brothers who with equal right take possession of the community the inequality due to the one having been born earlier and the other later an inequality which is a natural difference has no importance for them when they enter the ethical life of society but government as the single soul the self of the national spirit does not admit of a duality of individuality and in contrast to the ethical necessity of this unity nature appears as by accident providing more than one these two brothers therefore become disunited and their equal right in regard to the power of the state is destructive to both for they are equally wrong humanly considered he has committed the crime who not being in actual possession seizes on a community at the head of which the other stood well again he has to write on his side who knew how to seize the other merely qua particular individual detached from the community and banish him while thus powerless out of the community he has merely laid hands on the individual as such not the community not the essential nature of human right the community attacked and defended from a point of view which is merely particular maintains itself and both brothers find their destruction reciprocally through one another for individuality which involves peril to the whole in the maintenance of its own self-existence für sich sein has thrust its own self out of the community and is disintegrated in its own nature the community however will do honour to the one who is found on its side the government the re-established singleness of the self of the community will punish by depriving of the last honour him who already proclaimed its devastation on the walls of the city he who came to affront the highest spiritual form of conscious life the spirit of the community must be stripped of the honour of his entire and complete nature the honour due to the spirit of the departed 
but if the universal thus lightly knocks off the highest point of its pyramid and doubtless triumphs victoriously over the family the rebellious principle of individuation it has thereby merely put itself into conflict with divine law the self-conscious with the unconscious spirit for the latter this unconscious spirit is the other essential power and therefore the power undestroyed but only insulted by the former it finds however only a bloodless shade to lend it help toward actually carrying itself out in the face of that masterful and openly enunciated law being the law of weakness and of darkness it therefore gives way to begin with before law which has force and publicity for the strength of the former is effective in the nether realm not on earth and in the light of day but the actual and concrete which has taken away from what is inward its honour and its power has thereby consumed its own real nature the spirit which is manifest to the light of day has the roots of its power in the lower world the certainty felt by a nation a certainty of which it is sure and which makes itself assured finds the truth of its oath binding all its members into one solely in the mute unconscious substance of all in the waters of forgetfulness in consequence the fulfilment of the public spirit turns round into its opposite and learns that its supreme right is supreme wrong its victory rather its own defeat the slain whose right is injured knows therefore how to find means of vengeance which are of the same reality and strength as the power at whose hands it has suffered these powers are other communities whose altars the dogs or birds defiled with the corpse of the dead which is not raised into unconscious universality by being restored as is its due due to the ultimate individuum the elemental earth but instead has remained above ground in the sphere of reality and has now received as the force of divine law a self-conscious actual universality they rise up in hostility and destroy the community which has dishonoured and destroyed its own power the sacred claims the piety of the family represented in this way the movement of human and divine law finds the expression of its necessity in individuals in whom the universal appears as a pathic element and the activity of the movement as action of individuals which gives the appearance of contingency to the necessity of the process but individuality and its action constitute the principle of individuation in general a principle which in its pure universality was called inner divine law as a moment of the visible community it does not merely exhibit that unconscious activity of the netherworld its operation is not simple external in its existence it has an equally manifest visible existence and process actual in the actual nation taken in this form what was represented as a simple process of the pathic element as embodied in individuals assumes another look and crime and the resulting ruin of the community assume the proper form of their existence human law then in its universal mode of existence is the community in its efficient operation in general is the manhood of the community in its actual efficient operation is government it has its being its process and its subsistence by consuming and absorbing into itself the separatist action of the household gods penates the individualization into insular independent families which are under the management of womankind and by keeping them dissolved in the fluent continuum of its own nature the family at the same time however is in general its element the individual consciousness its universal operative bias since the community gets itself subsistence only by breaking in upon family happiness and dissolving individual self-consciousness into the universal it creates its enemy for itself within its own gates creates it in what it suppresses and what is at the same time essential to it womankind in general womankind the everlasting irony in the life of the community changes by intrigue the universal purpose of government into a private end transforms its universal activity into a work of this or that specific individual and perverts the universal property of the state into a possession and ornament for the family woman in this way turns to ridicule the grave wisdom of maturity which being dead to all particular aims to private pleasure personal satisfaction and actual activity as well thinks of and is concerned for merely what is universal she makes this wisdom the laughing-stock of raw and wanton youth an object of derision and scorn 
unworthy of their enthusiasm she asserts that it is everywhere the force of youth that really counts she upholds this as of primary significance extols a son as one who is the lord and master of the mother who has borne him a brother as one in whom the sister finds man on a level with herself a youth as one through whom the daughter deprived of her dependence on the family unity acquires the satisfaction and the dignity of wifehood the community however can preserve itself only by suppressing the spirit of individualism and because the latter is an essential element the community likewise creates it as well and creates it too by taking up the attitude of seeking to suppress it as a hostile principle nevertheless since by cutting itself off from the universal purpose this hostile element is merely evil and in itself of no account it would be quite ineffective if the community did not recognize the force of youth manhood which while immature still remains in the condition of particularity as the force of the whole for the community the whole is a nation it is itself individuality and it really only is something for itself by other individualities being for it by its excluding these from itself and knowing itself independent of them the negative side of the community suppressing the isolation of individuals within its own bounds but originating activity directed beyond those bounds finds the weapons of its warfare in individuals war is the spirit and form in which the essential moment of ethical substance the absolute freedom of ethical self-consciousness from all and every kind of existence is manifestly confirmed and realized well on the one hand war makes the particular spheres of property and personal independence as well as the personality of the individual himself feel the force of negation and destruction on the other hand this engine of negation and destruction stands out as that which preserves the whole in security the individual who provides pleasure to woman the brave youth the suppressed principle of ruin and destruction comes now into prominence and is the factor of primary significance and worth it is now physical strength and what seems like the chance of fortune that decide as to the existence of ethical life and spiritual necessity because the existence of the ethical life thus rests on physical strength and the chances of fortune it is eo ipso settled that its overthrow has come while only household gods in the former case gave way before and were absorbed in the national spirit here the living individual embodiments of the national spirit fall by their own individuality and disappear in one universal community whose bare universality is soulless and dead and whose living activity is found in the particular individual qua particular the ethical form and embodiment of the life of spirit has passed away and another mode appears in its place this disappearance of the ethical substance and its transition into another mode are thus determined by the ethical consciousness being directed upon the law essentially in an immediate way it lies in this character of immediacy that nature at all enters into the acts which constitute the ethical life its realization simply reveals the contradiction and the germ of destruction which lie hid within that very peace and beauty belonging to the gracious harmony and unbroken equilibrium of the ethical spirit for the essence and meaning of this immediacy contains a contradiction it is at once the unconscious peace of nature and the self-conscious unresting peace of spirit on account of this naturalness the ethical life of a nation is in general a kind of individuality determined by and therefore limited by nature and thus finds its dissolution in and gives place to another type of individuality this characteristic being given a positive existence is a limitation but at the same time is the negative element in general and the self of individuality since however this determinateness passes away the life of spirit and this substance conscious of itself in all its component individuals are lost the determinate character comes forth and stands apart as a formal universality in the case of all the component individuals and no longer dwells within them as a living spirit instead the uniform solidarity of its individuality has burst into a plurality of separate points end of section four recording by phone section five of the phenomenology of mind volume two 
by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6a, subsection c. The condition of right or legal status. Translator's note. A further step in the realization of the principle of coherent sociality is reached when the individual is invested with the universality of the social order by definite enactments of the controlling agency of the social whole. His contingency as an individual is removed by his being expressly treated as a focal unity of the whole order, whose very existence is staked on maintaining him as a unit with a universal significance, and which stands or falls by maintaining him in this condition. The universal order is in this case no longer merely implicit, merely a matter of routine and custom. It is openly and objectively expressed in and through each individual component of society. The form this takes is the differentiation of the social substance into a totality of persons, each and all invested with express universal, or legally acknowledged, significance. This is the sphere of legal personality, or of individuality constituted by a system of rights. It is a supreme achievement of social existence, and the highest attainment of coherent social experience. Hence the present section. This is a condition or stage in every developed community but the specific historical material for this section is derived from the law-constituted social order of the Roman Empire, especially the empire under the Antonines. Here, whether by coincidence or otherwise, the culmination of imperial rule and the golden age of law synchronized. The triumph of Roman imperial government and the perfecting of the system of Roman jurisprudence were accomplished during the same period of time, about A.D. 131 to 235. There is every reason to suppose that the two necessarily arose and fell together, and that the decline and disappearance of the Roman law-constituted state should thus prepare the way for a further achievement of the social spirit of humanity. Hence the historical justification for the transition to the next stage of social life, that of self-discordant spiritual existence. With this section should be read Hegel's Philosophy of History, Part 3, especially the introduction to this part, and section three, chapter one, Rome under the Emperors. End of translator's note. The condition of right or legal status. The general comprehensive unity, into which the living immediate unity of individuality and the ethical substance falls back, is the soulless, geistlos, community, which has ceased to be the unselfconscious substance of individuals, and in which they now, each in a separate individual existence, count as selves and substances with a being of their own. The universal, being thus split up into the atomic units of a sheer plurality of individuals, this inoperative, lifeless spirit is a principle of equality in which all count for as much as each, that is, have the significance of persons. What in the realm of the ethical life was called the hidden divine law has in fact come out of concealment to the light of the actuality. In the former, the individual was, and was counted, actual merely as a blood relation, merely as sharing in the general life of the family. Qua particular individual, he was the selfless departed spirit. Now, however, he has come out of his unreality. Because the ethical substance is only objective, true, spirit only implies spirit the individual on that account turns back to the immediate certainty of his own self he is that substance qua positive universal but his actuality consists in being a negative universal self we saw the powers and forms of the ethical world sink in the bare necessity of mere destiny this power of the ethical world is a substance turning itself back into its ultimate and simple nature but that absolute being turning back into itself, that very necessity of characterless destiny, is nothing else than the ego of self-consciousness. This is taken henceforth as what is absolutely real, as the ultimate self-contained reality. To be so acknowledged is its substantiality, but this is abstract universality, because its content is this rigid self, not the self dissolved in the substance. Personality, then, has here risen out of the life and activity of the ethical substance. It is a condition in which the independence of consciousness has actual concrete validity. 
the unrealized abstract thought of such independence which arises through renouncing actuality was at an earlier stage before our notice in the form of stoical self-consciousness just as the latter was the outcome of lordship and bondage the mode in which self-consciousness exists immediately so personality is the outgrowth of the immediate life of spirit which is the universal controlling will of all as well as their dutiful obedience and submissive service what in stoicism was implicit merely in an abstract way is now an explicit concrete world stoicism is nothing else than the mood of consciousness which reduces to its abstract form the principle of legal status the principle of the sphere of right an independence devoid of the qualities of spirit geistlos by its flight from actuality it attained merely the idea of independence it is absolutely subjective exists solely for itself in that it does not link its being to anything that exists but rather wants to give up every kind of existence and places its essential meaning in the unity of mere thinking in the same manner the right of a person is not linked on to a richer or more powerful existence of the individual qua individual nor again connected with a universal living spirit but rather is attached to the mere unit of its abstract reality or to that unit qua self-consciousness in general now just as the abstract independence of stoicism set forth the stages of its actualization so too this last form of independence personality will recapitulate the process of the former mode the former stoicism passes over into the state of sceptical confusion into a fickle instability of negation which without adopting any permanent form strays from one contingent mode of being and thinking to another dissipates them indeed in absolute independence but just as readily creates their independence once more in fact it is simply the contradiction of consciousness claiming to be at once independent and yet devoid of independence in like manner the personal independence characteristic of the sphere of right is really a similar universal confusion and reciprocal dissolution of this kind for what passes into the absolute essential reality is self-consciousness in the sense of the bare empty unit of the person as against this empty universality the substance has the form of what supplies the filling and the content and this content is now left completely detached and disconnected for the spirit which kept it in subjection and held it in its unity is no longer present the empty unit of the person is therefore as regards its reality an accidental existence a contingent insubstantial process and activity that comes to no durable subsistence just as was the case in scepticism the formalism of right is thus by its very conception without special content it finds at its hand the fact of possession a fact subsisting in multiplicity and imprints thereon the abstract universality by which it is called property the same sort of abstraction as scepticism made use of but while the reality so determined is in scepticism called a mere appearance a mere semblance and has merely a negative value in the case of right it has a positive significance the negative value in the former case consists in the real having the meaning of self qua thought qua inherent universal the positive significance in the latter case however consists in its being mine in the sense of the category as something whose validity is admitted recognized and actual both are the same abstract universal the actual content the proper value of what is mine whether it be an external possession or again inner riches or poverty of mind and character is not contained in this empty form and does not concern it the content belongs therefore to a particular specific power which is something different from the formal universal is chance and caprice consciousness of right therefore in the course of the very process of making its claim good finds that it loses its own reality discovers its complete lack of inherent substantiality and that to describe an individual as a person is to use an expression of contempt the free and unchecked power possessed by the content takes determinate shape in this way the absolute plurality of dispersed atomic personalities is by the nature of this characteristic feature gathered at the same time into a single centre alien to them and just as devoid of the life of spirit geistlos 
that central point is in one respect like the atomic rigidity of their personality a merely particular reality but in contrast to their empty particularity it has the significance of the entire content and hence is taken to be the essential element while again in contrast to their pretended absolute but inherently insubstantial reality it is the universal power and absolute actuality this lord and master of the world takes himself in this way to be the absolute person comprising at the same time all existence within himself for whom there exists no higher type of spirit he is a person but the sole and single person who has challenged confronted and conquered all these all constitute and establish the triumphant universality of the one person for this particular as such is truly what it is only qua universal plurality of particular units cut off from this plurality the solitary and single self is in fact a powerless and unreal self at the same time it is the consciousness of the content which is antithetically opposed to that universal personality this content however when liberated from its negative power means chaos of spiritual powers which when let loose as elemental independent agencies break out into wild extravagances and excesses and fall on one another in mad destruction their helpless self-consciousness is the powerless inoperative enclosure and the arena of their chaotic tumult but this master and lord of the world aware of his being the sum and substance of all actual powers is the titanic self-consciousness which takes itself to be the living god since however he exists merely qua formal self which is unable to tame and subdue those powers his procedure and his self-enjoyment are equally gigantic extravagance the lord of the world becomes really conscious of what he is that is the universal might of actuality by that power of destruction which he exercises against the contrasted selfhood of his subjects for his power is not a spiritual union and concord in which the various persons might get to know their own self-consciousness rather they exist as persons separately for themselves and all continuity with others is excluded from the absolute punctual atomicity of their nature they are therefore in a merely negative relation a relation of exclusion both to one another and to him who is their principle of connection or continuity qua discontinuity he is the essential being and content of their formal nature a content however foreign to them and a being hostile in character which abolishes just what they take to be their very essence that is bare subjectivity without any content mere empty independent existence each on its own account and again qua the continuity of their personality he destroys this very personality itself juridical personality thus finds itself rather without any substance of its own since content alien to it is imposed on it and holds good within it and does so there because such content is the reality of that type of personality on the other hand the passion for destroying and turning over everything on this unreal field gains for itself the consciousness of its complete supremacy but this self is barren desolation and hence is merely beside itself and is indeed the very abandonment and rejection of its own self-consciousness such then is the constitution of that aspect in which self-consciousness qua absolute being is actual the consciousness however that is driven back into itself out of this actuality thinks this its insubstantiality makes it an object of thought formerly we saw the stoical independence of pure thought pass through scepticism and find its true issue in the unhappy consciousness the truth about what constitutes its inherent and explicit nature its final reality if this knowledge appeared at that stage merely as the one-sided view of a consciousness qua consciousness here the actual truth of that view has made its appearance the truth consists in the fact that this universal accepted objectivity of self-consciousness is reality estranged from it this objectivity is the universal actuality of the self but this actuality is directly the perversion of the self as well it is the loss of its essential being the reality of the self that was not found in the ethical world has been gained by its reverting into the person what in the case of the former was all harmony and union comes now on the scene no doubt in developed form 
but self estranged end of section five recording by phone section six of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b spirit and self estrangement the discipline of culture translator's note the life of spirit as found in the social self-consciousness has two fundamental factors the universal spirit or social whole as such and the individual members as such the interrelation of these constitutes the spiritual existence of society each by itself is abstract but the realization of complete spiritual life through and in each is absolutely essential for spiritual fulfillment in the preceding analysis of spirit one form of this process has been considered the realization of the objective social order in and through individuals in the succeeding section with its various subsections the other process of securing the same general result is analyzed we have the movement by which starting from the individual spirit the realization of complete spiritual existence is established the former starts from the compact solidarity of the social substance and results in the establishment of separate and individually complete legal personalities the latter process starts from the rigidly exclusive unity of the individual self and issues in the establishment of a social order of absolutely universal and therefore absolutely free wills both processes are per se abstract necessary though they are hence as we shall find a further stage in the evolution of spirit has still to appear the process of spirit in this second stage assumes from the start a conscious contrast between the individual spirit and the universal spiritual whole a contrast which while profound the individual seeks to remove because the universality of spiritual existence which he seeks to attain is implicitly involved in his very being as a spiritual entity his spiritual life seems to begin with rent in twain so complete is the sense of the opposition of these factors constituting his life his true life his objective embodiment seems outside him altogether and yet is felt to be his own self he seems estranged from his complete self and the estrangement seems his own doing because the substance from which he is cut off is felt to be his own the contrast is the deepest that spirit can possibly experience just because spirit is and knows itself to be self-contained and self-complete the only reality the contrast can only be removed by effort and struggle for the individual spirit has to create or recreate for itself and by its own activity a universal objective spiritual realm which it implies and in which alone it can be free and feel itself at home the struggle spirit goes through is thus the greatest in the whole range of its experience for the opposition to be overcome is the profoundest that exists since its aim is to achieve the highest for itself nothing sacred can be allowed to stand in its way it will make any sacrifice and if necessary produce the direst spiritual disaster a spiritual reign of terror to accomplish its result the movement of spirit here analyzed covers every form of the individual's struggle for a substantial spiritual life it embraces the intellectual economic religious and the ethical in a narrower sense of these terms it embraces all that we mean by culture and civilization hence the various parts of the argument spiritual discipline enlightenment the pursuit of wealth belief and superstition absolute freedom the process of spiritual life passed under critical review here is familiar to a greater or less extent in every age and every society but the actual historical material present to the mind of the writer is derived from one the period of european history embracing the entrance of christianity and christian philosophy into european civilization after the fall of the roman empire and the intellectual humanistic awakening of the renaissance which led on to the ecclesiastical revolution known as the reformation two the rationalistic movement of the eighteenth century the so-called enlightenment which proceeded and culminated in the french revolution the supreme outburst of spiritual emancipation known in european history these two periods far removed as they are in time have much in common 
they embody principles of spiritual development fundamentally alike and are therefore freely drawn upon in the analysis regardless of historicity much of hegel's analysis of the first stage of this spiritual movement has also directly in view the character of rameau in diderot's dialogue le niveau de rameau this remarkable work was written in seventeen sixty but was first brought to the notice of the literary public by goethe who translated and published the work in eighteen o five it thus came into hegel's hand while he was writing the phenomenology and this perhaps accounts for the repeated references to it in the argument the term self-estranged spirit with which he heads this section occurs in goethe's translation rameau is an extreme type of such a spirit with this section should be read hegel's philosophy of history part three section three chapter two part four section two chapter one section three chapter one and three the history of philosophy part three introduction and chapter two the french philosophy and the german enlightenment end of translator's note spirit in self-estrangement the discipline of culture the ethical substance preserved and kept opposition enclosed within its simple conscious life and this consciousness was in immediate unity with its own essential nature that nature has therefore the simple characteristic of something merely existing for the consciousness which is directed immediately upon it and whose custom zita it is consciousness does not stand for a particular excluding self nor does the substance mean for it an existence shut out from it with which it would have to establish its identity only through estranging itself and yet at the same time have to produce that estrangement but that mind whose self is absolutely insular absolutely discreet finds its content over against itself in the form of a reality that is just as impenetrable as itself and the world here gets the characteristic of being something external negative to self-consciousness yet this world is a spiritual reality it is essentially the fusion of individuality with being this its existence is the work of self-consciousness but likewise an actuality immediately present and alien to it which has a peculiar being of its own and in which it does not know itself this reality is the external element and the free content of the sphere of legal right but this external reality which the master of the world of legal right takes control of is not merely this elementary irreducible entity casually lying before the self it is his work but not in a positive sense rather negatively so it preserves its existence by self-consciousness of its own accord relinquishing itself and giving up its essentiality the condition which in that waste and ruin which prevail in the sphere of right the external force of the elements let loose seem to bring upon self-consciousness these elements by themselves are sheer ruin and destruction and cause their own overthrow this overthrow however this their negative nature is just the self it is their subject their action and their process such process and activity again through which the substance becomes actual are the alienation of personality for the immediate self that is the self without estrangement and holding good as it stands is without substantial content and the sport of these raging elements its substance is thus just its relinquishment and the relinquishment is the substance that is the spiritual powers forming themselves into a coherent world and thereby securing their subsistence the substance in this way is spirit self-conscious unity of the self and the essential nature but both also take each other to mean and to imply alienation spirit is consciousness of an objective reality which exists independently on its own account over against this consciousness stands however that unity of the self with the essential nature consciousness pure and simple over against actual consciousness on the one side actual self-consciousness by its self-relinquishment passes over into the real world and the latter back again into the former on the other side however this very actuality both person and objectivity is cancelled and superseded they are purely universal this its alienation is pure consciousness or the essential nature the present has at once its opposite in its beyond which consists in its thinking and its being thought just as this again has its opposite in what is here in the present which is its actuality alienated from it 
spirit in this case therefore constructs not merely one world but a twofold world divided and self-opposed the world of the ethical spirit is its own proper present and hence every power it possesses is found in this unity of the present and so far as each separates itself from the other each is still in equilibrium with the whole nothing has the significance of a negative of self-consciousness even the spirit of the departed is in the life-blood of his relative is present in the self of the family and the universal power of government is the will the self of the nation here however what is present means merely objective actuality which has its consciousness in the beyond each particular moment as an essential entity perceives this and thereby actuality from another and so far as it is actual its essential being is something other than its own actuality nothing has a spirit self-established and indwelling within it rather each is outside itself in what is alien to it the equilibrium of the whole is not the unity which abides by itself nor its inwardly secured tranquillity but rests on the alienation of its opposite the whole is therefore like each particular moment a self-estranged reality it breaks up into two spheres in one kingdom self-consciousness is actually both the self and its object and in another we have the kingdom of pure consciousness which being beyond the former has no actual present but exists for faith is matter of belief now just as the ethical world passes from the separation of divine and human law with its various forms and its consciousness gets away from the division into knowledge and the absence of knowledge and returns into the principle which is its destiny into the self which is the power to destroy and negate this opposition so too both these kingdoms of self-alienated spirit were returned into the self but while the former was the first self holding good directly the particular person the second which returns into itself from its self-relinquishment will be the universal self the consciousness grasping the conception and these spiritual worlds all of whose moments insist on being a fixed reality and an unspiritual subsistence will be dissolved in the light of pure insight this insight being the self-grasping itself completes the stage of culture it takes up nothing but the self and everything as the self that is it comprehends everything extinguishes all objectiveness and converts everything implicit into something explicit everything which has a being in itself into what is for itself when turned against belief against faith as the far-away region of inner being lying in the distant beyond it is enlightenment aufklärung this enlightenment also terminates self-estrangement in this region where their spirit in self-alienation turns to seek its safety as to a region where it becomes conscious of a peace adequate to itself enlightenment upsets the household arrangements which spirit carries out in the house of faith by bringing in the goods and furnishings belonging to the world of the here and now a world which that spirit cannot refuse to accept as its own property for its conscious life likewise belongs to that world in this negative task pure insight realizes itself at the same time and brings to light its own proper object the unknowable absolute being and utility since in this way actuality has lost all substantiality and there is nothing more implicit in it the kingdom of faith as also that of the real world is overthrown and this revolution brings about absolute freedom the stage at which the spirit formerly estranged has gone back completely into itself leaves behind this sphere of culture and passes over into another region the land of the inner or subjective moral consciousness moralischen bewusstsein End of section 6. Recording by phone. Section 7 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6b, Part 1a. The World of Spirit and Self-Estrangement. Part 1 the sphere of spirit at this stage breaks up into two regions the one is its real world its self-estrangement the other is constructed and set up in the ether of pure consciousness and is exalted above the first 
this second world being constructed in opposition and contrast to that estrangement is just on that account not free from it on the contrary it is only another form of that very estrangement which consists precisely in having a conscious existence in two sorts of worlds and embraces both hence it is not self-consciousness of absolute being in and for itself not religion which is here dealt with it is belief faith in so far as faith is a flight from the actual world and thus is not a self-complete experience an und für sich such flight from the realm of the present is therefore directly in its very nature a dual state of mind pure consciousness is the sphere into which spirit rises but it is not only the element of faith but of the notion as well consequently both appear on the scene together at the same time and the latter comes before us only in antithesis to the former culture and its sphere of objective reality the spirit of this world is spiritual essence permeated by a self-consciousness which knows itself to be directly present as a self-existent particular and has that essence as its objective actuality over against itself but the existence of this world as also the actuality of self-consciousness depends on the process that self-consciousness divests itself of its personality by so doing creates its world and treats it as something alien and external of which it must now take possession but the renunciation of its self-existence is itself the production of objective actuality and in doing so therefore self-consciousness ipso facto makes itself master of this world to put the matter otherwise self-consciousness is only something definite it only has real existence so far as it alienates itself from itself by doing so it puts itself in the position of something universal and this its universality actualizes it establish it, it objectively makes it valid this equality of the self with all selves is therefore not the equality that was found in the case of right self-consciousness does not here as there get immediate recognition and acknowledgment merely because it is on the contrary its claim to be rests on its having made itself by that mediating process of self-alienation conform to what is universal the spiritless formal universality which characterizes the sphere of right takes up every natural form of character as well as of existence and sanctions and establishes them the universality which holds good here is one that has undergone development and for that reason it is concrete and actual the means then whereby an individual gets objective validity and concrete actuality here is the formative process of culture the alienation on the part of spirit from its natural existence is here the individual's true and original nature his very substance the relinquishment of this natural state is therefore both his purpose and his mode of existence it is at the same time the mediating process the transition of the thought constituted substance to concrete actuality as well as conversely the transition of determinate individuality to its essential constitution this individuality moulds itself by culture to what it inherently is and only by so doing is it then something per se and possessed of concrete existence the extent of its culture is the measure of its reality and its power although the self qua this particular self knows itself here to be real yet its concrete realization consists solely in cancelling and transcending the natural self the original determinateness of its nature is therefore reduced to a matter of quantity to a greater or less energy of will a non-essential principle of distinction but purpose and content of the self belong to the universal substance alone and can only be something universal the specific particularity of a given nature which becomes purpose and content is something powerless and unreal it is a kind of being which exerts itself foolishly and in vain to attain embodiment it is the contradiction of giving reality to the bare particular while reality is ipso facto something universal if therefore individuality is falsely held to consist in particularity of nature and character then the real world contains no individualities and characters individuals are all alike for one another the pretense vermeint of individuality in that case is precisely the mere presumptive 
gemeind existence which has no permanent place in this world where only renunciation of self and therefore only universality get actual reality what is presumed or conjectured to be das gemeinte passes therefore simply for what it is for a kind of being kind is not quite the same as espèce the most horrible of all nicknames for it signifies mediocrity and denotes the highest degree of contempt a kind and to be good of its kind are german expressions which add an air of honesty to this meaning as if it were not so badly meant and intended after all or which indeed do not yet involve a clear consciousness of what kind and what culture and reality are that which in reference to the particular individual appears as his culture is the essential moment of spiritual substance as such that is the direct transition of its ideal thought constituted universality into actual reality or otherwise put culture is the single soul of this substance in virtue of which the essentially inherent an sich becomes something explicitly acknowledged and assumes definite objective existence the process in which an individuality cultivates itself is therefore ipso facto the development of individuality qua universal objective being that is to say it is the development of the actual world this world although it has come into being by means of individuality is in the eyes of self-consciousness something that is directly alienated and estranged and for self-consciousness takes on the form of a fixed undisturbed reality but at the same time self-consciousness is sure this is its own substance and proceeds to take it under control this power over its substance it acquires by culture which looked at from this aspect appears as self-consciousness making itself conform to reality and doing so to the extent permitted by the energy of its original character and talents what seems here to be the individual's power and force bringing the substance under it and thereby doing away with that substance is the same thing as the actualization of the substance for the power of the individual consists in conforming itself to that substance that is in emptying itself of its own self and thus establishing itself as the objectively existing substance its culture and its own reality are therefore the process of making the substance itself actual and concrete the self is conscious of being actual only as transcended or cancelled the self does not here constitute the unity of consciousness of self and object rather this object is negative as regards the self by means of the self qua inner soul of the process the substance is so moulded and worked up in its various moments that one opposite puts life into the other each opposite by its alienation from the other gives the other stability and similarly gets stability from the other at the same time each moment has its own definite nature in the sense of having an insuperable worth and significance and has a fixed reality as against the other the process of thought fixes this distinction in the most general manner possible by means of the absolute opposition of good and bad which are poles asunder and can in no way become one and the same but the very soul of what is thus fixed consists in its immediate transition to its opposite its existence lies really in transmuting each determinate element into its opposite and it is only this alienation that constitutes the essential nature and the preservation of the whole we must now consider this process by which the moments are thus made actual and give each other life the alienation will be found to alienate itself and the whole thereby will take all its contents back into the ultimate principle it implies seinen begriff at the outset we must deal with the substance pure and simple in its immediate aspect as an organization of its moments they exist there but are inactive their soul is wanting we have here something like what we find in nature nature we find is resolved and spread out into separate and separable elements air water fire earth of these air is the unchanging factor purely universal and transparent water the reality that is forever being dissolved and given up fire its pervading active unity which is ever dissolving opposition into unity as well as breaking up simple unity into opposite constituents earth is the tightly compact knot of these separated factors the subject in which these realities are where their processes take effect 
that which they start from and to which they return in the same way the inner essential nature the simple life of spirit that pervades self-conscious reality is resolved spread out into similar general areas or masses spiritual masses in this case and appears as a whole organized world in the first area or mass it is the inherently universal spiritual being self-identical in the second it is self-existent being it has become inherently self-discordant sacrificing itself abandoning itself the third which takes the form of self-consciousness is subject and possesses in its very nature the fiery force of dissolution in the first case it is conscious of itself as immanent and implicit as existing per se in the second it finds independence self-existence fürsichsein developed and carried out by means of the sacrifice of what is universal but spirit itself is the self-containedness and self-completeness of the whole which splits up into substance qua constantly enduring and substance engaged in self-sacrifice and which at the same time resumes substance again into its own unity a whole which is at once a flame of fire bursting out and consuming the substance as well as the abiding form of the substance consumed we can see that the areas of spiritual reality here referred to correspond to the community and the family in the ethical world without however possessing the native familiarity of spirit which the latter have on the other hand if destiny is alien to this spirit self-consciousness is and knows itself here to be the real power underlying them we have now to consider these separate members of the whole in the first instance as regards the way they are presented qua thoughts qua essential inherent entities falling within pure consciousness and also secondly as regards the way they appear as objective realities in concrete conscious life in the first form the simplicity of content found in pure consciousness the real is the good the self-identical immediate unchanging and primal nature of every consciousness the independent spiritual power inherent in its essence alongside which the activity of the mere self-existent consciousness is only by-play its other is the passive spiritual being the universal so far as it parts with its own claims and lets individuals get in it the consciousness of their particular existence it is a state of nothingness a being that is null and void the bad this absolute break-up of the real into these disjecta membra is itself a permanent condition while the first member is the foundation starting point and result of individuals which are there purely universal the second member on the other hand is a being partly sacrificing itself for another and on that very account is partly their incessant return to self qua individual and their constant development of a separate being of their own but secondly these bare ideas of good and bad are similarly and immediately alienated from one another they are actual and in actual consciousness appear as moments that are objective in this sense the first state of being is the power of the state the second its resources or wealth the state power is the simple spiritual substance as well as the achievement of all the absolutely accomplished fact wherein individuals find their essential nature expressed and where their particular existence is simply and solely a consciousness of their own universality it is likewise the achievement and simple result from which the sense of its having been their doing has vanished it stands as the absolute basis of all their action where all their action securely subsists this simple pervading substance of their life owing to its thus determining their unalterable self-identity as the nature of objective being and hence only stands in relation to and exists for another it is thus ipso facto inherently the opposite of itself wealth or resources although wealth is something passive is nothingness it is likewise a universal spiritual entity the continuously created result of the labour and action of all just as it is again dissipated into the enjoyment of all in enjoyment each individuality no doubt becomes aware of self-existence aware of itself as particular but this enjoyment is itself the result of universal action just as reciprocally wealth calls forth universal labour and produces enjoyment for all the actual has through and through the spiritual significance of being directly universal 
each individual doubtless thinks he is acting in his own interests when getting this enjoyment for this is the aspect in which he gets the sense of being something on his own account and for that reason he does not take it to be something spiritual yet looked at even in external fashion it becomes manifest that in his own enjoyment each gives enjoyment to all in his own labour each works for all as well as for himself and all for him his self-existence is therefore inherently universal and self-interest is merely a supposition that cannot get the length of making concrete and actual what it means or supposes that is to do something that is not to further the good of all thus then in these two spiritual potencies self-consciousness finds its own substance content and purpose it has there a direct intuitive consciousness of its twofold nature in one it sees what it is inherently in itself in the other what it is explicitly for itself at the same time qua spirit it is the negative unity uniting the subsistence of these potencies with the separation of individuality from the universal or that of reality from the self dominion and wealth are therefore before the individual as objects he is aware of that is as objects from which he knows himself to be detached and between which he thinks he can choose or even decline to choose altogether in the form of this detached bare consciousness he stands over against the essential reality as one which is merely there for him he then has the reality qua essential reality within itself in this bare consciousness the moments of the substance are taken to be not state power and wealth but thoughts the thoughts of good and bad but further self-consciousness is a relation of his pure consciousness to his actual consciousness of what is thought to the objective being it is essentially judgment what is good and what is bad has already been brought out in the case of the two aspects of actual reality by determining what the aspects primarily are the one is state power the other wealth but this first judgment this first distinction of content cannot be looked at as a spiritual judgment for in that first judgment the one side has been characterized as only the inherently existing or positive and the other side as only the explicit self-existent and negative but qua spiritual realities each permeates both moments pervades both aspects and thus their nature is not exhausted in those specific characteristics positive and negative the self-consciousness that has to do with them is self-complete is in itself and for itself it must therefore relate itself to each in that twofold form in which they appear and by so doing this nature of theirs which consists in being self-estranged determinations will come to light now self-consciousness takes that object to be good and to exist per se in which it finds itself and that to be bad when it finds the opposite of itself there goodness means its identity with objective reality badness their disparity at the same time what is for it good and bad is per se good and bad because it is just that in which these two aspects of being per se and of being for it are the same it is the real indwelling soul of the objective facts and the judgment is the evidence of its power within them a power which makes them into what they are in themselves what they are when spirit is actively related to them their identity or non-identity with spirit that is their real nature and the test of their true meaning and not how they are identical or diverse taken immediately in themselves apart from spirit that is not their inherent being and self-existence in abstracto the active relation of spirit to these moments which are first put forward as objects to it and thereafter pass by its action into what is essential and inherent becomes at the same time their reflection into themselves in virtue of which they obtain actual spiritual existence and their spiritual meaning comes to light but as their first immediate characteristic is distinct from the relation of spirit to them the third determinate moment their own proper spirit is also distinguished from the second moment their second inherent nature das zweite ansicht derselben their essentiality which comes to light through the relation of spirit to them must in the first instance turn out different from the immediate inherent nature for indeed this mediating process of spiritual activity puts in motion the immediate characteristic and turns it into something else 
as a result of this process the self-contained conscious mind doubtless finds now in the power of the state its reality pure and simple and its subsistence but it does not find its individuality as such it finds its inherent and essential being but not what it is for itself rather it finds there its action qua individual action rejected and denied and subdued into obedience the individual thus recoils before this power and turns back into himself it is the reality that suppresses him and is the bad for instead of being identical with him that with which he is at one it is something utterly in discordance with individuality in contrast with this wealth and riches are the good they tend to the general enjoyment they are there simply to be disposed of and they ensure for every one the consciousness of his particular self riches means in its very nature universal beneficence if it refuses any benefit in a given case and does not gratify every need this is merely an accident which does not detract from its universal and necessary nature of imparting to every individual his share and being a thousand-handed benefactor these two judgments provide the idea of goodness and badness with the content which is the reverse of what they had for us self-consciousness has up till now however been related to its objects only incompletely that is only according to the criterion of the self-existent but consciousness is also real in its inherent nature and has likewise to take this aspect for its point of view and criterion and by so doing ground off completely the judgment of self-conscious spirit according to this aspect state power expresses its essential nature the power of the state is in part the quiet insistence of law in part government and prescription which appoints and regulates the particular processes of universal action the one is the substance pure and simple the other its action which animates and sustains itself and all individuals the individual thus finds therein his ground and nature expressed organized and exercised as against this the individual by the enjoyment of riches does not get to know his own universal nature he only gets a transitory consciousness and enjoyment of himself qua particular and self-existing and discovers his discordance his want of harmony with his own essential nature the conceptions good and bad thus receive here a content the opposite of which they had before these two ways of judging find each of them an identity and a disagreement in the first case consciousness finds the power of the state out of agreement with it and the enjoyment that came from wealth in accord with it while in the second case the reverse holds good there is a twofold attainment of identity and a twofold form of disagreement there is an opposite relation established towards both the essential realities we must pass judgment on these different ways of judging as such to this end we have to apply the criterion already brought forward the conscious relation where identity or agreement is found is according to this standard the good that where want of agreement obtains the bad these two types of relations must henceforth be regarded as modes or forms of conscious existence conscious life through taking up a different kind of relation thereby becomes itself characterized as different comes to be itself good or bad it is not simply distinct in virtue of the fact that it took as its constitutive principle either existence for itself or mere being in itself for both are equally essential moments of its life that dual way of judging above discussed presented those principles as separated and contained therefore merely abstract ways of judging concrete actual conscious life has within it both principles and the distinction between them falls solely within its own nature that is inside the relation of itself to the real this relation takes opposite forms in the one there is an active attitude towards state power and wealth as to something with which it is in accord in the other it is related to these realities as to something with which it is at variance a conscious life which finds itself at one with them has the attribute of nobility in the case of the public authority of the state it beholds what is in accord with itself and sees that it has there its own nature pure and simple and a region for the exercise of its own powers and takes up the position of open willing and obedient service in its interests as well as that of inner reverence towards it 
in the same way in the sphere of wealth it sees that wealth secures for it the consciousness of self-existence of realizing the other essential aspect of its nature hence it looks upon wealth likewise as something essential in relation to itself acknowledges him from whence the enjoyment comes as a benefactor and considers itself under a debt of obligation the conscious life involved in the other relation again that of disagreement has the attribute of baseness it remains at variant with both those essential elements it looks upon the authoritative power of the state as a chain as something suppressing its separate existence for its own sake and hence hates the ruler obeys only with secret malice and stands ever ready to burst out in rebellion it sees too in wealth by which it attains to the enjoyment of its own independent existence merely something discordant or out of harmony with its permanent nature since through wealth it only gets a sense of its particular isolated existence and a consciousness of passing enjoyment this type of mind loves wealth but despises it and with the disappearance of enjoyment of what is inherently evanescent regards its relation to the man of wealth as having ceased too these relations now express in the first instance a judgment the determinate characterization of what both those facts state power and wealth are as objects for consciousness not as yet what they are in their complete objective nature an und für sich the reflection which is presented in this judgment is partly at first for us who are philosophizing an affirmation of the one characteristic along with the other and hence is a simultaneous cancelling of both it is not yet the reflection of them for consciousness itself partly again they are at first immediate essential entities they have not become this nor is there in them consciousness of self that for which they are is not yet their animating principle they are predicates which are not yet themselves subject on account of the separation the entirety of the spiritual process of judgment also breaks asunder into two existent modes of consciousness each of which has a one-sided character now just as at the outset the indifference of the two aspects in the process of self-estrangement one of which was the inherent essential being of pure consciousness that is the determinate ideas of good and bad the other their actual existence in the form of state power and wealth passed to the stage of being related the one to the other passed to the level of judgment in the same way this external relation must be raised to the level of their inner unity must become a relation of thought to actual reality in this way the spirit animating both the forms of judgment will make its appearance this takes place when judgment passes into inference becomes the mediating process in which the middle term necessitating and connecting both sides of the judgment is brought forward the noble type of consciousness then finds itself in judgment related to state power in the sense that this power is indeed not a self as yet but at first is universal substance in which however this form of mind feels its own essential nature to exist is conscious of its own purpose and absolute content by taking up a positive relation to this substance it assumes a negative attitude towards its own special purposes its particular content and individual existence and lets them disappear this type of mind is the heroism of service the virtue which sacrifices individual being to the universal and thereby brings this into existence the type of personality which renounces possession and enjoyment acts for the sake of the prevailing power and becomes a concrete reality in this way through this process the universal becomes united and bound up with existence in general just as the individual consciousness makes itself by this renunciation essentially universal that from which this consciousness alienates itself by submitting to serve is its consciousness immersed in mere existence but the being alienated from itself is the inherent nature by thus shaping its life in accord with what is universal it acquires a reverence for itself and gets reverence from others the power of the state however which to start with was merely universal in thought the inherent nature becomes through this very process universal in fact becomes actual power it is actually so only in getting that actual obedience which it obtains through self-consciousness judging it to be the essential reality and through the self being freely surrendered to it the result of this action 
binding the essential reality and self indissolubly together is to produce a twofold actuality a self that is truly actualized and a state power whose authority is accepted as true owing to this alienation implied in the idea of sacrifice state power however is not yet a self-consciousness that knows itself as state power it is merely the law of the state its inherent principle that is accepted the state power has as yet no particular will for as yet the self-consciousness rendering service has not alienated its pure selfhood and made it an animating influence in the exercise of state power the serving attitude merely gives the state its bare being sacrifices merely its existence to the state not its essential nature this type of self-consciousness passes thus for something that is in conformity with the essential nature and is acknowledged and accepted because of its inherent reality the others find their essential nature operative in it but not their independent existence find their thinking their pure consciousness fulfilled but not their specific individuality it has a value therefore in their thoughts and is honoured accordingly such a type is the haughty vassal he is active in the interests of the state power so far as the latter is not a personal will a monarch but merely an essential will his self-importance lies only in the honour thus acquired only in the general opinion thinking of his concern for the essential will not in an individuality gratefully thinking of his services for he has not helped this individuality the monarch to get independence the language he would use were he to occupy a direct relation to the personal will of the state power which thus far has not arisen would take the form of counsel imparted in the interests of what is the best for all state power has therefore still at this stage no will to meet the advice and does not decide between the different opinions as to what is universally the best it is not yet governmental control and on that account is in truth not yet real state power individual self-existence the possession of an individual will that is not yet qua will surrendered is the inner separatist spiritual principle of the various classes and stations a spirit which keeps for its own behoof what suits itself best in spite of its words about the universal best and this claptrap about what is universally the best tends to be made a substitute for action bringing it about the sacrifice of existence which takes place in the case of service is indeed complete when it goes so far as death but the constant danger of a death which the individual survives leaves a specific kind of existence and hence a particular self-reference still untouched and this makes the counsel imparted in the interests of the universally best ambiguous and open to suspicion it really means in point of fact pertaining the claim to a private opinion of his own and the separate individual will as against the power of the state its relation to the latter is therefore still one of discordance and it possesses the characteristic found in the case of the base type of consciousness it is ever at the point of breaking out into rebellion this contradiction which has to be got rid of in this form of discordance and opposition between the independence of the individual conscious life and the universality belonging to state authority contains at the same time another aspect that renunciation of existence when it is complete as it is in death is one that does not revert to the conscious life that makes the sacrifice it simply is this conscious life does not survive the renunciation and exists by itself as an objective fact an und für sich. it merely passes away in the unreconciled opposition that alone is true sacrifice of individuality therefore in which it gives itself up as completely as in the case of death but all the while preserves itself in the renunciation it comes thereby to be actually what it is implicitly the identical unity of self with its opposed self in this way by the inner withdrawn and separatist spiritual principle the self as such coming forward and abrogating itself the state power becomes ipso facto raised into a proper self of its own without this alienation of self the deeds of honour the actions of the noble type of consciousness and the counsels which its insight reveals would continue to maintain the ambiguous character which as we saw kept that secret reserve of private intention and self-will in spite of its overt pretensions 
End of section 7section eight of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b part one a the world of spirit and self-estrangement culture and its sphere of objective reality part two this estrangement however takes place in language in words alone and language assumes here its peculiar role both in the sphere of the general social order Siedlichkeit, where language conveys law and commands and in the sphere of actual life where it appears as conveying advice the content of what it expresses is the essential reality and language is the form of that essential content here however it takes the form in which qua language it exists to be its content and possesses authority qua spoken word it is the power of utterance qua utterance which just in speaking performs what has to be performed for it is the existence of a pure self qua self in speech the particular self-existent self-consciousness comes as such into existence so that its particular individuality is something for others ego qua this particular pure ego is non-existent otherwise in every mode of expression it is absorbed in some concrete actuality and appears in a shape from which it can withdraw it turns reflectively back into itself away from its act as well as from its physiognomic expression and leaves such an incomplete existence in which there is always at once too much as well as too little lying soulless behind speech however contains this ego in its purity it alone expresses i qua self its existence in this case is qua existence a form of objectivity which has in it the true nature of existence ego is this particular ego but at the same time universal its appearing is ipso facto and at once the alienation and disappearance of this particular ego and in consequence its remaining all the while universal the i that expresses itself is apprehended as an ego it is a kind of infection in virtue of which it establishes at once a unity with those who are aware of it a spark that kindles a universal consciousness of self that it is perceived as a fact by others means eo ipso that its existence is itself dying away this its otherness is taken back into itself and its existence lies just in this that qua self-conscious now as it exists it has no subsistence and that it subsists just through its disappearance this disappearance is therefore itself ipso facto its continuance it is its own cognition of itself and its knowing itself as something that has passed into another self that has been perceived and apprehended and is universal spirit maintains this form of reality here because the extremes too whose unity spirit is have directly the character of being realities each on its own account their unity is disintegrated into rigid aspects each of which is an actual object for the other and each is excluded from the other the unity therefore appears in the role of a mediating term which is excluded and distinguished from the separated reality of the two sides it has therefore itself the actual character of something objective apart and distinguished from its aspects and objective for them that is the unity is an existent objective fact the spiritual substance comes as such into existence only when it has been able to take as its aspect those self-consciousnesses which know this pure self to be a reality claiming immediate validity and therein immediately know too that they are such realities merely through the process of alienation through that pure self the moments of substance get the transparency of a self-knowing category and become clarified so far as to be moments of spirit through the mediating process spirit comes to exist in spiritual form spirit in this way is the mediating term presupposing those extremes and produced through their existence but it is also the spiritual whole breaking out between them which sunders itself into them and creates each solely in virtue of that contact with the whole which belongs to its very principle 
the fact that both extremes are from the start and in their very nature transcended and disintegrated brings out their unity and this is the process which fuses both together interchanges their characteristic features and binds them together and does so in each extreme this mediating process consequently actualizes the principle of each of the two extremes or makes what each is inherently in itself its controlling and moving spirit both extremes the state authority and the noble type of consciousness are disintegrated by this latter in state power the two sides are the abstract universal which is obeyed and the individual will existing on its own account which however does not yet belong to the universal itself in nobility the two sides are the obedience in giving up existence or the inherent maintenance of self-respect and honour and on the other hand a self which exists purely for its own sake and whose self-existence is not yet done away with the self-will that remains always in reserve these two moments into which the extremes are refined and which therefore find expression in language are the abstract universal which is called the universal best and the pure self which by rendering service abrogated the life of absorption in the manifold variety of existence both in principle are the same for pure self is just the abstract universal and hence their unity acts as their mediating term but the self is to begin with actual only in consciousness as one extreme while the inherent nature an sich, is actualized in state authority as the other extreme that state power not merely in the form of honour but in reality should be transferred to it is lacking in the case of consciousness while in the case of state authority there is lacking the fact that it was obeyed not merely as a so-called universal best but as will in other words a state power which is the self regulating and deciding the unity of the principle in which state power still remains and into which consciousness has been refined becomes real in this mediating process and this exists qua mediating term in the simple form of speech all the same the aspects of this unity are not yet present in the form of two selves as selves for state power comes first to be inspired with active selfhood this language is therefore not yet spiritual existence in the sense in which spirit completely knows and expresses itself nobility of consciousness because the extreme form of self assumes the role of creating the language by which the separate factors related are formed into active spiritual wholes the heroism of dumb service passes into the heroism of flattery this reflection of service in express language constitutes the self-conscious self-disintegrating mediating term and reflects back into itself not only its own special extreme but reflects the extreme of universal power back into this self too and makes that power which is at first implicit into an independent self-existence and gives it the individualistic form of self-consciousness through this process the indwelling spirit of this state power comes into existence that of an unlimited monarch it is unlimited the language of flattery raises power into transparent clearly acknowledged universality this moment being the product of language of transparent spiritualized existence is a purified form of self-identity it is a monarch for flattering language likewise puts individualistic self-consciousness on its pinnacle what conscious nobility abandons as regards this aspect of pure spiritual unity is the pure essential nature of its thought its ego itself the naked particularity of its ego which otherwise is only imagined flattery brings out more definitely into relief as an actual existence by giving the monarch a proper name for it is in the name alone that the distinction of the individual from everyone else is not imagined but is actually made by all by having a name the individual passes for a pure individual not merely in his own consciousness of himself but in the consciousness of all by its name then the monarch becomes absolutely detached from every one exclusive and solitary and in virtue of it is unique as an atom that cannot commute any part of its essential nature and has nothing like itself this name is thus a reflection into itself or is the actual reality which universal power has inherently within itself 
through the name the power is the monarch conversely he this particular individual thereby knows himself this individual self to be universal power knows that the nobles not only are ready and prepared for the service of the state authority but are grouped as an ornamental setting round the throne and that they are forever telling him who sits thereon what he is the language of their professed praise is in this way the spirit that unites together the two extremes in the case of state power itself this language reflects in itself the abstract power and gives to it the moment peculiar to the other extreme an isolated self of its own willing and deciding on its own account and consequently gives it self-conscious existence or again by that means this self-conscious particular being comes to be aware of itself for certain as the supreme authority this power is the central focal self into which through relinquishing their own inner certainty of self the many separate centres of selfhood are fused together into one since however this proper spirit of state power subsists by getting its realization and its nourishment from the homage of action and thought rendered by the nobility it is a form of independence in internal self-estrangement the noble the extreme form of self-existence keeps back the other extreme of actual universality and keeps it back for the universality of thought which was relinquished the power of the state has passed over to and fallen upon the noble it falls to the noble primarily to make the state authority truly effective in his existence as a self on his own account that authority ceases to be the inert being it appeared to be qua extreme of abstract and merely implicit reality looked at per se state power reflected back into itself or becoming spiritual means nothing else than that it has come to be a moment of self-conscious life that is is only by being sublated consequently it is now the real in the sense of something whose spiritual meaning lies in being sacrificed and squandered it exists in the sense of wealth it continues no doubt to subsist at the same time as a form of reality over against wealth into which in principle it is forever passing but it is a reality whose inherent principle is this very process of passing over owing to the service and the reverence rendered to it and by which it arises into its opposite into the condition of relinquishing its power thus from its point of view fühlt sich the special and peculiar self which constitutes its will becomes by the self-abasement of the nobility a universal that renounces itself becomes completely an isolated particular a mere accident which is the prey of every stronger will what remains to it of the universally acknowledged and incommunicable independence is the empty name while then the nobility may adopt the attitude of something that can in a similar way stand related to the universal power its true nature lies rather in retaining its own separateness of being when rendering its service but in what is properly the abnegation of its personality its true being lies in actually cancelling and rending in pieces the universal substance its spirit is the attitude of thoroughgoing discordance inequality on one side it retains its own will in the honour it receives on the other hand it gives up its will in part it alienates its inner nature from itself and arrives at the extreme of discordance with itself in part it subdues the universal substance to itself and puts this entirely at variance with itself it is obvious that as a result its own specific nature which kept it distinct from the so-called base type of mind disappears and with that this latter type of mind too the base type has gained its end that of subordinating universal power to self-centred isolation of self endowed in this way with the universal power self-consciousness exists in the form of universal beneficence or from another point of view universal power is wealth that again is itself an object for consciousness for wealth is here taken to be the universal put in subjection which however through this first transcendence is not yet absolutely returned into the self self has not as yet its self as such for object but the universal essential reality in a state of sublation since this object has first come into being the relation of consciousness towards it is immediate 
and consciousness has thus not yet set forth its want of congruity with this object we have here the nobility preserving its own self-centred existence in the universal that has become non-essential and hence acknowledging the object and feeling grateful to its benefactor wealth has within it from the first the aspect of self-existence für sich sein it is not the selfless universal of state power or the unconstrained simplicity of the natural life of spirit it is state power as holding its own by effort of will in opposition to a will that wants to get the mastery over it and get enjoyment out of it but since wealth has merely the form of being essential this one-sided self-existent life which has no being in itself which is rather the sublation of inherent being is the return of the individual into himself to find no essential reality in his enjoyment it thus itself needs to be given animation and its reflective process of bringing this about consists in its becoming something real in itself as well as for itself instead of being merely for itself wealth which is the sublated essential reality has to become the essentially real in this way it preserves its own spiritual principle in itself it will be sufficient here to describe the content of this process since we have already explained at length its form nobility then stands here in relation not to the object in the general sense of something essential what is alien to it is self-existence itself it finds itself face to face with its own self as such in a state of alienation as an objective solid actuality which it has to take from the hands of another self-centred being another equally fixed and solid entity its object is self-existence that is its own being but by being an object this is at the same time ipso facto an alien reality which is a self-centred being on its own account has a will of its own that is it sees itself under the power of an alien will on which it depends for the concession of itself from each particular aspect self-consciousness can abstract and for that reason even when under an obligation to one of these aspects retains the recognition and inherent validity of self-consciousness as an independent reality here however it finds that as regards its own ego its own proper and peculiar actuality it is outside itself and belongs to an other finds its personality as such dependent on the chance personality of another on the accident of a moment of an arbitrary caprice or some other sort of irrelevant circumstance in the sphere of legal right what lies in the power of the objective being appears as an incidental content from which it is possible to make abstraction and the governing power possessed does not affect the self as such rather this self is recognized but here the self sees its self-certainty as such to be the most unreal thing of all finds its pure personality to be absolutely without the character of personality the sense of its gratitude is therefore a state in which it feels profoundly this condition of being utterly outcast and feels also the deepest revolt as well since the pure ego sees itself outside self and torn in sunder everything that gives continuity and universality everything that bears the name of law good and right is thereby torn to pieces at the same time and goes to wreck and ruin all identity and concord break up for what holds sway is the purest discord and disunion what was absolutely essential is absolutely unessential what has a being on its own account has its being outside itself the pure ego itself is absolutely disintegrated thus since this consciousness receives back from the sphere of wealth the objective form of being a separate self-existence and cancels that objective character it is in principle not only like the preceding reflection not completed but is consciously unsatisfied the reflection since the self receives itself as an objective fact is the immediate contradiction that has taken root in the pure ego as such qua self however it at the same time ipso facto rises above this contradiction it is absolutely elastic and again cancels this sublation of itself repudiates this repudiation of itself wherein its self-existence is made to be something alien to it revolts against this acceptance of itself and in the very reception of itself is self-existent since then the attitude of this type of consciousness is bound up with this condition of utter disintegration the distinction constituting its spiritual nature that of being nobility and opposed to baseness falls away and both aspects are the same 
the spirit of well-doing that characterizes the action of wealth may further be distinguished from that of the conscious life accepting the benefit it confers and deserves special consideration the spirit animating wealth had an unreal insubstantial independence wealth was something to be given up by communicating what it has however it passes into something essential and inherent since it fulfils its nature in sacrificing itself it cancels the aspect of particularity of merely seeking enjoyment for one's own particular self and being thus sublated qua particular the type of spirit here is universality or essentially real what it imparts what it gives to others is self-existence it does not hand itself over however as a natural selfless object as the frankly and freely offered condition of unconscious life but as self-conscious as a reality keeping hold of itself it is not like the power of an inorganic element which is felt by the consciousness receiving its force to be inherently transitory it is the power over self a power aware that it is independent and voluntary and knowing at the same time that what it dispenses becomes the self of someone else wealth thus shares reprobation with its clientele but in place of revolt appears arrogance for in one aspect it knows as well as the self it benefits that its self-existence is a matter of accident but itself is this accident in whose power personality is placed in this mood of arrogance which thinks it has secured through a dull and alien ego nature and thereby brought its inmost being into submission it overlooks the secret rebellion of the other self it overlooks the fact of all bonds being completely cast aside overlooks this pure disintegration in which the self-identity of what exists for its own sake having become sheer internal discordance all oneness and concord all subsistence is rent asunder and in which in consequence the thoughts and intentions of the benefactor are the first to be shattered it stands directly in front of this abyss cleaving it to the innermost this bottomless pit where every solid base and stay have vanished and in the depths it sees nothing but a common thing a display of whims on its part a chance result of its own caprice its spirit consists in quite unreal imagining in being superficially forsaken of all true spiritual import just as self-consciousness had its own manner of speech in dealing with state power in other words just as spirit took the form of expressly and actually mediating between these two extremes self-consciousness has also a mode of speech in dealing with wealth but still more when in revolt does it adopt a language of its own the form of utterance which supplies wealth with the sense of its own essential significance and thereby makes it master of itself is likewise the language of flattery but of ignoble flattery for what it gives out to be the essential reality it knows to be a reality without an inherent nature of its own to be something at the mercy of another the language of flattery however as already remarked is that of a one-sided spirit to be sure its constituent elements are on the one hand a self moulded by service into a shape where it is reduced to bare existence and on the other the inherent reality of the power dominating the self yet the bare principle the pure conception in which the mere self and the inherent reality an sich, that pure ego and this pure reality or thought are one and the same thing this conceptual unity of the two aspects between which the reciprocity takes effect is not consciously felt when this language is used the object is consciously still the inherent reality in opposition to the self in other words the object is not for consciousness at the same time its own proper self as such the language expressing the condition of disintegration wherein spiritual life is rent asunder is however the perfect form of utterance for this entire stage of spiritual culture and development the formative process of moulding self-consciousness building and expresses the spirit in which it most truly exists this self-consciousness which finds befitting the rebellion that repudiates its own repudiation is eo ipso absolute self-identity in absolute disintegration the pure activity of mediating pure self-consciousness with itself it is the oneness expressed in the identical judgment where one and the same personality is subject as well as predicate but this identical judgment is at the same time the infinite judgment for this personality is absolutely split in two and subject and predicate are entities utterly indifferent one to the other which have nothing to do with each other 
with no necessary unity so much so that each has the power of an independent personality of its own what exists as a self on its own account has for its object its own self-existence which is object in the sense of an absolute other and yet at the same time directly in the form of itself itself in the sense of an other not as if this had an other content for the content is the same self in the form of an absolute opposite with an existence completely all its own and indifferent we have then here the spirit of this real world of formative culture conscious of its own nature as it truly is and conscious of its ultimate and essential principle the grief this type of spiritual life is the absolute and universal inversion of reality and thought their entire estrangement the one from the other it is pure culture what is found out in this sphere is that neither the concrete realities state power and wealth nor their determinate conceptions good and bad nor the consciousness of good and bad the consciousness that is noble and the consciousness that is base possess real truth it is found that all these moments are inverted and transmuted the one into the other and each is the opposite of itself the universal power which is the substance since it gains a spiritual nature peculiarly its own through the principle of individuality accepts the possession of a self of its own merely as a name by which it is described and even in being actual power is really so powerless as to have to sacrifice itself but this selfless reality given over to another this self that is turned into a thing is in fact the return of the reality into itself it is a self-existence that is there for its own sake the existential form of spirit the principles belonging to these realities the thoughts of good and bad are similarly transmuted and reversed in this process what is characterized as good is bad and vice versa the consciousness of each of these moments by itself the conscious types judged as noble and base these are rather in their real truth similarly the reverse of what these specific forms should be nobility is base and repudiated just as what is repudiated as base turns round into the nobleness that characterizes the most highly developed form of free self-consciousness looked at formally everything is likewise in its external aspects the reverse of what is internally for itself and again it is not really and in truth what it is for itself but something else than it wants to be self-existence on its own account is strictly speaking the loss of self and alienation of self is really self-preservation the state of things brought about here then is that all moments execute justice on one another all round each is just as much in a condition of inherent alienation as it fancies itself in its opposite and in this way reverses its nature spirit truly objective however is just this unity of absolutely separate moments and in fact comes into existence as the common ground the mediating agency just through the independent reality of these selfless extremes its very existence lies in universal talk and depreciatory judgment rending and tearing everything before which all those moments are broken up that are meant to signify something real and to stand for actual members of the whole and which at the same time plays with itself this game of self-dissolution this judging and talking is therefore the real truth which cannot be got over while it overpowers everything it is that which in this real world is alone truly of importance each part of this world comes to find there its spirit expressed or gets to be spoken of with spirit and finds said of it what it is the honest soul takes each moment as a permanent and essential fact and is an uncultivated unreflective condition which does not think and does not know that it is just doing the very inverse the distraught and disintegrated soul is however aware of inversion it is in fact a condition of absolute inversion the conceptual principle predominates there brings together into a single unity the thoughts that lie far apart in the case of the honest soul and the language clothing its meaning is therefore full of esprit and wit geistreich the content uttered by spirit and uttered about itself is then the inversion and perversion of all conceptions and realities a universal deception of itself and of others the shamelessness manifested in stating this deceit is just on that account the greatest truth this style of speech is the madness of the musician 
who piled and mixed up together some thirty airs italian french tragic comic of all sorts of kinds now in a deep undertone he descended to the depths of hell then contracting his throat to a high piping falsetto he rent the vault of the skies raving and soothing haughtily imperious and mockingly jeering by turns the placid soul that in simple honesty of heart takes the music of the good and true to consist in harmony of sound and uniformity of tone that is in a melodious chord regards this style of expression as a fickle fantasy of wisdom and folly a melee of so much skill and low cunning composed of ideas as likely to be right as wrong with as complete a perversion of sentiment with as much consummate shamefulness in it as absolute frankness candour and truth it is not able to refrain from bringing out the sound of every note and running up and down the whole gamut of feeling from the depths of contempt and repudiation to the highest pitch of admiration and stirring emotion a vein of the ridiculous will be diffused through the latter which takes away from their nature the former will find in their very candour a strain of atoning reconcilement will find in their shuddering depths the all-powerful qualities which give spirit a self if we consider by way of contrast to the mode of utterance indulged in by this self-transparent distracted type of mind the language adopted by that simple placid consciousness of the good and the true we find that it can only speak in monosyllables when face to face with the frank and self-conscious eloquence of the mind developed under the influence of culture for it can say nothing to the latter that the latter does not know and say if it gets beyond speaking in monosyllables then it says the same thing that the cultivated mind expresses but in doing so commits in addition the folly of imagining that it is saying something new something different its very syllables disgraceful base are this folly already for the other says them of itself this latter type of mind perverts in its mode of utterance everything that sounds the same because this self-sameness is merely an abstraction but in its actual reality is intrinsically and inherently perversion on the other hand again the unsophisticated mind takes under its protection the good and the noble that is what retains its identity of meaning in being objectively expressed and takes care of it in the only way here possible that is to say the good must not lose its value because it may be linked with what is bad or mingled with it for to be thus associated with badness is its condition and necessity and the wisdom of nature lies in this fact yet this unsophisticated mind while it intended to contradict has merely in doing so gathered into a trifling form the meaning of what spirit said and put it in a manner which by turning the opposite of noble and good into the necessary condition of noble and good means in an unthinking way to state something else than that the so-called noble and good is by its very nature the reverse of itself or that what bad is conversely something excellent if the naive consciousness makes up for this barren soulless idea by the concrete reality of what is excellent when it produces an example of what is excellent whether in the form of a fictitious case or a true story and thus shows it to be not an empty name but an actual fact then the universal reality of perverted action stands in sharp contrast to the entire real world where that example constitutes merely something quite isolated and particular merely an espèce a sort of thing and to represent the existence of the good and the noble as an isolated particular anecdote whether fictitious or true is the bitterest thing that can be said about it finally should the naive mind require this entire sphere of perversion to be dissolved and broken up it cannot ask the individual to withdraw out of it for even diogenes in his tub with his pretence of withdrawal is under the sway of that perversion and to ask this of the particular individual is to ask him to do precisely what is taken to be bad that is to care for the self as particular but if the demand to withdraw is directed at the universal individual it cannot mean that reason must again give up the culture and development of spiritual conscious life which has been reached that reason should let the extensive riches of its moments sink back into the naivete of natural emotion and revert and approximate to the wild condition of the animal consciousness which is also called the natural state of innocence 
on the contrary the demand for this dissolution when addressed to the spirit realized in culture can only mean that it must qua spirit return out of its confusion into itself and win for itself a still higher level of conscious life in point of fact however spirit has already accomplished this result to be conscious of its own distraught and torn condition and to express itself accordingly this is to pour scornful laughter on its existence on the confusion pervading the whole and on itself as well it is at the same time this whole confusion dying away and yet apprehending itself to be doing so this self-apprehending vanity of all reality and of every definite principle reflects the real world into itself in a twofold form in the particular self of consciousness qua particular and in the pure universality of consciousness in thought according to the one aspect mind thus come to itself has directed its gaze into the world of actual reality and makes that reality its own purpose and its immediate content from the other side its gaze is in part turned solely on itself and against that world of reality in part turned away from it towards heaven and its object is the region beyond the world in respect of that return into self the vanity of all things is its own peculiar vanity it is itself vain it is self existing for its own sake a self that knows not only how to sum up and chatter about everything but with esprit and wit to hit off the contradiction that lies in the heart of the all so solid seeming reality and the fixed determinations which judgment set up and that contradiction is their real truth looked at formally it finds everything estranged from itself self-existence is cut off from essential being an sich. what is intended and the purpose are separated from real truth and from both again existence for another what is ostensibly put forward is cut off from the proper meaning the real fact the true intention it thus knows exactly how to put each moment in antithesis to every other knows in short how to express correctly the perversion that dominates all of them it knows better than each what each is no matter how it is constituted since it apprehends what is substantial from the side of that disunion and contradiction of elements combined within its nature but not from the side of disunion itself it understands very well how to pass judgment on this substantial reality but has lost the capacity of truly grasping it this vanity needs at the same time the vanity of all things in order to get from them consciousness of itself it therefore itself creates this vanity and is the soul that supports it state power and wealth are the supreme purposes of its strenuous exertion it is aware that through renunciation and sacrifice it is moulded into universal shape that it attains universality and in possessing universality finds general recognition and acceptance state power and wealth are the real and actually acknowledged sources of power but its gaining acceptance thus is itself vain and just by the fact that it gets the mastery over them it knows them to be not real by themselves knows rather itself to be the power within them and them to be vain and empty that in possessing them it thus itself is able to stand apart from and outside them this is what it expresses in spirited languages and to express this is therefore its supreme interest and the true meaning of the whole process in such utterance this self in the form of a pure self not associated with or bound by determinations derived either from reality or thought comes consciously to be a spiritual entity having a truly universal significance and value it is the condition in which the nature of all relationships is rent asunder and it is the conscious rending of them all but only by self-consciousness being roused to revolt does it know its own peculiar torn and shattered condition and in its knowing this it has ipso facto risen above that condition in that state of self-conscious vanity all substantial content comes to have a negative significance which can no longer be taken in a positive sense the positive object is merely the pure ego itself and the consciousness that is rent in sunder is inherently and essentially this pure self-identity of self-consciousness returned to itself end of section eight
Section nine of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six b, part one b, belief and pure insight. The spiritual condition of self-alienation exists in the sphere of culture as a fact, but since this whole has become estranged from itself there lies beyond this sphere the non-actual region of pure consciousness of thought its content consists of what has been reduced purely to thought its absolute element is thinking since however thinking is in the first instance the element of this sphere consciousness has merely these thoughts but it does not yet think them or does not know that they are thoughts to consciousness they appear in the form of presentations they are objects in the form of ideas for it comes out of the sphere of actuality into that of pure consciousness but is itself still to all intents and purposes in the sphere of actuality but the determinateness that implies the conscious state of being rent and torn to pieces is still essentially and inherently the self-identity of pure consciousness not as a fact that itself is aware of but only as presented to us who are considering its condition it has thus not as yet completed within itself the process of rising above this condition it is simply there and it still has within itself the opposite principle by which it is conditioned without as yet having become master of that principle through a mediating process hence the essential content of its thought is not taken to be an essential object merely in the form of abstract immanence an sich, but in the form of a common object an object that has merely been elevated into another element without having lost the character of an object that is not constituted by thought it is essentially distinct from the immanent nature which constitutes the essential being of the stoic type of consciousness the significant factor for stoicism was merely the form of thought as such which has any content foreign to it that is drawn from reality in the case of the consciousness just described however the form of thought is not the significant element similarly it is essentially distinct from the inherent principle of the virtuous type of conscious life here the essential fact stands no doubt in a relation to reality it is the essence of reality itself but it is no more than an unrealized essence of it in the above type of consciousness the essence although no doubt beyond reality stands all the same for an actual real essence in the same way the inherently right and good which reason as lawgiver establishes and the universal operating when consciousness tests and examines laws neither of these has the character of actual reality hence while pure thought fell within the sphere of spiritual culture as an aspect of the estrangement characteristic of this sphere as the standard in fact for judging abstract good and abstract bad it has become enriched by having gone through the process of the whole with the element of reality and thereby with content this reality of its essential being however is at the same time merely a reality of pure consciousness not of concrete actual consciousness it is no doubt lifted into the element of thought but this concrete consciousness does not yet take for it a thought it is beyond the reality peculiar to this consciousness for it means flight from the latter in the form in which religion here appears for it is religion obviously that we are speaking about as the belief which belongs to the realm of culture religion does not yet appear as it is truly and completely an und für sich. it has already come before us in other phases that is as the unhappy consciousness as a form of conscious process with no substantial content in it so too in the case of the ethical substance it appeared as a belief in the nether world but the consciousness of departed spirits is strictly speaking not belief not the inner essence subsisting in the element of pure consciousness away beyond the actual there the belief has itself an immediate existence in the present its element its substance is the family but at the stage we are now considering religion is in part the outcome of the substance and is the pure consciousness of that substance in part this pure consciousness is alienated from its concrete actual consciousness the essence from its existence it is thus doubtless no longer the insubstantial process of consciousness but it has still the characteristic of opposition to reality qua the given reality in general and of opposition to the reality of self-consciousness in particular 
it is essentially thereof merely a belief this pure consciousness of absolute being is a consciousness in alienation let us see more closely what is the characteristic of that whose other it is we can only consider it in connection with this other in the first instance this pure consciousness seems to have over against it merely the world of actuality but since its nature is to flee from this actuality and thereby is characterized by opposition it has this actuality inherent within its own being pure consciousness is therefore essentially in its very being self-alienated and belief constitutes merely one side of it the other side has already arisen too for pure consciousness is reflection out of the world of culture in such a way that the substantial content of this sphere as also the separate fragments into which it falls are shown to be what they inherently are essential modes of spiritual life absolutely restless processes or determinate moments which are at once cancelled in their opposite their essential nature bare consciousness is thus the bare simplicity of absolute distinction distinction which as it stands is no distinction consequently it is pure self-existence not of a particular self but essentially universal self whose being consists in a restless process invading and pervading the stable existence of actual fact in it is found the certainty that knows itself at once to be the truth there we have pure thought in the sense of absolute notion with all its power of negativity which annihilates every objective existence that would claim to stand over against consciousness and turns it into a form of conscious existence this pure consciousness is at the same time simple and undifferentiated as well just because its distinction is no distinction being this form of bare and simple reflection into self however it is the element of belief in which spirit has the special feature of positive universality of what is inherent and essential in contrast with that self-existence on the part of self-consciousness forced back upon itself away from this unsubstantial world whose being is mere dissolution spirit in its undivided unity is when we consider its true meaning at once the absolute movement the ceaseless process of negating its appearance as well as the essential substance thereof satisfied within itself and the positive stability of that appearance but bearing as they inherently do the characteristic of alienation both these moments fall apart in the shape of a twofold consciousness the former is pure insight the spiritual process concentrated and focused in self-consciousness a process which has over against it the consciousness of something positive the form of objectivity or presentation and which directs itself upon this presented object the proper and peculiar object of this insight is however merely pure ego the bare consciousness of the positive element of unbroken self-identity finds its object on the other hand in the inner reality as such pure insight has therefore in the first instance no content within it because it exists for itself by negating everything in it to belief on the other hand belongs the content but without insight while the former does not get away from self-consciousness the latter to be sure has its content as well in the element of pure self-consciousness but only in presentation not in conceptions in pure consciousness not in pure self-consciousness belief is as a fact in this way pure consciousness of the essential reality that is of the bare and simple inner nature and is thus thought the primary factor in the nature of belief which is generally overlooked the immediateness which characterizes the presence of the essential reality within it is due to the fact that its object is essence inner nature that is pure thought this immediateness however so far as thinking enters consciousness or pure consciousness enters into self-consciousness maintains the significance of an objective being that lies beyond consciousness of self it is because of the significance which immediacy and simplicity of pure thought thus retain in consciousness that the essential reality in the case of belief drops into being an objectively presented idea Vorstellung, instead of being the content of thought and comes to be looked at as a supersensible world which is essentially an other for self-consciousness in the case of pure insight on the other hand the entrance of pure thought into consciousness has the opposite character objectivity has the significance of a content that is merely negative that cancels itself and returns into the self 
that is to say only the self is properly object to self or to put it otherwise the object only has truth so far as it has the form of self as belief and pure insight fall in common with pure consciousness they also in common involve the mind's return out of the concrete sphere of spiritual culture there are three aspects therefore from which they show what they are in one aspect each is outside every relation and has a being all its own in another each takes up an attitude towards the concrete actual world standing in antithesis to pure consciousness while in the third form each is related to the other inside pure consciousness in the case of belief the aspect of complete being of being in and for itself is its absolute object whose content and character we have already come to know for it lies in the very notion of belief that this object is nothing else than the real world lifted into the universality of pure consciousness the articulation of this world therefore constitutes the organization belonging to pure universality also except that the parts in the latter case do not alienate one another when spiritualized but are complete realities all by themselves our spirits returned into themselves and self-contained the process of their transition from one into the other is therefore only for us who are analyzing the process an alienation of the characteristic nature in which their distinction lies and only for us the observers does it constitute a necessary series for belief however their distinction is a static diversity and their movement simply a historical fact to deal shortly with the external character of their form as in the world of culture state power or the good was primary so here the first and foremost moment is absolute being spirit absolutely self-contained so far as it is simple eternal substance but in the process of realizing its constitutive notion which consists in being spirit that substance passes over into a form where it exists for an other its self-identity becomes actual absolute being actualized in self-sacrifice it becomes a self but a self that is transitory and passes away hence the third stage is the return of self thus alienated the substance thus abased into its first primal simplicity of nature only when this is done is spirit presented and manifested as spirit these distinct ultimate realities when brought back by thought into self out of the flux of the actual world are changeless eternal spirit whose being lies in thinking the unity which they constitute while thus torn away from self-consciousness these realities all the same lay hold on it for if the ultimate reality were to be fixed and unmoved in the form of the first bare and simple substance it would remain alien to self-consciousness but the laying aside the emptying of this substance and afterwards its spirit involves the element of concrete actuality and thereby participates in the believing self-consciousness or the believing attitude of consciousness belongs to the real world according to this second condition the believing type of consciousness partly finds its actuality in the real world of culture and constitutes its spirit and its existence which have been described partly however belief takes up an attitude of opposition to this its own actuality looks on this as something vain and is the process of cancelling and abolishing it this process does not consist in the believing consciousness having ingenious views about the perverted condition of that reality for it is bare and simple consciousness which reckons esprit and wit as something vain and empty because this still has the real world for its purpose on the contrary in opposition to its placid realm of thought stands concrete actuality as a soulless form of existence which on that account has to be overcome in external fashion this obedience through service and rewards by cancelling sense knowledge and action brings out the consciousness of unity with the self-complete and self-existing being though not in the sense of an actual perceived unity this service is merely the incessant process of producing the sense of unity a process that never completely reaches its goal in the actual present the religious communion no doubt does so for it is universal self-consciousness but for the individual self-consciousness the realm of pure thought necessarily remains something away beyond its sphere of reality or again since this remote region by the emptying the kenosis of the eternal being has entered the sphere of actuality 
its actuality is sensuous non-conceptual but one sensuous actuality is ever indifferent and external to another and what lies beyond has thus only received the further character of remoteness in space and time the essential notion however the concrete actuality of spirit directly present to itself remains for belief an inner principle which is all and affects all but never itself comes to the light in the case of pure insight however the principle the essential notion begrief, is alone the real and this third aspect of belief that of being an object for pure insight is the specific relation in which the notion here appears pure insight itself has similarly to be considered partly by itself an und für sich, partly in relation to the real world so far as the real world is still present in positive shape that is in the form of a sense of vanity and lastly in that relation to belief already mentioned we have already seen what pure insight by itself is belief is unperturbed pure consciousness of spirit as the ultimate reality pure insight is the self-consciousness of spirit as the ultimately real it knows the essentially real therefore not qua essence but qua absolute self its aim thus is to cancel every other kind of independence which falls without self-consciousness whether that be the independence of the actually objective or of the inherently real and to mould it into conceptual form it is not merely the certainty of self-conscious reason assured of being all truth it knows that it is so in the form however in which the notion of pure insight meets us first it is not yet realized as a phase of consciousness it appears in consequence as something contingent as something isolated and particular and its inmost constitutive nature appears as some purpose that it has to carry out and realize it has to begin with the intention of making pure insight universal that is of making everything that is actual into a notion and the notion for every self-consciousness the intention is pure for its content is pure insight and this insight is similarly pure for its content is merely the absolute notion which finds no opposition in an object and is not restricted in itself in the unrestricted notion there are found at once both the aspects that everything objective is to signify the self-existent self-consciousness and that this is to signify something universal that pure insight is to be the property of all self-consciousnesses this second feature of the intention is so far a result of culture in that in culture the distinctions of objective spirit the parts and express determinations of its world have come to naught as well as the distinctions which appeared as originally determinate natures genius talent special capacities in general belong to the world of actuality in so far as this world contains still the aspect of being a herd of self-conscious individuals where in confusion and mutual violence individuals cheat and struggle with one another over the contents of the real world the above distinctions doubtless have no place in it as genuine as species. individuality neither is contented with unreal fact nor has special content in purposes of its own it signifies merely something universally acknowledged and accepted that is cultivated and developed and the question of distinction is reduced to a matter of less or more energy a distinction of quantity that is a non-essential distinction this last difference however has come to nothing by the fact that the distinction in the state where consciousness was completely torn asunder turned round into an absolute qualitative distinction what is there the other for the ego is merely the ego itself in this infinite judgment all the one-sidedness and peculiarity of the original self-existing self is extinguished the self knows itself qua pure self to be its own object and this absolute identity of both sides is the element of pure insight pure insight therefore is the simple ultimate being undifferentiated within itself and at the same time the universal achievement and production and the universal possession of all in this simple spiritual substance self-consciousness gives itself and maintains for itself in every object the sense of this its own particularity or of action just as conversely the individuality of self-consciousness is there identical with itself and universal 
this pure insight is then the spirit that calls to every consciousness be for yourself what you are essentially in yourself rational end of section nine section ten of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b part two a enlightenment the peculiar object on which pure insight directs the active force of the notion is belief this being a form of pure consciousness like itself and yet opposed to it in that element but at the same time pure insight has a relation to the actual world for like belief it is a return from the actual world into pure consciousness we have first of all to see how its activity is constituted as contrasted with the impure intentions and the perverted forms of insight found in the actual world we have touched already on the placid type of conscious life which stands in contrast to this turmoil of alternate self-dissolution and self-evolution it constitutes the aspect of pure insight and intention this unperturbed consciousness however as we saw has no special insight regarding the sphere of culture the latter has itself rather the most painful feeling and the truest insight about itself the feeling that everything made secure crumbles to pieces that every element of its existence is shattered to atoms and every bone broken moreover it consciously expresses this feeling in words pronounces judgment and gives luminous utterance concerning all aspects of its condition pure insight therefore can have here no activity and content of its own and thus can only take up the formal attitude of truly apprehending this ingenious insight proper to the world and the language it adopts since this language is a scattered and broken utterance and the pronouncement of fickle mood of the moment which is again quickly forgotten and is only known to be a whole by a third consciousness this latter can be distinguished as pure insight only if it gathers those several scattered traces into a universal picture and then makes them the insight of all by this simple means pure insight will resolve the confusion of this world for we have found that the fragments and determinate conceptions and individualities are not the essential nature of this actuality but that it finds its substance and support alone in the spirit which exists qua judging and discussing and that the interest of having a content for this ratiocination and parleying to deal with alone preserves the whole and the fragments into which it falls in this language which insight adopts its self-consciousness is still particular a self existing for its own sake but the emptiness of its content is at the same time emptiness of the self knowing that content to be vain and empty now since the consciousness placidly apprehending all these sparkling utterances of vanity makes a collection of the most striking and penetrating phrases the soul that still preserves the whole the vanity of witty criticism goes to ruin with the other form of vanity the previous vanity of existence the collection shows most people a better wit or at least shows every one a more varied wit than their own and shows that better knowledge and judging in general are something universal and are now universally familiar thereby the single and only interest which was still found is done away with and individual light is resolved into universal insight still however knowledge of essential reality stands secure above vain and empty knowledge and pure insight to begin with appears in genuinely active form in so far as it enters into conflict with belief the struggle of enlightenment with superstition the various negative forms which consciousness adopts the attitude of scepticism and that of theoretical and practical idealism are inferior attitudes compared with that of pure insight and the expansion of pure insight enlightenment for pure insight is born of the substance of spirit it knows the pure self of consciousness to be absolute and enters into conflict with the pure consciousness of the absolute being of all reality since belief and insight are the same pure consciousness but in form are opposed the reality in the case of belief being a thought not a notion and hence something absolutely opposed to self-consciousness while the reality in the case of pure insight is the self they are such that inter se the one is the absolute negative of the other 
as appearing the one against the other all content falls to belief for in its unperturbed element of thought each moment obtains definite subsistence pure insight however is in the first instance without any content it involves rather the complete disappearance of content but by its negative attitude towards what it excludes it will make itself real and give itself a content it knows belief to be opposed to insight opposed to reason and truth just as for it belief is in general a tissue of superstitious prejudices and errors so it further sees the consciousness embracing all this content organized into a realm of error in which false insight is the general sphere of consciousness immediate naively unperturbed and inherently unreflective yet all the while this false insight does have within it the moment of self-reflection the moment of self-consciousness separated from its simple naivete and keeps this reflection in the background as an insight remaining by itself and as an evil intention by which that former conscious state is befooled that mental sphere is the victim of the deception of a priesthood which carries out its envious vanity jealous of being alone in possession of insight and carries out its other selfish ends as well at the same time this priesthood conspires with despotism which takes up the attitude of being the synthetic crude begrifflos unity of the real and this ideal kingdom a singularly amorphous and inconsistent type of being and stands above the bad insight of the multitude and the bad intention of the priests and even combines both of these within itself as the result of the stupidity and confusion produced amongst the people by the agency of priestly deception despotism despises both and draws for itself the advantage of undisturbed control and the fulfilment of its desires its humours and its whims yet at the same time it is itself in this same state of murky insight is equally superstition and error enlightenment does not attack these three forms of the enemy without distinction for since its essential nature is pure insight which is per se universal its true relation to the other extreme is that in which it is concerned with the common and identical element in both the aspect of individual existence isolating itself from a universal naive consciousness is the antithesis of it and cannot be directly affected by it the will of a deceiving priesthood and an oppressive despot is therefore not primarily the object on which it directs its activity its object is the insight that is without will and without individualized isolated self-existence the notion begrief of rational self-consciousness which has its existence in the total mental sphere but is not yet there in the fullness of its true meaning begrief since however pure insight rescues this genuinely honest form of insight with its naive simplicity of nature from prejudices and errors it wrests from the hands of bad intention the effective realization of its powers of deception for the exercise of which the incoherent and undeveloped begrifflos consciousness of the general sphere provides the basis and raw material while isolated self-existence finds its substance in the simple consciousness as a whole the relation of pure insight to the naive consciousness of absolute reality has now a double aspect on one side pure insight is inherently one and the same with it on the other side however this naive consciousness lets absolute reality as well as its parts dispose themselves at will in the simple element of its thought and subsist there and lets them hold only as its inherent nature and hence hold good in objective form in this immanent being it disowns however independent existence for its own sake in so far as according to the first aspect this belief is for pure insight inherently and essentially pure self-consciousness and has to become so expressly merely for itself pure insight finds in this constitutive notion of belief the element in which instead of false insight it realizes itself since from this point of view both are essentially the same and the relation of pure insight takes effect through and in the same element the communication between them is direct and immediate and their give and take an unbroken interfusion whatever pins and bolts may be otherwise driven into consciousness it is in itself the simplicity of nature in which everything is resolved forgotten and unconstrained and which therefore is absolutely amenable to the activity of the notion the communication of pure insight is on that account comparable to a silent extension or the expansion say of vapour in the unresisting atmosphere 
it is a penetrating infection which did not previously make itself noticeable as something distinct from and opposed to the indifferent medium into which it insinuates its way and hence cannot be averted only when the infection has become widespread is that consciousness alive to it which unconcernedly yielded to its influence for what this consciousness perceived into itself was doubtless something simple homogeneous and uniform throughout it but was at the same time the simplicity of self-reflected negativity which later on also develops by its nature into something opposed and thereby reminds consciousness of its previous state this simple uniformity is the notion which is simple knowledge that knows both itself and its opposite this opposite being however cancelled as opposite within the self-knowledge of the notion in the condition therefore in which consciousness becomes aware of pure insight this insight is already widespread the struggle with it betrays the fact that the infection has done its work the struggle is too late and every means taken merely makes the disease worse for the disease has seized the very marrow of spiritual life that is consciousness in its ultimate principle the grief or its pure inmost nature itself there is therefore no power left in conscious life to surmount the disease because it affects the very inmost being whatever individual expressions remain are repressed and allowed to subside and the superficial symptoms are smothered this is immensely to its advantage for it does not now squander its power in useless fashion nor does it show itself unworthy of its true nature which is the case when it breaks out into symptoms and particular eruptions antithetic to the content of belief and the connection of its external reality rather being now an invisible and unperceived spirit it insinuates its way through and through the noble parts and soon has got complete hold over all the vitals and members of the unconscious idol and then some fine morning it gives its comrade a shove with the elbow when bash crash and the idol is lying on the floor on some fine morning whose noon is not red with blood if the infection has penetrated to every organ of spiritual life it is then the memory alone that still preserves the dead form of the spirit's previous state as a vanished history vanished men know not how and the new serpent of wisdom raised on high before bending worshippers has in this manner painlessly stripped off merely a shrivelled skin but this silent steady working of the loom of spirit in the inner region of its substance its own action hidden from itself is merely one side of the realizing of pure insight its expansion does not only consist in like going along with like and its realization is not merely an unresisted expansion the action of the principle of negation is at the same time essentially a developed process of self-distinction which being a conscious action must set forth its moments in a definitely manifested expression and must make its appearance in the form of sheer noise and a violent struggle with an opposite as such we have therefore to see how pure insight and pure intention maintains its negative attitude towards that other which it finds standing opposed to it pure insight and intention operating negatively can only be since its very principle is all essentiality and there is nothing outside it the negative of itself as insight therefore it passes into the negative of pure insight it becomes untruth and unreason and as intention it passes into the negative of pure intention becomes a lie and sordid impurity of purpose it involves itself in this contradiction by the fact that it engages in a strife and thinks to do battle with some alien external order it merely imagines this for its nature as absolute negativity lies in having that otherness within its own self the absolute notion is the category it is the principle that knowledge and the object of knowledge are the same in consequence what pure insight expresses as its other what it pronounces to be an error or a lie can be nothing else than its own self it can only condemn what itself is what is not rational has no truth or what is not comprehended through a notion conceptually determined is not when reason thus speaks of some other than itself is it in fact speaks merely of itself it does not therein go beyond itself this struggle with the opposite therefore combines in its meaning the significance of being its own actualization this consists just in the process of unfolding its moments and taking them back into itself 
one part of this process is the making of the distinction in which the insight of reason opposes itself as object to itself so long as it remains in this condition it is at variance with itself qua pure insight it is without any content the process of its realization consists in itself becoming content to itself for no other can be made its content because it is the category become self-conscious but since this insight in the first instance thinks of the content as in its opposite and knows the content merely as a content and does not as yet think of it as its own self pure insight misconceives itself in it the complete attainment of insight therefore has the sense of a process of coming to know that content as its own which was to begin with opposed to itself its result however will be thereby neither the re-establishment of the errors it has fought nor merely its original notion but an insight which knows the absolute negation of itself to be its own proper reality to be its self or an insight which is its self-understanding notion this feature of the struggle of enlightenment with errors that of fighting itself in them and of condemning that in them which it asserts this is something for us who observe the process or is what enlightenment and its struggle are in themselves implicitly the first aspect of this struggle however the contamination and defilement of enlightenment through its pure self-identity accepting the attitude and function of destructive negation this is how belief looks upon it belief finds it simply lying unreason and malicious intent just as enlightenment in the same way regards belief as error and prejudice as regards its content it is in the first instance empty insight whose content appears an external other to it it meets this content consequently in the shape of something not yet its own as something that exists quite independent of it and is found in belief enlightenment then conceives its object in the first instance and generally in such a way as to take it as pure insight and failing to recognize itself there interprets it as error in insight as such consciousness apprehends an object in such a manner that it becomes the inner being of conscious life or becomes an object which consciousness permeates in which consciousness maintains itself keeps within itself and is present to itself and by its thus being the process of that object brings the object into being it is precisely this which enlightenment rightly declares belief to be when enlightenment says that the absolute reality professed by belief is a being that comes from belief's own consciousness is its own thought something produced from and by consciousness enlightenment consequently interprets and declares it to be error to be a made-up invention about the very same thing as enlightenment itself is enlightenment that seeks to teach belief this new wisdom does not in doing so tell it anything new for the object of belief itself is just this too that is a pure essential reality of its own peculiar consciousness so that this consciousness does not put itself down for lost and negated in that object but rather puts trust in it and this just means that it finds itself there as this particular consciousness finds itself therein to be self-consciousness if i put my trust in any one his certitude of himself is for me the certitude of myself i know my self-existence in him i know that he acknowledges it and that it is for him both his purpose and his real nature trust however is belief because its consciousness has a direct relation to its object and thus sees at once that it is one with the object and in the object further since what is object for me is something in which i know myself i am at the same time in that object really in the form of another self-consciousness that is one which has become in that object alienated from its own particular individuation from its natural and contingent existence but which partly continues therein to be self-consciousness and partly is there an essential consciousness just like pure insight in the notion of insight there lies not merely this that consciousness knows itself in the object it looks at and finds itself directly there without first quitting the thought element and then returning into itself the notion implies as well that consciousness is aware of itself as being also the mediating process aware of itself as active as the agency of production through this it gets the thought of this unity of self as self and object this very consciousness is also belief 
obedience and action make a necessary moment through which the certainty of existence and absolute reality comes about this action of belief does not indeed make it appear as if absolute reality is itself produced thereby but the absolute reality for belief is essentially not the abstract reality that lies beyond the believing consciousness it is the spirit of the religious communion it is the unity of that abstract reality and self-consciousness the action of the communion is an essential moment in bringing about that it is this spirit of the communion that spirit is what it is by the productive activity of consciousness or rather it does not exist without being produced by consciousness for essential as this process of production is it is as truly not the only basis of absolute reality it is merely a moment the absolute reality is at the same time self-complete and self-contained an und für sich selbst from the other side the notion of pure insight is seen to be something else than its own object for just this negative character constitutes the object thus from the other side it also expresses the ultimate reality of belief as something foreign to self-consciousness something that is not bone of its bone but is surreptitiously foisted on it like a changeling child but here enlightenment is entirely foolish belief discovers it to be a way of speaking which does not know what it is saying and does not understand the facts of the case when it talks about priestly deception and deluding the people it speaks about this as if by means of some hocus-pocus of conjuring priestcraft there were foisted on consciousness as true reality something that is absolutely foreign and absolutely alien to it and yet says all the while that this is an essential reality for consciousness that consciousness believes in it trusts in it and seeks to make it favorably disposed towards itself that is that consciousness therein sees its pure ultimate being just as much as its own particular and universal individuality and creates by its own action this unity of itself with its essential reality in other words it directly declares that to be the very inmost nature of consciousness which it declares to be something alien to consciousness how then can it possibly speak about deception and delusion by the fact that it directly expresses about belief the very opposite of what it asserts of belief it ipso facto really reveals itself to be the transparent lie how are deception and delusion to take place where consciousness in its very truth has directly and immediately the certitude of itself where it possesses itself in its object since it just as much finds as produces itself there the distinction no longer exists even in words when the general question has been raised whether it is permissible to delude a people the answer as a fact had to be that the question is pointless because it is impossible to deceive a people in this matter brass in place of gold counterfeit instead of genuine coin may doubtless have been disposed of in many an instance many a one has stuck to it that a battle lost was a battle won and lies of all sorts about things of sense and particular events have been credited for a time but in the knowledge of that inmost reality where consciousness finds the direct certainty of its own self the idea of delusion is entirely baseless let us see further how belief finds enlightenment in the case of the different moments of its own conscious experience to which the view just noted referred in the first instance only in a general way these moments are a pure thought or qua object absolute being per se an und für sich then its relation as a form of knowledge to absolute being the ultimate basis of its belief and finally its relation to absolute being in its acts that is its and worship service just as pure insight has misconceived itself in belief as a whole and denied its own nature we shall find it taking up in these moments too an attitude similarly perverted and distorted pure insight assumes towards the absolute reality of the believing mind a negative attitude this being is pure thought and pure thought is established within itself as object or as the true being in the believing consciousness this immanent and essential reality of thought preserves at the same time for the self-existent consciousness the form of objectivity but merely the empty form it exists in the character of something consciously presented to pure insight however since it is pure consciousness in its aspect of self existing for itself this other appears as something negative of self-consciousness 
this might again be taken either as the pure essential reality of thought or even as the being found in sense experience the object of sense certainty but since it is at the same time for the self and this self qua self which has an object is an actual consciousness for insight the peculiar object as such is an ordinary existing thing of sense this its object appears before it when it examines the ideas found in belief it condemns these ideas and in doing so condemns its own proper object it really commits a wrong however against belief in so apprehending the object of belief as if it were its own object according to this account it states regarding belief that its absolute being is a piece of stone a block of wood having eyes and seeing not or again some bread paste which is obtained from grain grown on the field and transformed by men and set aside for that purpose or in whatever other ways belief anthropomorphizes absolute being making it objective and representable enlightenment proclaiming itself as the pure and true here turns to what is held to be eternal life and holy spirit into a concrete passing thing of sense and contaminates it with the inherent nothingness of sense experience with an aspect and point of view which is not to be found at all in the worshipping attitude of belief so that enlightenment simply calumniates it by speaking of such an aspect what belief reverses is for belief assuredly neither stone nor wood nor bread dough nor any other sort of thing of time and sense if enlightenment thinks it worth while to say its object all the same is this as well or even that belief is this in its inherent nature and in truth then belief also knows that something which it is as well but for it this something lies outside its worship on the other hand however belief does not in general look on such things as stones etc as having an inherent and essential being at all the absolute reality of pure thought is for it alone something inherent the second moment is the relation of belief as a form of knowing consciousness to this ultimate reality as pure thinking consciousness belief has this reality immediately within itself but pure consciousness is just as much a immediate relation of conscious certainty to truth a relation constituting the basis of belief for enlightenment this ground comes at the same time to be regarded as a chance knowledge of chance occurrences the ground of knowledge however is the conscious universal and in its ultimate meaning is absolute spirit which in abstract pure consciousness or thought as such is merely absolute being but qua self-consciousness is the knowledge of itself pure insight sets up this conscious universal self-knowing spirit pure and simple likewise as a negative element for self-consciousness doubtless this insight is itself pure immediate thought that is thought mediating itself with itself it is pure knowledge but since it is pure insight or pure knowledge which does not yet know itself that is for which as yet there is no awareness that it is this pure process of mediation this process seems to insight like everything else constituting it to be something external an other when realizing its inherent principle then it develops this moment essential to it but that moment seems to it to belong to belief and to be in its character of an external other a fortuitous knowledge of just such common historical actualities it thus here charges religious belief with basing its certainty on some particular historical evidence which considered as historical evidence would assuredly not even warrant that degree of certainty about the matter which we get regarding any event mentioned in the newspapers it further makes the imputation that the certainty in the case of religious belief rests on the accidental fact of the preservation of all this evidence on the preservation of this evidence partly by means of paper and partly through the skill and honesty in transferring what is written from one paper to another and lastly rests upon the accurate interpretation of the sense of dead words and letters as a matter of fact however it never occurs to belief to make its certainty depend on such evidence and such fortuitous circumstances belief in its conscious assurance occupies a naive unsophisticated attitude towards its absolute object knows it with a purity which never mixes up letters papers or copyists 
with its consciousness of the absolute being and does not make use of things of that sort to effect its union with the absolute on the contrary this consciousness is the self-mediating self-relating ground of its knowledge it is spirit itself which bears witness of itself both in the inner heart of the individual consciousness as well as through the presence everywhere and in all men of belief in it if belief wants to appeal to historical evidences in order to get also that kind of foundation or at least confirmation for its content which enlightenment speaks of and is really serious in thinking and acting as if that were an important matter then it has eo ipso allowed itself to be corrupted and led astray by the insinuations of enlightenment the efforts it makes to secure a basis or support in this way are merely indications that show how it has been affected and contaminated by enlightenment there still remains the third aspect the active relation of consciousness to absolute being its forms of service this action consists in cancelling the particularity of the individual or the natural form of its self-existence whence arises its certainty of being pure self-consciousness of being as the result of its action that is as a self-existing conscious universal one with ultimate reality since in this action purposiveness and end get distinguished and pure insight likewise takes up a negative attitude towards this action and denies itself just as it did in the other moments it must as regards purposiveness present the appearance of being stupid and unintelligent since insight united with intention accordance of end with means appears to it as an other as really the opposite of what insight is as regards the end however it has to make badness enjoyment and possession its purpose and prove itself in consequence to be the impurest kind of intention since pure intention qua external an other is equally impure intention accordingly we find that so far as concerns purposiveness enlightenment thinks it foolish when the believing individual seeks to obtain the higher consciousness where there is no entanglement with natural enjoyment and pleasure by positively denying itself natural enjoyment and pleasure and proving through its acts that it makes no denial of its contempt for them but rather that the contempt is quite genuine in the same way enlightenment finds it foolish for consciousness to absolve itself of its characteristic of being absolutely individual excluding all others and possessing property of its own by itself demitting its own property for thereby it shows in reality that this isolation is not really serious it shows rather that itself is something that can rise above the natural necessity of isolating itself and of denying in this absolute isolation of its own individual existence that the others are one and the same with itself pure insight finds both purposeless as well as wrong it is purposeless to renounce a pleasure and give away a possession in order to show oneself independent of pleasure and possession hence in the opposite case insight will be obliged to proclaim the man a fool who in order to eat employs the expedient of actually eating insight again thinks it wrong to deny oneself a meal and give away butter and eggs not for money nor money for butter and eggs but just to give them away and get no return at all it understands a meal or the possession of things of that sort to be a self's proper object an end of a self and hence in fact understands itself to be a very impure intention which ascribes essential value to enjoyment and possessions of this kind as pure insight it further maintains the necessity of rising above the condition of nature above covetousness and its ways it only finds it foolish and wrong that this supremacy should have to be demonstrated by action in other words this pure intention is in reality a deception which pretends to and demands an inner elevation but declares that it is superfluous foolish and even wrong to be in earnest in the matter to put this uplifting into concrete expression into actual shape and form and demonstrate its truth pure insight thus denies itself both as pure insight for it abrogates directly purposive action and as pure intention for it denies the intention of proving its independence of the ends of a particular existence thus then enlightenment makes belief learn what it means it takes on this appearance of being bad 
because just by the fact of relation to an external other it gives itself a negative reality it presents itself as the opposite of itself pure insight and intention have to adopt this relational attitude however for that is their actualization this realization appeared in the first instance as a negative reality perhaps its positive reality is better constituted let us see how this stands when all prejudice and superstition have been banished the question arises what next what is the truth enlightenment has diffused in their stead it has already given expression to this positive content in its process of exterminating error for that alienation of itself is equally its positive reality in dealing with what for belief is absolute spirit it interprets whatever sort of determination it discovers there as being wood stone etc as particular concrete things of sense since in this way it conceives in general every characteristic that is every content and filling to be a finite fact to be a human entity and a mental presentation absolute being on its own view turns out to be a mere vacuum to which can be attributed no characteristics no predicates at all in fact to marry such a vacuity with universal predicates would be essentially reprehensible and it is just through such a union that the monstrosities of superstition have been produced reason pure insight is doubtless not empty itself since the negative of itself is present consciously to it and is its content it is on the contrary rich in substance but only in particularity and restrictions the enlightened function of reason of pure insight consists in allowing nothing of that sort to appertain to absolute reality nor attributing anything of that kind to it this function well knows how to put itself and the wealth of finitude in their place and deal with the absolute in a worthy manner in contrast with this colourless empty reality there stands as a second aspect of the positive truth of enlightenment the particularity in general of conscious life and of all that is a particularity excluded from an absolute being and standing by itself as something entirely self-contained consciousness which in its very earliest expression is sense certainty and mere opining here comes back after the whole course of its experience to the same point and is once again a knowledge of what is pure negative of itself a knowledge of sense things that is of existent entities which stand in indifference over against its own self-existence but here it is not an immediate naive consciousness it has become to itself immediate while at first the prey to every sort of entanglement into which it is plunged by its gradually unfolding and now led back to its first form by pure insight it has arrived at this first state as the result and outcome of the process this sense certainty resting as it does on an insight into the nothingness of all other forms of consciousness and hence the nothingness of whatever is beyond sense experience this sense certainty is no longer a mere opining it is rather absolute truth this nothingness of everything that transcends sense is doubtless merely a negative proof of this truth but no other is admissible or possible for the positive truth of sense experience in itself is just the unmediated self-existence of the notion itself qua object and an object in the form of otherness the positive truth is that it is absolutely certain to every consciousness that it is and that there are other real things outside it and that in this naive existence it as well as these things too are in and for themselves or absolute lastly the third moment of the truth of enlightenment is the relation of the particular entities to absolute being is the relation of the first two moments to one another insight qua pure insight of what is identical or unrestricted also transcends the unlike or diverse that is transcends finite reality or transcends itself qua mere otherness the beyond of this otherness it takes to be the void to which it thus relates the facts of sense in determining this relation both the terms do not enter the relation as its content for the one is the void and thus a content is only to be had through the other through sense reality the form the relation assumes however to the determination of which the aspect of immanent and ultimate being an sich, contributes can be shaped just as we please for the form is something inherently and essentially negative 
and therefore something self-opposed being as well as nothing inherent and ultimate an sich, as well as the opposite or what is the same thing the relation of actuality to an inherent essential being qua something beyond is as much a negating as a positing of that actuality finite actualities can therefore properly speaking be taken just in the way people have need of them sense facts are thus related now positively to the absolute qua something ultimate an sich, and sense reality is itself ultimate per se the absolute makes them fosters and cherishes them then again they are related to it as an opposite that is to their own non-being in this case they are not something ultimate they have being only for an other whereas in the preceding mode of consciousness the conceptions involved in the opposition took shape as good and bad in the case of pure insight they pass into the more abstract form of what is per se an sich, and what is for an other being both ways of dealing with the positive as well as the negative relation of finitude to what is ultimate an sich, are however equally necessary as a matter of fact and everything is thus as much something per se an sich, as it is something for another in other words everything is useful everything is now at the mercy of other things lets itself now be used by others and exists for them and then again it so to say gets up on its hind legs fights shy of the other exists for itself on its own account and on its side uses the other too from this as a result man being the thing conscious of this relation derives his true nature and place as he is immediately man is good qua natural consciousness per se absolute qua universal and all else exists for him and further since the moments have significance of universality for him qua self-conscious animal everything exists to pleasure and delight him and as he first comes from the hand of god he walks the earth as in a garden planted for him he is bound also to pluck the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil he claims to have a use for it which distinguishes him from every other being for as it happens his inherently good nature is so constituted that the superfluity of delight does it harm or rather his particularity contains as a factor in its constitution a principle that goes beyond it his particularity can overreach itself and destroy itself to prevent this he finds reason a useful means for duly restraining this self-transcendence or rather for preserving himself when he does go beyond determinate limits for such is the force of consciousness the enjoyment of this conscious and essentially universal being must in manifold variety and duration be itself universal and not something determinate the principle of measure or proportion has therefore the determinate function of preventing pleasure in its variety and duration from being quite broken off that is the measure is determined with respect to immoderation as everything is useful for man man is likewise useful too and his characteristic determination consists in making himself a member of the human herd of use for the common good and serviceable to all the extent to which he looks after his own interest is the measure with which he must also serve the purpose of others and so far as he serves their turn he is taking care of himself the one hand washes the other but wherever he finds himself there he is in his right he makes use of others and is himself made use of different things are serviceable to one another in different ways all things however have this reciprocity of utility by their very nature by being related to the absolute in the twofold manner the one positive whereby they have a being all their own the other negative and thereby exist for others the relation of absolute reality or religion is therefore of all forms of profitableness the most supremely profitable for it is profiting pure and simple it is that by which all things stand by which they have a being all their own and that by which all things fall have an existence for something else belief of course finds this positive outcome of enlightenment as much an abomination as its negative attitude towards belief this enlightened insight into absolute reality that sees nothing in it but just absolute reality the être suprême the great void this intention to find that everything in its immediate existence is inherently real an sich, or good 
and finally to find the relation of the particular conscious entity to the absolute being religion exhaustively summed up in the conception of profitableness all this is for belief utterly and simply revolting this special and peculiar wisdom of enlightenment necessarily seems at the same time to the believing mind to be sheer insipidity and the confession of insipidity because it consists in knowing nothing of absolute being or what amounts to the same thing in knowing this entirely accurate platitude regarding it that it is merely absolute being and again in knowing nothing but finitude taking this moreover to be the truth and thinking this knowledge about finitude qua truth to be the highest knowledge attainable belief has a divine right as against enlightenment the right of absolute self-identity or of pure thought and it finds itself utterly wronged by enlightenment for enlightenment distorts all its moments and makes them something quite different from what they are in it enlightenment on the other hand has merely a human right as against belief and can only put in a human claim for its own truth for the wrong it commits is the right of disunion of discordance and consists in perverting and altering a right that belongs to the nature of self-consciousness in opposition to the simple ultimate essence or thought but since the right of enlightenment is the right of self-consciousness it will not merely retain its own right too in such a way that two equally valid rights of spirit would be left standing in opposition to one another without either satisfying the claims of the other it will maintain the absolute right because self-consciousness is the negative function of the notion begriff a function which does not merely operate on its own account but also gets control over its opposite and because belief is a mode of consciousness it will not be able to balk enlightenment of that right for enlightenment does not operate against the believing mind with special principles of its own but with those which belief itself implies and contains enlightenment merely brings together and presents to belief its own thoughts the thoughts that lie scattered and apart within belief all unknown to it enlightenment merely reminds belief when one of its own forms is present of others it also has but which it is always forgetting when the one is there enlightenment shows itself to belief to be pure insight by the fact that it in a given determinate moment sees the whole brings forward the opposite element standing in direct relation to that moment and converting the one into the other brings out the principle operating negatively on both thoughts the notion it appears therefore to belief to be distortion and lies because it shows up the other side in the moments of belief enlightenment seems in consequence directly to make something else out of them than they are in their own particularity but this other is equally essential and in reality is to be found in the believing mind itself only the latter does not think about it but keeps it somewhere else hence neither is the result foreign to belief nor can belief reject its truth enlightenment itself however which reminds belief of the opposite of its various separate moments is just as little enlightened regarding its own nature it takes up a purely negative attitude to belief so far as it excludes its own content from its own pure activity and takes that content to be negative of itself consequently neither in this negative in the content of belief does it recognize itself nor for this reason does it bring together the two thoughts the one which it contributes and the one against which it brings the first since it does not know that what it condemns in the case of belief is directly its very own thought it has its own being in the opposition of both moments only one of which that is in every case the one opposed to belief it acknowledges but cuts off the other from the first just as belief does enlightenment consequently does not bring out the unity of both as their unity that is the notion but the notion arises before it and comes to light of its own accord in other words enlightenment finds the notion merely as something lying ready at hand for in itself the process of realizing pure insight is just this that insight whose essential nature is the notion comes before itself to begin with in the shape of an absolute other and repudiates itself for the opposite of the notion is an absolute opposite and then out of this otherness comes to itself or comes to its notion enlightenment however is merely this process it is the activity of the notion in still unconscious form an activity which no doubt comes to itself qua object 
but takes this object for an external other and does not even know the nature of the notion that is does not know that it is the undifferentiated element which absolutely divides itself as against belief then insight is the power of the notion in so far as this is the active process of relating the moments lying apart from one another in belief a way of relating them in which the contradiction in them comes to light herein lies the absolute right of the power which insight exercises over belief but the actuality which it gives this power lies just in the fact that the believing state of consciousness is itself the notion and thus itself recognizes and accepts the opposite which insight produces and presents before it insight therefore has and retains right against belief because it makes valid in belief what is necessary to believe itself and what belief contains within it at first enlightenment asserts the moments of the notion to be an act of consciousness it maintains in the face of belief that the absolute reality belief accepts is a reality of the believer's consciousness qua a self or that this absolute reality is produced through consciousness to the believing mind its absolute being is just as it is in itself for the believer at the same time not as a foreign thing standing there no one knows how or whence it came there the trust and confidence of belief consists just in finding itself in absolute reality as a particular personal consciousness and its obedience and service consist in acting so as to bring out that reality as its own absolute enlightenment strictly speaking only reminds belief of this if belief goes beyond the action of consciousness and gives expression to the ultimate nature an sich, of absolute being in abstracto but while enlightenment no doubt puts alongside the one-sidedness of belief the opposite moment that is the action of belief in contrast to being and being is all belief thinks about here and yet does not itself in doing so bring those opposite thoughts together enlightenment isolates the pure moment of action and declares that what belief takes to be per se ultimate an sich, is merely a product of consciousness the isolated separate act opposed to this ultimate being an sich, is however a contingent action and qua representative activity is a creating of fictions presented figurative ideas that have no being in themselves and this is how enlightenment regards the content of belief conversely however pure insight equally says the very opposite since insight lays stress on the moment of otherness which the notion contains it declares the essential reality for belief to be one which is not in any way due to consciousness is a way beyond consciousness foreign to it and unknown to belief too that reality has the same character on one side belief trusts in it and gets in doing so the assurance of its own self on the other side it is unsearchable in all its ways and unattainable in its being further enlightenment maintains against the believing mind a right which the latter concedes when enlightenment treats the object of the believer's veneration as stone and wood or in short some finite anthropomorphic feature for since this consciousness is divided within itself in having a beyond remote from actuality and an immediate present embodiment in that remote beyond there is also found in it as a matter of fact the view that sense things have a value and significance in and for themselves an und für sich but belief does not bring together these two ideas of what is in and for itself that is that at one time what is in and for itself is for belief pure essential reality and that another time is an ordinary thing of sense even its own pure consciousness is affected by this last view for the distinctions of its supersensuous world because dispensing with the notion are a series of independent shapes and forms and their activity is a happening that is they exist merely in idea merely as presentations and have the characteristic of sense existence enlightenment on its side isolates actuality in the same way treating it as a reality abandoned by spirit isolates specific determinateness as some fixed immovable finite element as if it were not a moment in the spiritual process of the real itself where neither nothing nor something with a being all its own but something evanescent and transitory it is clear that the same is the case with regard to the ground of knowledge the believing mind recognizes itself to be an accidental knowledge 
for in belief the mind adopts an attitude towards contingencies and absolute reality itself comes before belief in the form of a presented idea of ordinary actual fact consequently belief is also a kind of certainty which does not carry the truth within it and it confesses itself to be an unsubstantial consciousness of this kind far short of being well assured of itself and authentically secure this moment however belief forgets in its immediate spiritual knowledge of absolute reality enlightenment however which reminds belief of all this thinks again merely of the contingency of the knowledge and forgets the other thinks only of the mediating process which takes effect through an alien third term and does not think on that process wherein the immediate self is itself the third term through which it mediates itself with the other that is with itself finally on the view enlightenment takes of the action of belief the rejection of enjoyment and possessions is looked upon as wrong and purposeless as to the wrong thus done enlightenment preserves the harmony of the believing attitude in this that belief acknowledges the actual reality of possessing property keeping hold of it and enjoying it in insisting on its property it behaves with all the more stubborn independence and exclusiveness and in its enjoyment with all the more frank self-abandonment since its religious act of giving up pleasure and property takes effect beyond the region of this actuality and purchases for it freedom to do as it likes so far as that other sphere is concerned this service that consists in sacrificing natural impulses and enjoyments in point of fact has no truth owing to this opposition the retention and the sacrifice subsist together side by side the sacrifice is merely a sign which performs real sacrifice only as regards a small part and hence in point of fact only representatively suggests sacrifice as for purposiveness enlightenment finds it pointless and stupid to throw away a possession in order to feel and to prove oneself to be free from all possession to renounce an enjoyment in order to think and demonstrate that one is rid of all enjoyment the believing mind itself takes the absolute act for a universal one not only does the action of its absolute reality as its object appear something universal but the individual consciousness too has to prove itself detached entirely and altogether from its sensuous nature but throwing away a particular possession giving up and disclaiming a particular enjoyment is not acting universally in this way and since in the action it is essentially the purpose which is a universal and the performance which is a particular process that had to stand in order incompatibility before consciousness that action shows itself to be of a kind in which consciousness has no share and consequently this way of acting is seen to be too naive to be an action at all it is too naive to fast in order to prove oneself quite indifferent to the pleasures of the table too naive to rid oneself like origin of other bodily pleasure in order to show that pleasure is finished and done with the act itself proves to be an external and a particular function but desire is deeply rooted within the inner life and is a universal element its pleasure neither disappears with the instrument for getting pleasure nor by abstention from particular pleasures but enlightenment on its side here isolates the unrealized inwardness as against the concrete actuality just as in the case of the devotion and direct intuition of belief enlightenment holds fast to the externality of things of sense as against the inward attitude of belief enlightenment finds the main point in the intention in the thought and thereby finds no need for actually bringing about the liberation from natural ends on the contrary this inner sphere is itself the formal element that has its concrete fulfilment in natural impulses which are justified simply by the fact that they fall within that they belong to universal being to nature enlightenment then holds irresistible sway over belief by the fact that the latter finds in its own constitution the very moments to which enlightenment gives significance and validity looking more closely at the action exerted by this force its operation on belief seems to rend asunder the unity and happy harmony of trustfulness and immediate confidence to pollute its spiritual life with lower thoughts drawn from the sphere of sense to destroy the feeling of calm security in its attitude of submission by introducing the vanity of understanding of self-will and self-fulfilment but in point of fact 
enlightenment rarely brings to pass the abolition of that state of unthinking or rather uncomprehended begrifflos cleavage which finds a place in the nature of belief the believing mood weighs and measures by a twofold standard it has two sorts of eyes and ears uses two voices to express its meaning it duplicates all ideas without comparing and squaring the sense and meaning in the two forms used or we may say belief lives its life amidst two sorts of perceptions the one the perceptions of thought which is asleep purely uncritical and uncomprehending the other those of waking consciousness living solely and simply in a world of sense and in each of them it manages to carry on a household all its own enlightenment illuminates that world of heaven with ideas drawn from the world of sense pointing out there this element of finitude which belief cannot deny or repudiate because it is self-consciousness and in being so is the unity to which both kinds of ideas belong and in which they do not fall apart from one another for they belong to the same indivisible simple self into which belief has passed and which constitutes its life belief has by this means lost the content which furnished its filling and collapses into an inarticulate state where the spirit works and weaves within itself belief is banished from its own kingdom this kingdom is sacked and plundered since every distinction and expansion of it has rent the waking consciousness in its innermost nature and claimed every one of its parts for earth and returned them to the earth that owns them yet belief is not on that account satisfied for this illumination has everywhere brought to light only what is individual with the result that only insubstantial realities and finitude forsaken of spirit make any appeal to spirit since belief is without content and cannot continue in this barren condition or since in getting beyond finitude which is the sole content it finds merely the empty void it is a sheer longing its truth is an empty beyond for which there is no longer any appropriate content to be found for everything is appropriated and connected in other ways belief in this manner has in fact become the same as enlightenment the conscious attitude of relating a finite that inherently exists to an unknown and unknowable absolute without predicates the difference is merely that the one is enlightenment satisfied while belief is enlightenment unsatisfied it will yet be seen whether enlightenment can continue in its state of satisfaction that longing of the troubled beshadowed spirit mourning over the loss of its spiritual world lies in the background enlightenment has on it this stain of unsatisfied longing in its empty absolute being we find this in the form of the pure object in passing beyond its individual nature to an unfulfilled beyond the flick appears as an act and a process in the selflessness of what is useful it is seen in the form of an object fulfilled enlightenment will remove this stain by considering more closely the positive result which constitutes the truth in its case we shall find that the stain is implicitly removed already end of section ten section eleven of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b part two b the true result of enlightenment the spirit that sullenly works and weaves without further distinctions within itself has thus passed into itself away beyond consciousness which again has arrived at clearness as to itself the first moment of this clearness of mind is determined in regard to its necessity and constitution by the fact that pure insight or insight that is implicitly and per se notion actualizes itself it does so when it gives otherness or determinateness a place in its own nature in this manner it is negative pure insight that is the negation of the notion this negation is equally pure and herewith has arisen the pure and simple thing the absolute being that has no further determination of any sort if we define this more precisely insight in the sense of absolute notion is a distinguishing of distinctions that are not so any longer 
of abstractions or pure notions that no longer support themselves but find a fixed hold and a distinction only by means of the whole life of the process this distinguishing of what is not distinguished consists just in the fact that the absolute notion makes itself its object and as against that process asserts itself to be the essence the essence hereby dispenses with the aspect wherein abstractions or distinctions are kept apart and hence becomes pure thought in the sense of a pure thing this now is just a dull silent unconscious working and weaving of the spirit at the loom of its own being to which belief as we saw sank back when it lost all distinction in its content and this is at the same time that movement of pure self-consciousness in regard to which the essence is intended to be the absolutely external beyond for because this pure self-consciousness is a movement working with pure notions with distinctions that are no distinctions pure self-consciousness collapses in fact into that unconscious working and weaving of spirit that is into pure feeling or pure thinghood the self-alienated notion for the notion still stands here at the level of such alienation does not however know this identical nature constituting both sides the movement of self-consciousness and its absolute reality does not know the identity of their nature which in point of fact gives them their very substance and subsistence since the notion is not aware of this insight absolute reality has significance and value merely in the form of an objective beyond while the consciousness making these distinctions and in this way keeping the ultimate reality outside itself is treated as a finite consciousness regarding that absolute being enlightenment itself falls out with itself in the same way as it did formerly with belief and is divided between the views of two parties one party proves itself to be victorious by the fact that it breaks up into two parties for in that fact it shows it possesses within it the principle it combats and consequently shows it has abolished the one-sidedness with which it formerly made its appearance the interest which was divided between it and the other now falls entirely within it and forgets the other because that interest finds lying in it alone the opposition on which attention is directed at the same time however the opposition has been lifted into the higher victorious element where it is cleared up and set forth so that the schism that arises in one party and seems a misfortune demonstrates rather its good fortune the pure essence itself has in it no distinction consequently distinction is reached by two such pure essences being put forward for consciousness to be aware of or by a twofold consciousness of the pure reality the pure absolute essence is only in pure thought or rather it is pure thought itself and thus absolutely beyond the finite beyond self-consciousness and is merely the ultimate essence in a negative sense but in this way it is just being the negative of self-consciousness being negative of self-consciousness it is also related to self-consciousness it is external being which placed in relation to self-consciousness within which distinctions and determinations fall preserves within it the distinctions of being tasted seen and so on and the relationship is that of sense experience and perception taking the point of departure from this sense existence into which that negative beyond necessarily passes but abstracting from those various ways in which consciousness is related to sense existence there is left pure matter as that in which consciousness weaves and moves inarticulately within itself in dealing with this the essential point to note is that pure matter is merely what remains over when we abstract from seeing feeling tasting etc that is it is not what is seen tasted felt and so on it is not matter that is seen felt or tasted but colour a stone salt and so on matter is really a pure abstraction and being so we have here the pure essential nature of thought or pure thought itself as the absolute without predicates undetermined having no distinctions within it the one kind of enlightenment calls absolute being that predicateless absolute which exists in thought beyond the actual consciousness from which this enlightenment started the other calls it matter if they were distinguished as nature and spirit or god the unconscious inner working and weaving would have nothing of the wealth of developed life required in order to be nature while spirit or god would have no self-distinguishing consciousness both as we saw are entirely the same notion the distinction lies not in the objective fact 
but purely in the diversity of starting point adopted by the two thought constructions and in the fact that each keeps to a special point of view in the thought process if they rose above that their thoughts would coincide and they would find what to the one is as it holds a horror and to the other a folly is one and the same thing for to the one absolute being in its pure thought or directly for pure consciousness is outside finite consciousness is the negative beyond of finite mind if it would reflect that in part that simple immediacy of thought is nothing else than pure being that in part again what is negative for consciousness is at the same time related to consciousness that in the negative judgment the copula is also connects and holds together the two separated factors it would come to see that this beyond which the nature of an external existence implies stands in a relation to consciousness and that in so doing this means the same as what is called pure matter the missing moment of the present would then be secured the other enlightenment starts from sense existence it then abstracts from the sensuous relation of tasting seeing etc and turns sense existence into purely inherent being an sich absolute matter something neither felt nor heard this being has in this way become the inner reality of pure consciousness the ultimately simple without predicates it is the pure notion qua notion whose being is in itself or it is pure thought within itself this insight in its conscious activity does not go through the process of passing from being which is purely being to an opposite in thought which is the same as mere being or does not go from the pure positive to the opposite pure negative since the positive is really pure simply and solely through negation while the negative qua pure is self-identical and one within itself and precisely on that account positive or again these two have not come to the notion found in descartes's metaphysics that in themselves being and thought are the same they have not arrived at the thought that being pure being is not a concrete actual reality but pure abstraction and conversely that pure thought self-identity or inner essence is partly the negative of self-consciousness and consequently is being and partly qua immediate simple entity is likewise nothing else than being thought is thinghood or thinghood is thought the real essence is here divided asunder in such a way that to begin with it appertains to two specifically distinct modes of thinking in part the real must hold distinction in itself in part just by so doing both ways of considering it merge into one for then the abstract moments of pure being and the negative by which their distinction is expressed are united in the object with which these modes of treatment deal the universal common to both is the abstraction of pure self-thinking of pure quivering within the self this simple notion of rotating on its own axis is bound to resolve itself into separate moments because it is itself only motion by distinguishing its own moments this distinguishing of the moments leaves the unmoved unity behind as the empty shell of pure being that is no longer actual thought has no more life within it for qua distinction this process is all the content the process which thus puts itself outside that unity thereby constitutes however the shifting change a change that does not return into itself of the moments of being in itself of being for another and of being for self actual reality in the way this is object for the concrete consciousness of pure insight constitutes utility bad as utility may look to belief or sentimentality or even to the abstraction that calls itself speculation and takes to deal with the ultimate the inherent nature yet it is that in which pure insight finds its realization and itself is the object for insight an object which insight now no longer repudiates and which too it does not put down as the void or the pure beyond for pure insight as we saw is the living notion itself the self-same pure personality distinguishing itself within itself in such a way that each of the distinguished elements is itself pure notion that is is eo ipso not distinct it is simple undifferentiated pure self-consciousness which is for itself as well as in itself within an immediate unity its inherent being its being in itself is therefore not fixed and permanent but at once ceases in its distinction to be something distinctive 
a being of that kind however which is immediately without support and cannot stand of itself has no being in itself no inherent existence it is essentially for something else which is the power that consumes and absorbs it but the second moment opposed to that first one disappears immediately too like the first or rather qua being merely for some other it is the very process of disappearing and is definitely affirmed as being that has turned back into itself as being for itself this simple being for self however qua self-identity is rather an objective being or is thereby for an other this nature of pure insight in thus unfolding and making explicit its moments in other words insight qua object finds expression in the useful the profitable what is useful is a thing something that subsists in itself this being in itself is at the same time only a pure moment it is in consequence absolutely for something else but is equally for an other merely as it is in itself these opposite moments return into the indivisible unity of being for self while however the useful doubtless expresses the notion of pure insight it is all the same not insight as such but insight as conscious presentation or as object for insight it is merely the restless shifting change of those moments of which one is indeed being returned into itself but merely as being for itself that is as abstract moment appearing on one side over against the others the useful itself does not consist in the negative fact of having these moments in their opposition at the same time undivided in one and the same respect of having them a form of thought per se in the way they are qua pure insight the moment of being for self is doubtless a phase of usefulness but not in the sense that it swamps the other moments being per se and being for another if so it would be the whole self in dealing with the useful pure insight thus takes as object its own peculiar notion in the pure moments constituting its nature it is the consciousness of this metaphysical principle but not yet its conceptual comprehension it has not yet itself got to the unity of being and notion because the useful still appears before insight in the form of an object insight has a world not indeed any longer a world all by itself and self-contained but still a world all the same which it distinguishes from itself only since the opposites have come forth on the summit of the notion the next step will be for them to collide with one another and for enlightenment to experience the fruits of their deeds when we look at the object reached in relation to this entire sphere of spiritual life we found the actual world of culture summed up in the vanity of self-consciousness in independent self-existence whose content is drawn from the confusion characteristic of culture and which is still the individual notion not yet the self-conscious feel sich universal notion returned into itself however that individual notion is pure insight pure consciousness qua pure self or negativity just as belief too is pure consciousness qua pure thought or positivity belief finds in that self the moment that makes it complete but perishing through being thus completed it is in pure insight that we now see both moments as absolute being which is purely thought constituted or is a negative entity and as matter which is the positive entity this completion still lacks that actual reality of self-consciousness which belongs to the vain and empty type of consciousness the world out of which thought raised itself up to itself what is thus wanting is reached in the aspect of utility so far as pure insight secures positive objectivity there pure insight is thereby a concrete actual consciousness satisfied within itself this objectivity now constitutes its world and is become the final and true outcome of the entire previous world ideal as well as real the first world of spirit is the expansive realm of spirit's self-dispersed existence and of certainty of self in separate individual shapes and forms just as nature disperses its life in an endless multiplicity of forms and shapes without the generic principle of all the forms being present therein the second world contains the generic principle and is the realm of the ultimate inherent nature ansichseins or the essential truth over against that individual certainty the third world however that of the profitable or the useful is the truth which is certainty of self as well 
the realm of the truth of belief lacks the principle of concrete actuality or of certainty of self in the sense of this individual self but again concrete actuality or certainty of self qua this individual lacks the ultimate inherent nature an sich. in the object of pure insight both worlds are united the useful is the object so far as self-consciousness sees through it and individual certainty of self finds its enjoyment its self-existence in it self-consciousness sees into it in this manner and this insight contains the true essence of the object which consists in being something permeable to sight something seen through in other words in being for another this insight is thus itself true knowledge and self-consciousness directly finds in this attitude universal certainty of itself as well has its pure consciousness in this attitude in which truth as well as immediateness and actuality are united both worlds are reconciled and heaven is transplanted to the earth below end of section eleven Section 12 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6b, Part 3. Absolute Freedom and Terror. Consciousness has found its notion in the principle of utility. But that notion is partly an object still, partly, for that very reason, still a purpose of which consciousness does not yet find itself to be immediately possessed utility or profitableness is still a predicate of the object not a subject not its immediate and sole actuality it is the same thing that appeared before when we found that self-existence being for self had not yet shown itself to be the substance of the remaining moments a process by which the useful would be primarily nothing else than the self of consciousness and this latter thereby in its possession this resumption of the form of objectivity which characterizes the useful has however already taken effect implicitly and as the outcome of this immanent internal revolution there comes to light the actual revolution of concrete actuality the new mode of conscious life absolute freedom this is so because in point of fact there is here no more than an empty semblance of objectivity separating self-consciousness from actual possession for in part all the worth and permanence of the various specific members of the organization of the world of actuality and belief have as a whole returned into this simple determination which is their ground and their indwelling spirit in part however this determinate element has nothing peculiarly its own left for itself it is instead pure metaphysic pure notion or knowledge of self-consciousness that is to say from the inherent and specific nature of the useful qua object consciousness learns that its inherent nature its being in itself is essentially a being for another mere being per se since it is selfless is ultimately and in truth a passive entity or something that is for another self the object, however, is present to consciousness in this abstract form of purely immanent being, of pure being in itself. For consciousness is the activity of pure insight, the separate moments of which take the pure form of notions. Self-existence, being for self, however, into which being for another returns, in other words the self, is not a self of what is called object, a self all its own and different from the ego for consciousness qua pure insight is not an individual self over against which the object in the sense of having a self all its own could stand but the pure notion the gazing of the self into self the literal and absolute seeing itself doubled the certainty of itself is the universal subject and its notion knowing itself is the essential being of all reality if the useful was merely the shifting change of the moments without returning into its own proper unity and was hence still an object for knowledge to deal with then it ceases to be this now for knowing is itself the process and movement of those abstract moments it is the universal self the self of itself as well as of the object and being universal is the unity of this process a unity that returns into itself this brings on the seen spirit in the form of absolute freedom 
it is the mode of self-consciousness which clearly comprehends that in its certainty of self lies the essence of all the component spiritual parts of the concrete sensible as well as of the supersensible world or conversely that essential being and concrete actuality consist in the knowledge consciousness has of itself it is conscious of its pure personality and with that of all spiritual reality and all reality is solely spirituality the world is for it absolutely its own will and this will is universal will and further this will is not the empty thought of will which is constituted by giving a silent assent or an assent through a representative a mere symbol of willing it is a concretely embodied universal will the will of all individuals as such for will is in itself the consciousness of personality of every single one and it has to be as this true concrete actual will as self-conscious essential being of each and every personality so that each single and undivided does everything and what appears as done by the whole is at once and consciously the deed of every single individual this undivided substance of absolute freedom puts itself on the throne of the world without any power being able to offer effectual resistance for since in very truth consciousness is alone the element which furnishes spiritual beings or powers with their substance their entire system which is organized and maintained through division into separate spheres and distinct wholes has collapsed into a single whole when once the individual consciousness conceives the object as having no other nature than that of self-consciousness itself or conceives it to be absolutely the notion what made the notion an existential object was the distinguishing it into separate and separately subsisting areas or groups when however the object becomes a notion there is nothing fixedly subsisting left in it negativity permeates and pervades all its moments it exists in such a way that each individual consciousness rises out of the sphere assigned to it finds no longer its inmost nature and function in this isolated area but grasps itself as the notion of will grasps all the various groupings as the essential expression of this will and is in consequence only able to realize itself in a work which is a work of the whole in this absolute freedom all social ranks or classes which are the component spiritual factors into which the whole is differentiated are effaced and annulled the individual consciousness that belonged to any such group and exercised its will and found its fulfilment there has removed the barriers confining it its purpose is the universal purpose its language universal law its work universal achievement the object and the element distinguished have here lost the meaning of utility of profitableness which was a predicate of all real being consciousness does not commence its process with the object as a sort of alien element after dealing with which it then and only then returns into itself the object it is aware of is consciousness itself the opposition thus consists solely in the distinction of individual and universal consciousness but the individual itself is directly on its own view that which had merely the semblance of opposition it is universal consciousness and will the ulterior beyond that lies remote from this its actual reality hovers over the corpse of the vanished and departed independence of what is real or believed to be and hovers there merely as an exhalation of stale gas of the empty être suprême by doing away with the various distinct spiritual groups and the restricted and confined life of individuals as well as both its worlds there thus remains merely the process of the universal self-consciousness within itself as an interaction of its content a reciprocal interaction between its universal form and personal consciousness the universal will goes into itself is subjectivized and becomes individual will to which the universal law and universal work stand opposed but this individual consciousness is equally and immediately conscious of itself as universal will it is fully aware that its own objective content is a law given by that will a work performed by that will in exercising and carrying out its activity in creating objectivity it is thus doing nothing individual but executing laws and functions of the state this process is consequently the interaction of consciousness with itself in which it lets nothing break away and assume the shape of a detached object standing over against it it follows from this that it cannot arrive at a positive accomplishment of anything either in the way of universal operations in language or in actual reality either in the shape of laws and universal regulations of conscious freedom or of deeds and works of active freedom 
the accomplished result of which this freedom that gives itself consciousness might manage to arrive would consist in the fact that such freedom qua universal substance made itself into an object and an abiding existence this objective otherness would there be the differentiation which enabled it to divide itself into stable spiritual groups and into separate fragments or members these wholes or spheres would partly be the thought-constituted factors of a power that is differentiated into legislative judicial and executive but partly they would be the substantial elements we found in the real world of spiritual culture and since the content of universal action would be more closely taken note of they would be the particular areas or spheres of labour which are further distinguished as specific social ranks or classes universal freedom which would have differentiated itself in this manner into its various parts and by the very fact of doing so would have made itself an existing substance would thereby be free from particular individualities and could apportion the plurality of individuals to its several parts the activity and being of personality would however find itself by this process confined to a branch of the whole to one kind of action and existence when placed in the element of existence personality would bear the meaning of a determinate personality it would cease to be in reality universal self-consciousness neither by the idea of submission to self-imposed laws addressed in part to universal self-consciousness nor by its being represented when legislation and universal action take place the self-consciousness here let itself be mistaken about the actual truth that itself lays down the law and itself accomplishes a universal and not a particular task for in the case where the self is merely represented and ideally presented volkestelt there it is not actual where it is by proxy it is not just as the individual self-consciousness does not find itself in this universal work of absolute freedom qua existing substance as little does it find itself in the deeds proper and specific individual acts of will performed by this substance for the universal to pass into a deed it must gather itself into the single unity of individuality and put an individual consciousness in the forefront for universal will is an actual concrete will only in a self that is single and one thereby however all other individuals are excluded from the entirety of this deed and have only a restricted chair in it so that the deed would not be a deed of real universal self-consciousness universal freedom can thus produce neither a positive achievement nor a deed there is left for it only negative action it is merely the rage and fury of disappearance and destruction but the highest reality of all and the reality most of all opposed to absolute freedom or rather the sole object it is yet to become aware of is the freedom and singleness of actual self-consciousness itself for that universality which does not let itself attain the reality of organic differentiation and whose purpose it is to maintain itself in unbroken continuity distinguishes itself within itself all the while because it is process or consciousness in general moreover on account of its own peculiar abstraction it divides itself into extremes equally abstract into the cold unbending bare universality and the hard discrete absolute rigidity and stubborn atomic singleness of actual self-consciousness now that it is done with exterminating and destroying express organization and subsists on its own behalf this is its sole object an object that has no other content left no other possession existence and external extension but is merely this knowledge of itself as absolutely pure and detached individual self the point at which the object can be laid hold of and understood is solely its abstract existence in general the relation then of these two since they exist for themselves indivisibly and absolutely and thus cannot arrange for a common part to act as a means for connecting them is pure negation entirely devoid of mediation the negation moreover of the individual as a factor existing within the universal the sole and only work indeed accomplished by universal freedom is therefore death a death that achieves nothing embraces nothing within its grasp for what is negated is the unachieved unfulfilled punctual entity of the absolutely free self it is thus the most cold-blooded mean and meaningless death of all with no more significance than cleaving a head of cabbage or swallowing a draught of water in this single expressionless syllable consists the wisdom of the government the intelligence of the general will when carrying out and executing its plans the government is itself nothing but the self-established focus 
the individual embodiment of the general will government a power to will and perform proceeding from a single centre wills and performs at the same time a determinate order and action in doing so it on the one hand excludes other individuals from a share in its deed and on the other thereby constitutes itself a form of government which is a specifically determinate will and eo ipso opposed to the universal will by no manner of means therefore can it put itself forward as anything but a faction the victorious faction only is called the government and just in that it is a faction lies the direct necessity of its overthrow and its being government makes it conversely into a faction and hence guilty when the universal will holds to this concrete action of the government and holds this to be a crime which the government has committed against the universal will then the government on its side has nothing tangible and external left whereby to establish and show the guilt of the will opposing itself to it for what thus stands opposed to it as concrete actual universal will is merely unreal abstract will bare intention being suspected therefore takes the place or has the significance and effect of being guilty and the external reaction against this reality that lies in bare inward intention consists in the fatuous barren destruction of this particular existent self in whose case there is nothing else to take away but its mere existence in this its characteristically peculiar performance absolute freedom becomes objective to itself and self-consciousness finds out what this freedom is in itself it is just this abstract self-consciousness which destroys all distinction and all fixedness of distinction within itself it is object to itself in this shape the terror of death is the direct apprehension anschauung, of this its negative nature this its reality however finds absolute free self-consciousness quite different from what its own notion of itself was that is that the universal will is merely the positive substance of personality and that this latter knows itself in it only positively knows itself preserved there rather for this self-consciousness which qua pure insight completely separates its positive and negative nature separates the unpredicated absolute qua pure thought and qua pure matter the absolute transition from the one to the other is found here present within its reality the universal will qua absolutely positive concrete self-consciousness because it is this self-conscious actuality raised to the level of pure thought or abstract matter turns round into the negative entity and shows itself at the same time to be what cancels and does away with self-thinking or self-consciousness absolute freedom qua pure self-identity of universal will thus carries with it negation but in doing so contains distinction in general and develops this again as concrete actual difference for pure negativity finds in the self-identical universal will the element of subsistence or the substance in which its moments get their realization it has the matter which it can turn into the specific nature of the substance and in so far as this substance has manifested itself to be the negative element for the individual consciousness the organization of the spiritual groups or masses of the substance to which the plurality of conscious individuals is assigned thus takes shape and form once more these individuals who felt the fear of death their absolute lord and master submit to negation and distinction once more arrange themselves into groups and return to a restricted and apportioned task but thereby to their substantial reality out of this tumult spirit would be thrown back upon its starting point the ethical world and the real world of spiritual culture which would thus have been merely refreshed and rejuvenated by the fear of the lord that has again entered their hearts spirit would have anew to traverse and continually repeat this cycle of necessity if only complete interpenetration of self-consciousness and the substance were the final result in such an interpenetration self-consciousness might seek to experience the force of its universal nature operating negatively upon it would try to know and find itself not as this particular self-consciousness but only as universal and hence too would be able to endure the objective reality of universal spirit a reality excluding self-consciousness qua particular but this is not the form the final result assumes for in absolute freedom there was no reciprocal interaction either between an external world and consciousness which is absorbed in manifold existence or sets itself determinate purposes and ideas or between consciousness and an external objective world 
be it a world of reality or of thought what that freedom contained was the world absolutely in the form of consciousness as a universal will and along with that self-consciousness gathered out of all the dispersion and manifoldness of existence or all the manifold ends and judgments of mind and concentrated into the bare and simple self the form of culture which it attains in interaction with that essential nature is therefore the grandest and the last is that seeing its pure and simple reality immediately disappear and pass away into empty nothingness in the sphere of culture itself it does not get the length of viewing its negation or alienation in this form of pure abstraction its negation is negation with a filling and a content either honour and wealth which it gains in the place of the self that it has alienated from itself or the language of esprit and insight which the distraught consciousness acquires or again the negation is the heaven of belief or the element of utility belonging to the stage of enlightenment all these determinate elements disappear with the disaster and ruin that overtake the self in the state of absolute freedom its negation is meaningless death sheer horror of the negative which has nothing positive in it nothing that gives a filling at the same time however this negation in its actual manifestation is not something alien and external it is neither that universal background of necessity in which the moral world is swamped nor the particular accident of private possession the whims and humours of the owner on which the distraught consciousness finds itself dependent it is universal will which in this its last abstraction has nothing positive and hence can give nothing in return for the sacrifice but just on that account this will is in unmediated oneness with self-consciousness it is the pure positive because it is the pure negative and that meaningless death the insubstantial vacuous negativity of self in its inner constitutive principle turns round into absolute positivity for consciousness the immediate unity of itself with the universal will its demand to see and find itself as a determinate particular focus in the universal will is changed and converted into the absolutely opposite experience what it loses there is abstract being the immediate existence of that insubstantial focus and this vanished immediacy is the universal will as such which it now knows itself to be so far as it is superseded and cancelled immediacy so far as it is pure knowledge or pure will by this means it knows that will to be itself and knows itself to be essential reality but not as the immediate essence not will as revolutionary government or anarchy struggling to establish an anarchical constitution nor itself as a centre of this faction or the opposite the universal will is its pure knowing and willing and it is universal will qua this pure knowledge and volition it does not lose itself there for pure knowledge and volition is it qua atomic point of consciousness it is thus the interaction of pure knowledge with itself pure knowledge qua essential reality is universal will while this essence is simply and solely pure knowledge self-consciousness is thus pure knowledge of essential reality in the sense of pure knowledge furthermore qua particular self it is merely the form of the subject or concrete real action a form which by it is known as form in the same way objective reality being is for it absolutely selfless form for that objective reality would be what is not known this knowledge however knows knowledge to be the essential fact absolute freedom has thus squared and balanced the opposition of universal and particular will with its own nature the self-alienated type of mind driven to the acme of its opposition where pure volition and the purely volitional agent are still kept distinct reduces that opposition to a transparent form and therein finds itself just as the realm of the real and actual world passes over into that of belief and insight absolute freedom leaves its self-destructive sphere of reality and passes over into another land of self-conscious spirit where in this unreality freedom is taken to be and is accepted as the truth in the thought of this truth spirit refreshes and revives itself so far as spirit is thought and remains so and knows this being which self-consciousness involves that is thought to be the complete and entire essence of everything the new form and mode of experience that now arises is that of the moral life of spirit end of section twelve
Section thirteen of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six C, Spirit in the condition of being certain of itself, morality. Translator's note. The following section deals with the final and highest stage in the life of finite spiritual experience as realized in the concrete form of a historical society. Here the substance of the social order is the real content of the self-conscious individual. That substance has become subjectified. We have, therefore, a self-contained spiritual subject. The discordance involved in the sphere of culture and enlightenment is overcome by the self-knowing and realizing itself as a complete universal self-determining free will, its world within itself, and itself its own world. Each reflects the whole, the totality of social life, in itself so perfectly that what it does is transparently the doing of the whole as much as its own doing such a sphere of spiritual existence is morality the all-sufficient spiritual order of the finite spirit as an individual the meaning assigned to morality here is that expressed by kant when he says that morality is the relation of actions to the autonomy of the will that is to possible universal legislation through maxims of the will in other words all the universality constituting the interrelations of finite spirits in a society are epitomized in the soul of the acting individual who can thus quite legitimately look upon itself as the self-regulating source of all universal conditions of action it is inevitable that such a concrete mode of experience should have various aspects and should pass through various stages in the process of fully realizing its nature the individual may lay exclusive stress on the self-completeness which he possesses through being the source and origin of his own laws his self-legislative function just because it carries with it the sense of universality may appear so supremely important that all the actual detail of his life comes to be treated as external indifferent and contingent this detail no doubt is essential to give body and substance to his spiritual individuality but the universality of his will so far transcends each and every detail of content as to be seen by itself the sole and all-sufficient reality of his being the content of his life only enters into consideration as an element to be regulated and made to conform to the universal the relation so constituted between content and universal is found in the consciousness of duty since the content is thus subordinate though absolutely essential to give even meaning to the idea and the fulfilment of duty and since the universal is the supremely important fact not merely is duty to be fulfilled for duty's sake but the duty in question is pure duty the good will is the purely universal will and is the only will in the world from this point of view in the first section a hegel analyzes this phase of the moral life the historical material the writer has in mind is a moral attitude which came into prominence at the time of the romantic movement towards the end of the eighteenth and the beginning of the nineteenth century it found its philosophical expression in the moral theories of kant and fichte and lessing may be taken as a typical representative in literature of the same attitude end of translator's note spirit in the condition of being certain of itself morality the ethical order of the community found its consummation and its truth in the type of spirit existing in mere solitude and separation within it the individual self this legal person however has its substance and its fulfilment outside that ethical order the process of the world of culture and belief does away with this abstraction of a mere person and by the completion of the process of estrangement by reaching the extremity of abstraction the self of spirit finds the substance become first the universal will and finally its own possession here then knowledge seems at last to have become entirely at one with the truth at which it aims for its truth is this knowledge itself all opposition between the two sides has vanished and that too not for us who are tracing the process not merely implicitly 
but actually for self-consciousness itself that is to say knowledge has itself got the mastery over the opposition which consciousness had to face this rests on the opposition between certainty of self and the object now however the object for it is the certainty of self knowledge just as the certainty of itself as such has no longer ends of its own is no longer conditioned and determinate but is pure knowledge self-consciousness thus now takes the knowledge of itself to be the substance itself this substance is for it at once immediate and absolutely mediated in one indivisible unity it is immediate just in the way the ethical consciousness knows and itself does its duties and is bound to the substance as to its own nature but it is not character just as that ethical consciousness which in virtue of its immediacy is a determinate type of spirit belongs merely to one of the essential features of ethical life and has the peculiarity of not being conscious explicit knowledge it is again absolute mediation as involving the conscious processes of culture and belief for it is essentially the movement of the life of self to transcend the abstract form of immediate existence and become consciously universal and yet to do so neither by simply estranging and rending itself as well as reality nor by fleeing from it rather it is directly and immediately present in its very substance for this substance is its knowledge it is the pure certainty of self becoming transparently visible and just this very immediacy which constitutes its actual reality is the entire actuality for the immediate is being and qua pure immediacy immediacy made transparent by thoroughgoing negation this immediacy is pure being is being in general is all being absolute essential being is therefore not exhausted by the characteristic of being the simple essence of thought it is all actuality and this actuality exists merely as knowledge what consciousness did not know would have no sense and can be no power in its life into its self-conscious knowing will all objectivity the whole world has withdrawn it is absolutely free in that it knows its freedom and just this very knowledge of its freedom is its substance its purpose its sole and only content end of section thirteen section fourteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six c subsection a the moral view of the world self-consciousness knows and accepts duty as the absolute it is bound by that alone and this substance is its own conscious life pure and simple duty cannot for it take on the form of something alien and external when thus shut up and confined within itself however moral self-consciousness is not yet affirmed and looked at as consciousness the object is immediate knowledge and being thus permeated purely by the self is not object but this knowledge being essentially mediation and negativity there is implied in its very conception relation to some otherness and thus it is consciousness this other because duty constitutes its sole essential purpose and objective content is a reality completely devoid of significance for consciousness but again because this consciousness is so entirely confined within itself it takes up towards this otherness a perfectly free and detached attitude and the existence of this other is therefore an existence completely set free from self-consciousness and in like manner relating itself merely to itself the freer self-consciousness becomes the freer also is the negative object of its consciousness the object is thus a complete world within itself with an individuality of its own an independent whole of laws peculiar to itself as well as an independent procedure and an unfettered active realization of those laws it is altogether a nature a nature whose laws and also whose action belong to itself as a being which is not disturbed about the moral self-consciousness just as the latter is not troubled about it 
starting with the specific character of this sort there is formed and established a moral outlook or point of view which consists in a process of relating the implicit aspect of morality moralisches ansichtsein and the explicit aspect moralisches fürsichtsein this relation presupposes both thorough reciprocal indifference and specific independence as between nature and moral purposes and activity and also on the other side a conscious sense of duty as the sole essential fact and of nature as entirely devoid of independence and essential significance of its own the point of view or attitude of the moral life consists in the development of these moments which are involved in the relation of such entirely antithetic and contradictory presuppositions to begin with then the moral consciousness in general is presupposed it takes duty to be the essential reality itself is actual and active and in its actuality and action fulfils duty but this moral consciousness at the same time finds before it the assumed freedom of nature it learns by experience that nature is not concerned about giving consciousness a sense of the unity of its reality with that of nature and hence discovers that nature may let it become happy but perhaps also may not the non-moral consciousness on the other hand finds by chance perhaps its realization where the moral consciousness sees merely an occasion for acting but does not see itself enjoying through its action the success of performance and the satisfaction of achievement it therefore finds reason for bewailing a situation where there is no correspondence between itself and existence and lamenting the injustice which confines it to having its object merely in the form of pure duty but refuses to let it see this object and itself actually realized the moral consciousness cannot renounce happiness and drop this element out of its absolute purpose the purpose which is expressed as duty pure and simple essentially implies retention of individual self-consciousness and maintenance of its claims individual conviction and knowledge thereof constituted a fundamental element in morality this element in the objectified purpose in duty fulfilled is the particular consciousness seeing itself as actually realized in other words this moment is that of enjoyment which thus lies in the very principle of morality not indeed of morality in the sense of immediate feeling and sentiment but in the principle of the actualization of morality owing to this however enjoyment is also involved in moral sentiment for morality seeks not to remain sentiment as opposed to action but to act or realize itself thus the purpose expressed as a whole along with the consciousness of its elements or moments is that duty fulfilled shall be both a purely moral act and a realized individuality and that nature the aspect of particularity in contrast with abstract purpose shall be one with this purpose while experience must necessarily bring to light the disharmony between the two aspects seeing that nature is detached and apart nevertheless duty is alone the essential fact and nature by contrast is devoid of selfhood that purpose in its entirety which the harmony of the two constitutes contains within it actuality itself it is at the same time the thought of actuality the harmony of morality and nature or seeing that nature is taken account of merely so far as consciousness finds out nature's unity with it the harmony of morality and happiness is thought of as necessarily existing it is postulated for to postulate or demand means that something is thought to be which is not yet actual a necessity affecting not a conception qua conception but existence but the requirement or necessity is at the same time essentially a relation through the conception the existence demanded thus belongs not to something present in the mind of some chance individual consciousness but is implied in the very notion of morality itself whose true content is the unity of pure with individual consciousness it falls to the individual consciousness to see that this unity is for it an actuality happiness as regards the content of the purpose and existence in general as regards its form the existence thus demanded the unity of both is therefore not a wish nor looked at qua purpose is it of such a kind as to be still uncertain of attainment the purpose is rather a demand of reason 
or an immediate certainty and presupposition of reason the first experience above referred to and this postulate are not the only experience and postulate a whole round of postulate comes to light for nature is not merely this completely detached external mode in which as a bare pure object consciousness has to realize its purpose consciousness is per se essentially something for which this other detached reality exists that is it is itself something contingent and natural this nature which is properly its own is sensibility which taking the form of volition in the shape of impulses and inclinations has by itself a determinate essential being of its own that is has specific particular purposes and thus is opposed to abstract will with its pure purpose in contrast with this opposition however pure consciousness rather takes the relation of sensibility to it the absolute unity of sensibility with it to be the essential fact both of these pure thought and sensibility are essentially and inherently one consciousness and pure thought is just that for which and in which this pure unity exists but for it qua consciousness the opposition between itself and its impulses holds in this conflict between reason and sensibility the essential thing for reason is that the conflict should be resolved and that the unity of both should come out as a result not the original unity which consisted in both the opposites being in one individual but a unity which arises out of the known opposition of the two so attained such a unity is then the actual morality for in it is contained the opposition through which the self is a consciousness or first becomes concrete and in actual fact self and at the same time universal in other words we find there expressed that process of mediation which as we see is essential to morality since of the two factors in opposition sensibility is otherness out and out is the negative while on the other hand pure thought of duty is the ultimate essence which cannot possibly be surrendered in any respect it seems as if the unity produced can be brought about only by doing away with sensibility but since sensibility is itself a moment of this process of producing the unity is the aspect of actuality we have in the first instance to be content to express the unity in this form sensibility should be in conformity with morality this unity is likewise a postulated existence it is not there as a fact for what is there is consciousness or the opposition of sensibility and pure consciousness all the same the unity is not a something per se like the first postulate in which free external nature constitutes an aspect and the harmony of nature with moral consciousness in consequence falls outside the latter rather nature is here that which lies within consciousness and we have here to deal with morality moralität as such with a harmony which is the active self's very own consciousness has therefore of itself to bring about this harmonious unity and to be always making progress in morality the completion of this result however is pushed away into the remote infinite because if it actually entered the life of consciousness as an actual fact the moral consciousness would be done away with for morality is only moral consciousness qua negative force sensibility has merely a negative significance for the consciousness of pure duty it is something merely not in conformity with duty by attaining that harmony however morality qua consciousness that is its actuality passes away just as in the moral consciousness or actuality its harmony vanishes the completion is therefore not to be reached as an actual fact it is to be thought of merely as an absolute task or problem that is one which remains a problem pure and simple nevertheless its content has to be thought as something which unquestionably has to be and must not remain a problem whether we imagine the moral consciousness quite cancelled in the attainment of this goal or not which of these exactly is the case cannot very well be clearly distinguished in the dim distance of infinitude to which the attainment of the end has to be postponed just because we cannot decide the point we shall be strictly speaking bound to say that a definite idea on the matter ought to be of no interest and ought not to be sought for because this leads to contradictions 
the contradiction in speaking of an undertaking that at once ought to remain an undertaking and yet ought to be carried out and the contradiction in speaking of a morality which is not consciousness that is which is no longer actual by adopting the view however that morality when completed would contain a contradiction the sacredness of moral truth would be seriously affected and an unconditional duty would appear something unreal the first postulate was the harmony of morality and objective nature the final purpose of the world the other was the harmony of morality and will in its sensuous form in the form of impulse etc the final purpose of self-consciousness as such the former is the harmony in the form of implicit immanent existence the latter the harmony in the form of explicit self-existence that however which connects these two extreme final purposes which are thought and operates as their mediating ground is the process of concrete action itself they are harmonies whose moments in their abstract distinctiveness from each other have not yet become definitely objective this takes place in concrete actuality in which the aspect appears in consciousness proper each as the other of the other the postulates arising by this means contain harmonies which are now completely realized and objective whereas formerly they were merely separated into implicit and explicit immanent and self-existent the moral consciousness qua barren simple knowledge and willing of pure duty is brought by the process of acting upon an object opposed to that abstract simplicity into relation with the manifold actuality which various cases present and thereby assumes a moral attitude varied and manifold in character hence arise on the side of content the plurality of laws generally and on the side of form the contradictory powers of intelligent knowing consciousness and of a being devoid of consciousness to begin with as regards the plurality of duties it is merely the aspect of pure or bare duty in them which in general appeals to the moral consciousness as being of significance the many duties qua many are determinate and therefore are not as such anything sacred for the moral consciousness at the same time however being necessary in virtue of the very nature of action which implicates a manifold actuality and hence manifold types of moral attitude those many duties must be looked on as having a substantial existence and value furthermore since they can only exist in a moral consciousness they exist at the same time in another consciousness than that for which only pure duty qua bare duty is sacred and self-sufficient it is thus postulated that there is another consciousness which renders them sacred or which knows them as duties and wills them so the first maintains pure duty indifferent towards all specific content and duty consists merely in being thus indifferent towards it the other however contains the equally essential relation to the process of action and the necessity therefore of determinate content since duties for this other mean determinate duties the content is thus for it just as essential as the form in virtue of which the content is a duty at all this consciousness is consequently such that in it the universal and the particular are through and through one its essential principle is thus the same as that of the harmony of morality and happiness for this opposition between morality and happiness expresses in like manner the separation of the self-identical moral consciousness from that actuality which qua manifold existence opposes and conflicts with the simple nature of duty while however the first postulate expresses merely the objective existential harmony between morality and nature because nature is therein the negative of self-consciousness is the aspect of existence this inherent harmony on the other hand is now affirmed essentially as a mode of consciousness for existence now appears as the content of duty as that in the determinate duty which gives it specific determinateness the immanent harmony is thus the unity of elements which qua simple ultimate elements are essentially thought created and hence cannot exist except in a consciousness this latter becomes now a master and ruler of the world who brings about the harmony of morality and happiness and at the same time sanctifies duties and their multiplicity to sanctify these duties means this much that the consciousness of pure duty cannot straightway and directly accept the determinate or specific duty as sacred but because a specific duty 
owing to the nature of concrete action which is something specific and definite is all the same necessary its necessity falls outside that consciousness and holds inside another consciousness which thus mediates or connects determinate and pure duty and is the reason why that specific duty also has validity in the concrete act however consciousness proceeds to work as this particular self as completely individual it directs its activity on actual reality as such and takes this as its purpose for it wants to perform something definite duty in general thus falls outside it and within another being which is the consciousness and sacred lawgiver of pure duty the consciousness which acts just because it acts accepts the other consciousness that of bare duty and admits its validity immediately this pure duty is thus a content of another consciousness and is only indirectly or in immediate way sacred for the active consciousness that is in virtue of this other consciousness because it is established in this manner that the validity the bindingness of duty as something holy and absolutely sacred falls outside the actual consciousness this latter thereby stands altogether on one side as the incomplete moral consciousness just as in regard to its knowledge it is aware of itself as that whose knowledge and conviction are incomplete and contingent in the same way as regards its willing it feels itself to be that whose purposes are affected with sensibility on account of its unworthiness therefore it cannot look on happiness as something necessary but as a something contingent and can only expect happiness as the result of grace but though its actuality is incomplete duty is still so far as its pure will and knowledge are concerned held to be the essential truth in principle therefore so far as the notion is opposed to actual reality in other words in thought it is perfect the absolute truth duty is however just this object of thought and is something postulated beyond the actual it is therefore the thought in which the morally imperfect knowledge and will are held to be perfect and since it takes this imperfection to have full weight in which consequently happiness is meted out according to worthiness that is according to the merit ascribed this completes the meaning of the moral attitude for in the conception of moral self-consciousness the two aspects pure duty and actual reality are affirmed of a single unity and thereby the one like the other is put forward not as something self-complete but as a moment or as cancelled and transcended this becomes consciously explicit in the last phase of the moral attitude or point of view consciousness we there saw places pure duty in another form of being than its own consciousness that is it regards pure duty partly as something ideally presented partly as what does not by itself hold good indeed the non-moral is rather what is held to be perfect in the same way it affirms itself to be that whose actuality not being in conformity with duty is transcended and qua transcended or in the presented idea of what is absolute pure duty no longer contradicts morality for the moral consciousness itself however its moral attitude does not mean that consciousness therein develops its own proper notion and makes this its object it has no consciousness of this opposition either as regards the form or the content thereof the elements composing this opposition it does not relate and compare with one another but goes forward on its own course of development without being the connecting principle of those moments for it is only aware of the essence pure and simple that is the object so far as this is duty so far as this is an abstract object of its pure consciousness qua pure knowledge in other words it is only aware of this object as itself its procedure is thus merely that of thinking not conceiving is by way of thoughts not notions consequently it does not yet find the object of its actual consciousness transparently clear to itself it is not the absolute notion which alone grasps otherness as such its absolute opposite as its very self its own reality as well as all objective reality no doubt is held to be something unessential but its freedom is that of pure thought in opposition to which therefore nature has likewise arisen as something equally free 
because both are found in like manner within it both the freedom which belongs to external being and the inclusion of this existence within consciousness its object comes to be an existing object which is at the same time merely a thought product in the last phase of its attitude or point of view the content is essentially so constituted that its being has the character of something presented an idea and this union of being and thinking is expressed as what in fact it is that is presentation when we look at the moral view of the world in such a way that this objective result is nothing else than the very principle or notion of moral self-consciousness which it makes objective to itself there arises through this consciousness concerning the form of its origin another mode of exhibiting this view of the world the first stage which forms the starting point is the actual moral self-consciousness or is the fact that there is such a self-consciousness at all for the notion establishes moral self-consciousness in the form that for it all reality in general has essential being only so far as such reality is in conformity with duty and that notion establishes this essential element as knowledge that is in immediate unity with the actual self this unity is thus itself actual is a moral actual consciousness the latter now qua consciousness presents its content to itself as an object that is as the final purpose of the world as the harmony of morality with all reality since however it represents this unity as object and is not yet a complete notion which has the object as such in its grasp this unity is taken to be something negative of or opposed to self-consciousness that is the unity falls outside it as something beyond its actual reality but at the same time of such a nature as to be also existent though merely thought of this self-consciousness which qua self-consciousness is something other than the object thus finds itself left with the want of harmony between the consciousness of duty and actual reality a reality too which is its own the proposition consequently now runs thus there is no morally complete actual self-consciousness and since what is moral only is in the long run so far as it is complete for duty is the pure unadulterated ultimate element an sich, and morality consists merely in conformity to this pure principle the second proposition runs there is no morally actual existence at all since however in the third place it is a self it is inherently the unity of duty and of actual reality this unity thus becomes its object as completed morality but as something beyond its actual reality and yet a beyond which still ought to be real in this final stage and last expression of the synthetic unity of the two first propositions the self-conscious reality as well as duty is only affirmed as a transcended or superseded moment for neither of them is alone neither is isolated on the contrary these factors whose essential characteristic lies in being free from one another are thus each in that unity no longer free from the other each is transcended hence as regards content they become as such object each of them holds good for the other and as regards form they become such that this interchange on their part is at the same time merely in idea is merely ideally presented or again the actually non-moral because it is at the same time pure thought and elevated above its own actual reality is in idea still moral and is taken to be entirely sufficing in this way the first proposition that there is a moral self-consciousness is reinstated but bound up with the second that there is none that is to say there is one but merely in idea in other words there is indeed none but it is all the same allowed by some other consciousness to pass for one end of section fourteen section fifteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6C, Subsection B. Dissemblance. Translator's Note. The first stage fails as it stands to do complete justice to the full meaning of morality. 
both elements in the spiritually complete individual are essential and each has to be recognized the universal must be objectified in nature external nature and sensibility and nature must be subjectivized in spirit another condition or stage of the moral consciousness therefore is found where the equality of value of the elements of the moral consciousness is admitted without these elements being completely fused into a single and total attitude the universal is realized in many ways and forms and each is accepted in turn as the true moral reality the mind passes from one to the other when one is accepted the other is set aside the moral consciousness tries so to say to hide from itself the endless diversity of its appearances simply because it clings tenaciously to the idea that the inherent self-completeness of itself is a unity per se which can only admit diversity on sufferance formerly it eliminated all diversity by eliminating the source of diversity nature here it is forced to admit diversity and yet cannot give up the claim to be an abstract single unity independent of difference thus its condition here is a mixture of self-realization and self-sophistication a condition which hegel characterizes as dissemblance and which borders upon and may pass into hypocrisy hegel regards this attitude as the inevitable outcome of the proceeding end of translator's note dissemblance in the moral attitude of experience we see on one side consciousness itself produce its object in a conscious way we find that neither does it pick up the object as something external nor does the object come before it in an unconscious manner rather consciousness throughout proceeds on a certain basis and from this establishes the objective reality it thus knows this objective element to be itself for it is aware of itself as the active agent producing this object it seems in consequence to attain here its peace and satisfaction for this can only be found where it does not need to go any more beyond its object because this object no longer goes beyond it on the other side however it really puts the object away outside itself as something beyond itself but this latter self-contained entity is at the same time put there as something that is not detached from self-consciousness but really there on behalf of and by means of it the moral attitude is therefore in fact nothing else than a developed expression of this fundamental contradiction in its various aspects it is to use a kantian phrase which is here most appropriate a perfect nest of inconsistencies and contradictions consciousness in developing this situation proceeds by fixing definitely one moment passing thence immediately over to another and doing away with the first but in the way it has now set up this second moment it also shifts verstellt this again and really makes the opposite the essential element at the same time it is conscious of its contradiction and of this displacement for it passes from one moment immediately in its relation to this very moment right over to the opposite because a moment has for it no reality at all it affirms that very moment as real or what comes to the same thing in order to assert one moment as per se existent it asserts the opposite as the per se existent it thereby confesses that as a matter of fact it is an earnest about neither of them the various moments of this fraudulent process we must look at more closely let us allow the assumption that there is an actual moral consciousness to rest on its own basis in the first instance because the assumption is not directly made with reference to something preceding and let us turn to the harmony of morality and nature the first postulate it is to be immanent not explicitly for actual conscious life not really present the present is rather simply the contradiction between the two in the present morality is taken to be something at hand and actual reality to be so situated or placed that it is not in harmony with morality the concrete moral consciousness however is active consists in acting that is what constitutes the actuality of its morality in the very process of acting however that place or semblance is immediately displaced is dissembled for action is nothing else than the actualization of the inner moral purpose nothing but the production of an actuality constituted and determined by purpose in other words 
the production of the harmony of moral purpose and reality itself at the same time the performance of the action is a conscious fact it is the presence of this unity of reality and purpose and because in the completed act consciousness realizes itself as a given particular consciousness or sees existence return into itself qua particular and in this consists the nature of enjoyment there is eo ipso also contained in the realization of moral purpose that form of its realization which is called enjoyment and happiness action thus as a fact fulfils directly what it was asserted could not take place at all fulfils what was to be merely a postulate was to lie merely beyond consciousness therefore expresses through its deed that it is not in earnest in making the postulate since the meaning of acting is really that it makes a present fact of what was not to be in the present and since the harmony is postulated for the sake of the action for what is to become actual through action must be implicit otherwise the actuality would not be possible the connection of action with the postulate is so constituted that for the sake of action that is for the sake of the actual harmony of purpose and reality this harmony is put forward as not actual as far away as beyond since action does take place the want of adaptation between purpose and reality is thus in general not taken seriously action itself on the other hand does seem to be taken seriously but as a matter of fact the actual deed done is the action of a particular consciousness and so is itself merely something particular and the result contingent the end of reason however being the all-comprehensive universal end is nothing short of the entire world a final purpose which goes far beyond the content of this particular act and therefore is to be placed altogether above anything actually done because the universal best ought to be carried out nothing good is done in point of fact however the nothingness of actual action and the reality of the entire purpose alone which are here upheld these are on all hands again shifted or dissembled the moral act is not something contingent and restricted its essential nature lies in pure duty this pure duty constitutes the sole entire purpose and the act whatever may be the limitation of the content being the actualization of that purpose is the accomplishment of the entire absolute purpose or if again we take the reality in the sense of nature which has laws of its own and stands over against pure duty and take it in such a way that duty cannot realize its law within nature then since duty as such is the essential element we are when acting not in fact concerned about the accomplishment of pure duty which is the whole purpose for the accomplishment would then rather have as its end not pure duty but the opposite that is reality but there is again a shifting from the position that it is not reality with which we have to do for by the very notion of moral action pure duty is essentially an active consciousness action thus ought certainly to take place absolute duty ought to be expressed in the whole of nature and moral law to become natural law if then we allow this highest good to stand for the essentially real consciousness is not altogether in earnest with morality for in this highest good nature has not a different law from what morality has moral action itself in consequence drops for action takes place only under the assumption of a negative or opposing element which is to be cancelled by means of the act but if nature conforms to the moral law then undoubtedly this moral law would be violated by acting by cancelling what already exists on that mode of interpretation then there has arisen as the essential situation one which renders moral action superfluous and in which moral action does not take place at all hence the postulate of the harmony between morality and reality a harmony involved in the very notion of moral action which means bringing the two into agreement finds on this view too an expression which takes the form because moral action is the absolute purpose the absolute purpose is that moral action do not take place at all if we put these moments together through which consciousness has gone on presenting its ideas of its moral life we see that it cancels each one again in its opposite it starts from the position that for it morality and reality do not make a harmony but it is not in earnest with that for in the moral act it is conscious of the presence of this harmony 
but neither is it in earnest with this action since the action is something particular while it has such a high purpose the highest good this however is once more merely a dissemblance of the actual fact for thereby all action and all morality would fall to the ground in other words it is not strictly in earnest with moral action on the contrary it really feels that what is most to be wished for the absolutely desirable is that the highest good were carried out and moral action superfluous from this result consciousness must go on still further in its contradictory procedure and must of necessity again dissemble the abolition of moral action morality is the inherently essential an sich in order that it may have place the final end of the world cannot be carried out rather the moral consciousness must exist for itself and must find lying before it a nature opposing it but it must per se be completed this leads to the second postulate of the harmony of itself and sensibility the nature immediately within it moral self-consciousness sets up its purpose as pure purpose as independent of inclinations and impulses so that this bare purpose has abolished within itself the ends of sensibility but this cancelling of the element of sense is no sooner set up than it is again dissembled the moral consciousness acts it brings its purpose into reality and self-conscious sensibility which should be done away with is precisely the mediating element between pure consciousness and reality is the instrument used by the former for the realization of itself or is the organ of what is called impulse inclination it is thus not really in earnest in cancelling inclinations and impulses for these are just self-consciousness making itself actual moreover they ought not to be suppressed but merely to be in conformity with reason they are too in conformity with it for moral action is nothing else than self-realizing consciousness consciousness taking on the form of an impulse that is it is immediately the realized actually present harmony of impulse and morality but in point of fact the impulse is not only this empty conscious form which might possibly have within itself a spring of action other than the impulse in question and be driven on by that for sensibility is a kind of nature which contains within itself its own laws and springs of action consequently morality cannot seriously mean to be the inciting motive triebfeder for impulses triebe the angle of inclination for inclinations for since these latter have their own fixed character and peculiar content the consciousness to which they were to conform would rather be in conformity with them a conformity which moral self-consciousness declines to adopt the harmony between the two is thus merely implicit and postulated in moral action the realized or present harmony of morality and sensibility was set up at one moment and at the next is displaced the harmony is in a misty distance beyond consciousness where there is nothing more to be accurately distinguished or grasped for to grasp this unity which we have just tried to do has proved impossible in this merely imminent or implicit harmony however consciousness gives up itself altogether this imminent state is its moral completion where the struggle of morality and sensibility has ceased and the latter is in conformity to the former in a way which cannot be made out on that account this completion is again merely a dissemblance of the actual case for in point of fact morality would be really giving up itself in that completion because it is only consciousness of absolute purpose qua pure and simple purpose that is in opposition to all other purposes morality is both the activity of this pure purpose and at the same time the consciousness of rising above sensibility of being mixed up with sensibility and of opposing and struggling with it that this moral completion is not taken seriously is directly expressed by consciousness in the fact that it shifts this completion away into infinity that is asserts that the completion is never completed thus it is really only the middle state of being incomplete that is admitted to having any value a state nevertheless which at least ought to be one of progress towards completion yet it cannot be so for advancing in morality would mean approaching its annihilation and disappearance for the goal would be the nothingness above mentioned the abolition of morality and consciousness itself 
but to come ever nearer and nearer to nothing means to decrease besides advancing would in general in the same way as decreasing introduce distinctions of quantity into morality but these are quite inadmissible in such a sphere in morality qua mode of consciousness which takes the ethical end to be pure duty we cannot think at all of difference least of all of the superficial difference of quantity there is only one virtue only one pure duty only one morality since then it is not moral completion that is taken seriously but rather the middle state that is as just explained the condition of no morality we thus come by another way back to the content of the first postulate for we cannot perceive how happiness is to be demanded for this moral consciousness on the ground of its worthiness to be happy it is well aware of its not being complete and cannot therefore in point of fact demand happiness as a desert as something of which it is worthy it can ask happiness to be given merely as an act of free grace that is it can only ask for happiness as such and as a substantive element by itself it cannot expect it except as the result of chance and caprice not because there is any absolute reason of the above sort the condition of non-morality herein expresses just what it is that it is concerned not about morality but about happiness alone without reference to morality by this second aspect of the moral point of view the assertion of the first aspect wherein disharmony between morality and happiness is presupposed is also cancelled one may pretend to have found by experience that in the actual present the man who is moral often fares badly while the man who is not often comes off happily yet the middle state of incomplete morality the condition which has proved to be the essential one shows clearly that this perception that morality fares badly this experience which ought to be but is not is merely a dissemblance of the real facts of the case for since morality is not completed that is since morality in point of fact is not what can there be in experience that morality should fare badly since at the same time it has come out that the point at issue concerns happiness alone it is manifest that in making the judgment the man who has no morality comes off well there was no intention to convey thereby that there was something wrong in such a case the designation of an individual as one devoid of morality necessarily falls to the ground when morality in general is incomplete such a characterization rests indeed on pure caprice hence the sense and content of that judgment of experience is simply this that happiness as such should not have fallen to someone who got it that is the judgment is an expression of envy which is assuming the covering cloak of morality the reason however why we think good luck as we call it should fall to the lot of others is good friendship which ungrudgingly grants and wishes them and wishes itself too this favour this accident of good fortune morality then in the moral consciousness is not completed this is what is now established but its essence consists in being merely what is complete and so pure morality incomplete morality is therefore impure in other words is immorality morality itself thus exists in another being than the actual concrete consciousness this other is a holy moral legislator morality which is not completed in consciousness the morality which is the reason for making those postulates means in the first instance that morality when it is set up as actual in consciousness stands in relation to something else to an existence and thus itself preserves and implies otherness or distinction whence arises a manifold plurality of moral commands the moral self-consciousness at the same time however looks on these many duties as unessential for it is concerned with merely the one pure duty and this plurality of duties so far as they are determinate duties have no true reality for self-consciousness they can thus have their real truth accepted only in another consciousness and are what they are not for the actual moral self-consciousness sacred through a holy lawgiver but this too is again merely a dissembling of the actual fact for moral self-consciousness is to itself the absolute and duty is simply and solely what it knows to be duty it however recognizes only pure duty as duty 
what is not sacred in its view is not in itself sacred at all and what is not per se sacred cannot be rendered so by some being that is sacred moral consciousness further is not really serious in allowing something to be made sacred by another consciousness than its own for only that is without qualification sacred in its eyes which is made sacred through its own action and is sacred within it it is thus just as little in earnest in treating this other being as a holy being for this would mean that within it something was to attain an essential significance which for the moral consciousness that is in itself has none if the sacred being was postulated in order that duty might have binding validity within the moral consciousness not qua pure duty but as a plurality of specific duties then this must again be dissembled and the other being must be solely sacred in so far as only pure duty has binding validity within the moral consciousness pure duty has also in point of fact validity and bindingness only in another being not in the moral consciousness although within the latter pure morality seems alone to hold good still this must be put right in another form for it is at the same time a natural consciousness morality is in it affected and conditioned by sensibility and thus is not by itself self-contained but a contingent result of free will in it however qua pure will morality is a contingency of knowledge taken by itself therefore morality is in another being is self-complete only in another reality than the actual moral consciousness this other being then is here absolutely complete morality because in its case morality does not stand in relation to nature and sensibility yet the reality of pure duty lies in its actualization in nature and sensibility the moral consciousness accounts for its incompleteness by the fact that morality in its case has a positive relation to nature and sensibility since it holds an essential moment of morality to be that morality should have simply and solely a negative relation towards nature and sensibility the pure moral being on the other hand because far above the struggle with nature and sense does not stand in a negative relation to them thus in point of fact the positive relation to them alone remains in its case that is there remains just what a moment ago passed for the incomplete for what was not moral pure morality however entirely cut off from actual reality so as likewise to be even without positive relation to reality would be a blank unreal abstraction where the very notion of morality which consists in thinking of pure duty and in willing and doing would be absolutely done away with this other being so purely and entirely moral is again therefore a mere dissemblance of the actual fact and has to be given up in this purely moral being however the moments of the contradiction in which this synthetic ideational process is carried on come closer together so likewise do the opposites taken up alternately now this and also that and also the other opposites which are allowed to follow one after the other with one opposite constantly set aside by another yet without these ideas ever being brought together so close do they come that consciousness here has to give up its moral view of the world and retreat within itself it knows its morality as incomplete because it is affected by an opposing sensibility and nature which partly perturb morality as such and partly give rise to a plurality of duties by which in concrete cases of real action consciousness finds itself embarrassed for each case is the concrete focus of many moral relations just as an object of perception in general is a thing with many qualities and since a determinant duty is a purpose it has a content its content is a part of the purpose and so morality is not pure morality this latter then has its real existence in some other being but such reality means nothing else than that morality is here self-complete in itself and for itself for itself that is is morality of consciousness in itself that is has existence and actuality in that first incomplete consciousness morality is not realized and carried out it is there something immanent and implicit in the sense of a mere thought element for it is associated with nature and sensibility with the actuality of external existence and conscious life 
which constitutes its content and nature and sensibility are morally nothing in the second morality is present as completed and not in the form of an unrealized thought element but this completion consists just in the fact that morality has reality in a consciousness in the sense of free reality objective existence in general is not something empty but filled out full of content that is to say the completion of morality is placed in this that what a moment ago was characterized as morally nothing is found present in morality and inherent in it it is at one time to have validity simply and solely as the unrealized thought element a product of pure abstraction but on the other hand is just as certainly to have in this form no validity at all its true nature is to consist in being opposed to reality detached altogether therefrom and empty and then again to consist in being actual reality the syncretism or fusion of these contradictions which is expressed in extenso in the moral attitude of experience collapses internally since the distinction on which it rests its distinction from something which must be thought and stated as a necessity and is yet at the same time not essential passes into one which does not any longer exist even in words what at the end is affirmed to be something with different aspects both to be nothing and also real is one and the very same existence and reality and what is to be absolute only as something beyond actual existence and actual consciousness and at the same time to be only in consciousness and so qua beyond nothing at all this absolute is pure duty and the knowledge that pure duty is the essentially real the consciousness which makes this distinction that is no distinction which announces actuality to be at once what is nothing and what is real pronounces pure morality to be both the ultimate truth and also to be devoid of all true reality and expresses together in one and the same breath ideas which it formerly separated such a consciousness itself proclaims that it is not in earnest with this characterization and separation of the moments of self and inherent reality it shows on the contrary that what it announces as absolute existence apart from consciousness it really keeps enclosed within the self of self-consciousness and that what it gives out as something entirely in thought or absolutely inherent and implicit it just for that reason takes to be something which has no truth at all it becomes clear to consciousness that placing these moments apart from each other is mentally displacing them is a dissemblance and it would be hypocrisy were it really to keep to this but being pure moral self-consciousness it flees from this discordance between what it represents and what constitutes its essential nature flees from this untruth which gives out as true what it holds to be untrue and turning away with abhorrence it hastens back into itself the consciousness which scorns such a moral idea of the world is pure conscience gewissen it is in its inmost being simply spirit consciously assured or certain gewiss of itself spirit which acts directly in the light of this assurance which acts conscientiously gewissenhaft without the intervention of those ideas and finds its true nature in this direct immediacy while however this sphere of dissemblance is nothing else than the development of moral self-consciousness in its various moments 